If beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, what does the vision see? Man reincarnates his vision in the MCU. What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in the MCU as Vision? Part 2. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. The meeting continued in a more subdued atmosphere, after Vision ousted a corrupted member of the ministers, and he was dragged away by law enforcement agents. Though he had more outright damning material that could put more than half of the people here in jail for a lifetime, doing that would only backfire against him and the Avengers as a whole. Not to mention that it was just not possible for him to thoroughly uproot every corrupt personnel in government all the way down to the armed forces. Corruption was a part of every ruling system. Well, he could stop this. But that was if he wanted to embark in the road of a tyrant. But that was a thought he abhorred. The more the talks went on, the more he became convinced that none of the people here mattered. At least not in the grand scheme of things. The only reason he entertained whatever this farce was instead of just slamming a fuck you in their faces, was because he wanted to prevent anything related to a civil war between any superpowered coalition. He stole some glances at the Fantastic Four, and saw how uncomfortable they were with the stipulations presented. But unlike how he and Steve adamantly rejected it, they looked like they were actually considering it, if a few concessions were to be made. Even Tony looked unsure as more time went on. He said less and less, and most of the time he could be found deep in thought, that he had to be tapped by Vision, when his attention was called. Vision was the one who was mostly speaking for the Avengers, with support from Tony every now and then, and little input from Steve. The problem is how your view toward mutants is constructed. Vision spoke after listening to what they had to say over and over again. And what do you mean by that? Candidly, most of your opinions are based on ignorance. The fact that you are forcing them into coming out will do more harm than good, and if not for the greed and lust for power that drives you, this would have been the turning point of humanity as a whole. Instead you are condemning it. A few teeth ground against each other, while damning scowls and snarls echoed throughout the hall, until someone spoke up after feeling off put by the android. Are you saying we are fools who don't know how to make the best decision for the betterment of our country and people? The way he asked the question was a dead giveaway that he wanted Vision to stumble before he was bombarded with questions. But he had no idea about how Vision dealt with such scenarios. Bluntness. If you are not fools then what are you? Clearly you cannot see the benefits presented with the emergence. So no doubt I would have no other option to call you foolish as the definition fits. Whoa whoa, slow your roll, player. Don't you think that's a bit far? Tony hurriedly dragged Vision down to his seat in panic. After the blatant dressing down, he just gave the room full of lawmakers. Vision shook his head at Tony and faced the yellow-faced audience, and gave them another dose of facts, before any of them could retort. In the late 90s and early 21st century, a man known as Magneto almost toppled the country's military, with his power over electromagnetism. Tell me, what can you do against that? Or maybe someone who can run faster than the fastest bullets or someone impervious to physical damage and pain. He said and then stated with utmost confidence something none of them wanted to hear. This country cannot support a war against mutants. That was all it took for the room to devolve into chaos as everybody started raising their voices just so they could be heard. Apart from Vision, no one else knew that there was a few groups of people listening in on what was being said in the room. The eavesdroppers weren't using the standard methods, so it was a little hard for Vision to trace them back, but the one he was most sure who it belonged to, came from the telepathic wave, that covered the entire room during the duration of the meeting. Um, excuse me. Someone called out to Vision as they were just about leaving and turning back. They saw a group of three familiar faces making their way towards them. Reed, Susan, Johnny. Good to see you guys again. Steve greeted the incomplete hero group, and they all greeted back enthusiastically. Do you guys need anything? He asked. Reed then spoke a little embarrassed. Actually, I wanted to speak with Vision about a few things. About what? This time it was Tony who asked. He wanted to have a talk with Vision here. You know how he is with things that catch his interest. Johnny explained. They all looked at Vision, 
but unexpectedly he shook his head before making a concession. I am quite pressed for time at the moment, and I also wasted quite a bit of it playing along with that farce, so maybe another time. Vision said and then continued his walk. He's kind of a hard guy to talk to, Johnny said as they left the place. Why did you want to talk to him, Reed? Sue asked curiously. Why wouldn't I want to talk to him? He looked as if he couldn't understand their ignorance of his reasons. He is a fully sentient self-developing AI. Did you see how he schooled the entire room? I just wanted to have a few discussions with him. Maybe even figure out his thought processes. And you are forgetting about the crazy psionic energy readings you got from him, right? Johnny asked, but depending on his expression, his words were anything but. Reed was taken aback and scratched his head in embarrassment. Yeah, that too. Why did you even bring that thing here? Sue wondered. Oh, that? It was to block any psionic interference in the room. He simply said as they started walking to their car, ignoring the looks they were getting from the paparazzi and lawmakers. Psionic interference. You mean mind control? You thought they might be a telepath in the room? Sue asked in shock. Not necessarily. There might have been some around the perimeter, but I know there was some telepathic presence in the room, but they just listened in, no mind possession, though I'm not completely sure. He frowned at his own words and brought out a round disc from his pockets, inspecting it with scrutiny before he sighed and kept it. Johnny didn't miss the skeptic gleam in his eyes as he looked over the device, so he asked. Vision. For some reason, I doubt something like this would have stopped him if he was psychic. The siblings looked at each other before shrugging which allowed Sue to ask something that had been on her mind, since the nature of the meeting was revealed. What do you think about the Accords? Her voice was as casual as it could be, showing no importance to the question asked. Reed looked at Sue and simply answered his honest thoughts. While there might be truth in Vision's words, the risks at presence far outweighs whatever benefits he probably calculated. The present situation is akin to a virus, better to have it under control at its initial stage, then let it fester unsupervised. His words caused the siblings to frown slightly, and Johnny expressed his disconcert. I feel you man, but we all know how it's going to backfire. While it might not be as grim as the vision Jude made it sound, it wouldn't be pretty either. Reed merely chuckled at those words and waved it off. No such thing. I assure you, whatever you say man, vision POV well, that went well. I chuckled as I remembered the faces they made when they finally realized that they were threatened by a robot. Nothing was wrong with registering mutants into the government registry, since something really had to be done about the various mutations that appeared every day, and their unending limits. The problem however was how they went about doing it. Unlike what they might think, they had very few defenses against a mutant uprising, with the foremost being the Sentinels. The reason why they even pushed the mutants as far as they did was because most of them were adolescents, and also their morals. Well, we know who to blame and also thank for that. Looking back at it now, everything around me has been heavily influenced by my presence in a way that the events of those changes were like a stone rolling down a steep hill. I was having an irritating buzz every time I thought or made a prediction about how things could go. Right now I was just receiving everything how they came, and only controlled the ones I was sure can be easily changed or influenced by my presence. Speaking of changes, how can I even begin to explain this? I have been blissfully ignoring it after going through and failing to understand how pumping myself up with the green juice caused all this. The easiest thing to understand was that I now had a perfectly fused biomechanical body. I could switch between flesh and spare parts at will, and it was a perfectly seamless transition. The downside was that my biomass only made up at most 35% of my body, so my mechanical parts automatically structured themselves in the order of a model human body. Since I was in full control of how I wanted the biomass to form around my body, I could add and remove parts that would have been biological defects, had I been remotely human. Hell, I could form wings on my back if I wanted or an extra pair of arms. It was mostly cosmetic, that was if I wanted it to be, and could be the real deal at the same time. So yeah, you could say I finally achieved what I wanted. Stark left to go attend to business, as usual, while I drove the awfully quiet Steve back to base. Still thinking about the Accords. Trust me, it's not worth the time you put all those efforts into. I said lightly as I let the car move slowly at uniform speed. Steve let out a wry smile, seeing how he was easily seen through, and just rested his head on the window, watching the speeding buildings and cars outside. You've said it, right. This could either make or break the team, 
And I'm hoping it doesn't that's if it hasn't already. I released a sigh as I saw Steve behaving despondent like a neglected housewife. Despite being a robot, it oaked me in a way I wasn't comfortable with seeing a fully grown man like Steve look and feel what I would describe as depression and longing. Banner is back at the compound. I ended up blurting out and heaved a sigh of relief under my breath when that caught his attention and made him relax with the faintest trace of a smile on his lips. Thank you Vision. He ended up saying which surprised me. So I turned to look at him and just commanded the car to drive itself. You're the reason why Bruce came back. You also made sure Tony checks in every once in a while. You're outlandish and strong. Sure, but you care about the existence of the team. That's more than I can ask of anyone, he clarified. I looked at him for a few seconds before taking back manual control of the wheels. It's no problem. Whether you guys like it or not, I'm here to stay, and the Avengers is as much as mine as it belongs to everyone else. He nodded, and we both relapsed into a comfortable silence until we arrived at the compound, where Banner was already waiting for us. He gave me quite the complicated look but just waved it off. Quite the understanding man. He was the most level-headed person in any room he found himself in which was something I respected about the man. Glad to see you're back from your sabbatical. He chuckled at my words. As if you gave me a choice, he said. I might not have given him one, but the decision to come back was one he made without any input from anybody. In other words, he wanted to be here. The reason why didn't matter. Decisions, decisions. My recent decision might have been made in haste and unbiased curiosity and the results were something I wholly accepted. The changes were mostly unknown, and I had to do a few mental exercises to make sure no mini Ultron devil was neatly tucked away somewhere inside my head. Maybe I should do a training montage, but that would be highly destructive, and I can't use the compound or anywhere, because I don't want to end up killing everyone. Apart from the obvious boost to my abilities, I haven't been using the Mind Stone all that much, as I had restarted the data compilation on it. Hum, maybe this is a nice time to actually work out, and who else is more suitable for highly destructive training practices, than God's Wrath himself. Banner, I called out to him, I need a favor. Well, it kind of goes both ways, so it's not really much of a favor. Sure, what do you need? I need both your help. He looked at me skeptically and asked with dread creeping in his tone. Me and his help? You and Hulk's obviously. Are you? He stopped himself from lashing out and took in a deep breath, and then turned around and started walking away. Which made me smile as he didn't reject me. Hope you have parts to spare, he said. Though he was aware of it, Vision's stunt in the meeting was under the scrutiny of a lot of influential people in different circles of life. Those who wielded real power were suddenly cautious of the changes the new member of the Avengers would bring upon his arrival, while others merely scoffed at the naive words of a robot, whose only knowledge was the accumulated information derived from a Google search engine. Sublime frowned as he remembered what had transpired in the meeting he had conventionally not attended due to the overwhelming psychic presences that had shrouded the entire vicinity where the meeting was held. Though he was immune against such tricks, he was not in any way allowing himself to be perverted in such a sickening manner by telepaths. If the president is still on the corner about making the decision after the outcome of that farce, then we just have to give him a little nudge. He spoke into the phone lodged against his ears. Norman's project is under heavy pressure from the government after Ross' death, and the nature of the experiments known. Don't worry about it, even if he fails, we still have Trask and Buckman. He listened to the other voice coming through the speaker on his ears, and hummed in agreement with some words said or just remained silent. After ending the call, his once impassive face morphed into a scowl for a brief moment, before he schooled them back to its normal charismatic smile. Since I can't get rid of him, I'll just have someone else do it for me for free. Saying that, he rang a specific number and waited a few seconds before it was picked up. Hello Mr. Buckman, Vision, P, O, V. The place I took Banner to was a deserted area, where we could both exercise with less restraints to ourselves. Honestly, I was quite eager to see how I stack up against the Hulk in a brutal slugfest. If we were to be grouped by specific definitions, then I would be a hack-style character that was at the peak of a scented field, and mine would be my energy manipulation, that allowed me to do a lot of things like telekinesis, technopathy, light manipulation, and host of many new things I could do. Unlike my intended thoughts, Petro and the all-too-excited Davis had managed to convince me to bring them along, and since Wanda was busy with Laura, I didn't need to carry her along too. So how are we doing this? I just need to hulk out. Banner was still a bit apprehensive, and rightfully so, since he was unsure how strong my claims of being able to keep him at bay, should he go on a rampage stood. Well, that and I also convinced him not to tell Natasha or anyone else for that matter what we were about to do. The last thing I needed was a worried audience when doing what I had in mind. Well Banner, I am going to attack you, 
and then proceed to test my strength against an angry Hulk, if that's what you are asking. Test quite the word you are using there. He chuckled and rubbed his hands together as if he was feeling cold. That's what we are doing. So I guess it fits. Petro and Davis were quite off the distance, watching with rapt attention at our every motion. How about we start? Wait dash before he could say anything else. The blast struck his chest and threw a long distance away, till he was a tiny dot in normal eyesight. I watched with little amusement as I finally saw the Hulk transforming for the first time in front of me, muscles growing absurdly large and fast, with his skin changing colors just as fast if not faster. He landed on the ground, fully transformed in a hulking green of insurmountable rage, and even with over 500 meters of distance between us, his eyes were firmly locked to my form. With a loud boom that raised a cloud of dusts, he quickly closed the distance in one leap, all done in the space of a few seconds. Threat identified target. Hulk activating laid down protocols designed for the Hulk. Let's see how I fare against the real thing. He was up in front of me in the blink of an eye, with his fist already smashing towards me. I threw a fist of my own, multiplying my base strength and increasing its density, and also covering the entire arm with a repelling barrier. The dunes of sand between us was cleared away as our fists connected with each other, and I actually staggered back a few steps. I could already feel the Hulk's rage increasing by the moment, and blanketing tens of kilometers from our focus point. The feeling was further boosted when he saw I could actually withstand his punch, and the grin he sported was not one of comfort, nevertheless I was far from being afraid. Because just like the Hulk, I had an emotional multiplier of my own, and not only that, with my control of my body's biomass and density, I could match him punch for punch, unless he started breaking his dreaded limits. Despite the rage he was emitting, the killing intent he exuded was at an all-time low, not even compared to what he showed during the Battle of Sokovia, which led me to believe that the Hulk really was increasing his sentience based on Banner's IQ. He appeared before me in the flash of a second, fist cocked, as he struck from overhead, aiming to pummel me down into the ground. But this time I was ready for him. Instead of just applying the repelling field around my arm like last time, I directed it towards the earth and magnified its effect by a thousandfold, causing the Hulk who had his fist centimeters away from face to shoot upwards as the earth rebounded him fiercely, directly in opposition with the force he was carrying. Shooting off a few blasts to annoy him further, I shot upwards towards him, overtaking him easily, and then came crashing down on him with my weight increasing by a ton. With every centimeter I fell downwards. Petro might have sensed the danger as he took David and ran them both kilometers away from ground zero, where it looked as if an atomic bomb had been dropped. Davis watched in shock as the behemoth and the man with a jewel on his head pummeled their way into each other, trading blow for blow with deranged grins on their faces. Though there was no blood, the picture of devastation they painted sent a chill down the spine of the unfortunate watchers. If not for Petro's quick thinking, they would have turned casualties of a friendly spa. At least one of them would. It must have been his eyes playing tricks on him. Or maybe because of the far distance. But he could swear that the Hulk had grown larger than he was before during the start of the fight. Oh. My. God. How can they fight like that? Davis exclaimed as he saw them wantonly destroying everything that was unfortunate to be in their immediate environment. I don't know, man. I never knew he was this strong. Petro said in awe as he watched Vision gave a literal backhand to the Hulk. The Hulk flew for a bit before pausing midair, as if held by an invisible wall, and was drawn back from whence. He came as if he was put in reverse. They were stunned as Vision's hands grew to a large proportion and slammed the incoming Hulk resulting in an earth-shattering roar of rage, causing both fighters to switch tempo. In his insurmountable rage, the Hulk looked more jacked up than his previous appearances since forever, and his body was emitting steam, as well as veins that creeped all over his strained muscles. He stomped hard on the ground, and everything in a 5 kilometers range sank as if drained through a funnel. But Vision remained unfazed, as the sands went against the flow, and formed a platform for him to stand on, and surprisingly the same also happened with the Hulk. Everything fell silent as the two of them stared at each other only for the Hulk's eyes to betray confusion, as multiple visions started appearing, each identical to the last. Vision, annoying. Followed by a shout and then a dive towards the nearest iteration of Vision, who surprisingly defended himself for a few seconds before dissipating. Hulk hate Vision's trick. The multitude of visions chuckled at the simplistic brute monster, still having more than enough breathing space, despite how close to mutual annihilation their battle had been. Well, how about we wrap it up soon? Hulk said nothing except blitzing in the direction of the vision who said that and ran through him unobstructed. He shifted his body just the split moment before he touched the ground, changing the direction of his rebound. He grunted in annoyance as he felt the annoying pull from the earth, but his pride would not let him succumb to something as simple as an increased gravitational pull. Vision was simply uncontested when it came to manipulating energy to bring about different effects. 
He wasn't behind the Hulk in terms of physical strength either, absorbing, redirecting, amplifying, boosting and altering density, opened up myriads of ways to contend against the green beast of might. Hulk, finally having enough, brought his hands together in a booming clap that destroyed some of Vision's hard light illusion emphasis on the hard, and pushed the others back. Vision's true body fizzled into his material form from nothingness, taking the Hulk by surprise, as he appeared too close to him. But Vision didn't think too much of it, and just placed his hands on the head of the Hulk, and said, sleep, followed by an upsurge of telepathic wave, that immediately assaulted the Hulk, and effectively knocking him out. Battle effectiveness against the Hulk dash 92% throughout the fight. The number had been fluctuating between the lower ends of 80, and the upper level of 90, and before the end of their fight, it had started dropping steadily into the 70s. After engaging him in a prolonged bout of physical strength, so it was no wonder why it kept on lowering. He had switched to energy manipulation, his specialty, and that was enough for him to level the playing field, and started toying around with the Hulk, much to the latter's irritation and anger. I'd admit, that was as much as a workout anyone can get. He said as Hulk's form shifted back to a quivering banner. Petro, get over here. Petro ran over in a gust of wind carrying a stunned Davis who looked as if he couldn't decide whether to be amazed or fearful. Vision's pristine appearance and his earlier savagery, painted quite the contrasting picture, left the two young men how to exactly feel. We're going back, he said before taking off with Bruce and leaving the two of them there to follow after. The two of them stood there watching Vision disappear into the horizon, until they could no longer see him. He's that strong, both him and Hulk, Davis asked, still in disbelief of the fight he had just witnessed. Petro looked at him for a second and said, I don't know, man. I mean, I've always known this was strong, and I've seen the Hulk fight. But that's just, he too was speechless about how they could pulverize the other and still come out unscathed. Come on, let's go. He grabbed Davis and ran a straight line towards Compound. 30 minutes after they left, a huge sleek black jet landed in the middle of the desert, and from it alighted a few people dressed in specialized suits. Oh damn, you're not going to believe this Chuck. Logan whistled as he scanned the area of destruction that spanned a few tens of kilometers, along with a few members of the X-Men. His nose twitched for a few moments and so did Hank, but unlike the former, Hank outright growled before snapping himself out of it. What was that? Aurora asked, noticing the odd behavior of the two of them. Hank frowned as he felt an animalistic sense of danger that still wafted in the air, and also the mind-numbing feeling of unwarranted anger. Something fought here. Something incredibly angry, Charles. Whatever telepathic signature you picked up when using Cerebro probably already left. Yeah. Aurora nodded, and if it's a mutant capable of surviving a destruction of this capacity, and also a telepath, he's going to be an absurdly powerful one. Let's just hope whoever he is not of the troublesome elk. If you can't find anything there, come back. We have more pressing issues to worry about. Charles's voice resounded in their heads, prompting them to give up on their impromptu search, and return back to the mansion to figure out a way to tide over the coming storms. Can you just believe me when I say I wasn't trying to steal it? I mean, I was, but I was going to return it later. Scott Lang argued as he found himself restrained in red bindings in his diminutive size. Sam scoffed in ridicule. Yeah? Says the guy who did five years in San Quentin for corporate larceny. Scott looked offended as he heard the words of the winged man he won up in minutes, until he was caught by the scary girl that is. I burgled them. Yeah, right. Sam rolled his eyes, not at all amused at Scott. Wanda looked between them, her only curiosity being whether the man was a mutant, or the shrinking powers he had was somehow connected to his suit. Hey, look here, I'm trying to change. Okay. He grimaced as he saw the questioning eyes of his captors, and remembered why he got caught. This is different. I'm trying to save the world. I also said I was going to return it, didn't I? Wanda turned to look at Sam and asked, What are we going to do with him? Sam looked at the device on his arm and replied, Steve will be here soon. Vision is not in the building or else he'd be here already. He then looked at Wanda silently asking if she knew of the elusive Avengers' whereabouts. Wanda only shook her head in a negative reply. Petro and Davis are not in the base, so it's likely that he took them with him. She conjectured. Though he's only met Davis once, he had watched the video when Vision fought and put the brownish-gray Hulk to sleep, and yeah, he wasn't a fan of any raging Hulk. You know what they could be up to. Probably training, Wanda said. Sam didn't need any more clarification after hearing that. Though he was curious about how they could train a Hulk, 
He wasn't that curious that he really wanted to know. So, um, what's going to happen to me? Scott interjected them, feeling frustrated that he couldn't even twitch his limbs, despite the fact that he was way stronger than a bodybuilder in his small size. Whatever the girl was using to hold was hella strong. Sam cut him off as he felt his frustration rising with every word left in the man's mouth. Shut up. Scott groaned at Sam's stubbornness. Come on, you know where I live. There's no way I can run even if I wanted to. I really need that tech thingy. What tech thingy? Sam asked, knowing fully well that Scott wouldn't just give it up. But it's a signal decoy. You guys have a few of those. I just need one. The two Avengers looked stunned and looked at the man as if he was an idiot. But before anyone could say anything else, the doors opened and Steve walked in, not looking a bit surprised at seeing the shrunken sized man in a red blob of energy. This him. Oh my god, it's Captain America. Scott Whisper shouted to himself as he saw the war icon face to face for the first time. Steve looked at Scott, and despite feeling a bit weird, he sat down in front of Scott, who stood unmoving on a table. I'll get to the point. Why were you trying to sneak inside our base? Okay, first of all, I didn't know it was yours. It was supposed to be an old Stark warehouse according to what I was told Dash, someone told you to rob us. Sam interjected, catching the slip up which made Scott pause with a wry smile on his face. Well the doors opened up again, and this time it was Vision in his robotic look and a piece of tech in his hands and little ants running around it. I believe these little guys are your doings. Scott's expression paled as he realized that his little plot had been thoroughly busted. Ants? Steve asked. Yes, Vision nodded. Mr. Lang here can control ants. It's not an inherent power, but one based on technology. He looked at Wanda and signaled her with his eyes which she understood making her release Scott of her hold. Scott reverted back to his normal size, but didn't make any move because he knew he would just be easily put down, as long as the Wonder Girl was here. So what now? He asked hesitatingly as he was faced with the scrutiny of the Falcon, the scary girl, the good to honest Captain America, and the weird-looking robot Jude. Steve and Sam were confused, but understandably allowed Vision to do what he wanted. So can you tell us the real reason why you broke into our storage? Steve asked calmly. Scott sighed as he had to convince them from the start again. Listen, I already told you. I need that thing to stop a bad guy. You know how it goes. They all looked at Vision and Wanda, because only the two of them had the means to verify whether the man was lying. Wanda would have to be in contact with Scott to ascertain his truth. Because of her lacking expertise in telepathy and empathy, different from Vision, who could directly sense it as broad as day. Well, he's telling the truth. Those words of confirmation changed the atmosphere and opinion of everyone in the room. But before we get into that, I believe it's time we get your own side of the story, Dr. Pym. Oh! Fuck. Scott cursed, realizing that the heist was now fully busted. The voice that had been shouting at him through the comms even before he landed on the base, immediately quieted down. He didn't know how the red weirdly looking guy figured that out, but he knew he just put Dr. Pym in the spotlight of Stark, something he recently became aware of with how the man hated the other's father's guts. Relax. I don't mean anything malicious with that. In good faith, you can take this and leave. Vision handed him the signal decoy, despite the confused look on Scott's face. But I'll be visiting in a few hours to understand why Hank Pym made someone else the Ant-Man. Steve and Sam were surprised by Vision's actions, with Sam looking very unsure of the latter's action. But they did nothing. And just let Scott go. Thank you. I promise you, I'll return this. He took a deep breath and looked at everyone one by one. Goodbye everyone, Captain America. Falcon, weird scary lady and the weird red Jude. Sam scoffed at him, while Wanda narrowed her eyes dangerously at him. He was about to shrink down to hightail the fuck out of here, but he stopped as his curiosity got the better of him despite the urging voices coming from his speakers as he turned to Wanda and Vision. Are you guys related? Siblings? Married? I just want to say that red suits both of you. He immediately shrank down and called to the nearest winged ant to take him out of there at the nearest speed. Luckily escaping by the time Wanda snapped out of it, and rage took over. Vision POV well that was as much a surprise for me like it was for everyone else. I had already put a tag on him and Hank Pym during my search for likely recruits, allies and potential enemies. But he wasn't that much of an importance if I were to be blatantly logical. Well not as much as the Pym particles were. Not like I hated the Jude or anything, none of that. But he wasn't actually a priority I needed to keep an eye on. And I also didn't remember much about his movies or even his comics for that matter. The only I kept a ping on was if words started going around about a supposedly Ant-Man. So I'd know of his emergence. After Scott left, Banner woke up and gave me the stink eye and promised me he would never agree to a spa with me as long as he was in control. 
Davis being the crazy one was a lot happy about the prospect of his potential, after seeing my fight against Banner. And it was only after I explained the need for a supervision during his transformation, did he dial down his excitement. I was of the mind to build something like an emotional inhibitor for Banner. But I later decided against it, as it wouldn't do him any good. Since I wanted him to strive for symbiosis with the Hulk, and further suppressing his latter half, would do no one any good. It was also quite funny when I no longer was the only one subjected to Laura's intense stares, as she found her second target in Banner. But unlike how she did with me, she didn't approach him for some reason. Right now, I was in Dr. Hank Pym's house with Petro and Laura, who agreed to come with me after I had jokingly asked. Her mother was rightfully anxious, but I assured how we were doing nothing dangerous and just paying a visit, before she finally calmed down, before entering the geek zone with the now sober banner who she instantly recognized. Cozy home you have here, Dr. Pym. I was using my human appearance this time since I felt they'd be more receptive to it. Appearance does matter, you know. Seated across me was the wise and Hank Pym, his daughter, Hope, and the new Ant-Man behind him. Well, it used to be a lot cozier. He snorted. I don't know if that was a jab directed at me or someone else, but I wasn't commenting on it. I believe introductions are in order. I'm Vision, and these are Petro and Laura. I introduce myself and the two Yaoguns by my side. Both his and Rose's eyes drifted to Laura before a frown marred their faces. You taken children now. I chuckled as they both flinched as Laura growled at them with her claws bared. She's had a troubled past, and as you just figured out, she doesn't like being called a child. I said and tapped Laura's shoulders to make her stop which she did and retracted her claws. A mutant. I didn't answer the question since I had no reason to. I looked at Petro who was just looking around until he caught my eyes and shrugged. I'll take a look around. I rolled my eyes as he left the house to run around the neighborhood just to find something to do for the next minute or two until the discussion got serious. Why are you here? I don't remember ever hearing the Avengers ever conducting an interrogation on civilians. Hank Pym said as he relaxed into his chair while Rose and Scott appeared tense. Nothing so crass, I assure you. I'm only here to ascertain the veracity of your protege's words. Hope scoffed under her breath, making me realize that she still hated Scott quite a bit at this time. I don't believe the Avengers have it in them to perform corporate espionage. He chuckled dryly. And I don't believe for a second that you're here to lend a helping hand from the good of your heart. Oh, far from it. They all seemed surprised at my quick admittance. But I just continued on. The reason I'm here is because prior to your little B and E, Darren Cross, your former protege, revealed that he had found the key to revolutionizing the arms market, more so than Stark ever did, so obviously I got a little curious. Though this news only got to a certain circle, I have my ways around these things. I don't consider myself a genius in many things, but the timing of his heist on our base and the news does put a lot of things in question. What do you want from us? This time it was Hope who asked. Well, nothing much, as well as your father's assistance. So you don't plan to help? Do you want me to help? She fell silent and looked at her father, who had a distressed look on his face, while Scott just looked lost. Hank hated Stark and S.H.I.E.L.D. and anyone affiliated with them due to their past betrayal. But I wasn't here to discuss that. I've scanned all the digital files in this house, and not one of them contained his formula which meant it was all on his head. I wasn't that keen on getting the pin particle at all cost, since I easily could if I wanted even without any of them knowing. But my goal here was to have a connection with them even if it'd mean nothing down the line, which I doubt it would. The father and daughter duo were the forerunners in quantum research, and anything related. What do you want from me? Hank Pym asked. Like I said nothing much. Your assistance will be greatly needed if I require your expertise. But until then, I'm only here to hear from you what's going on. It wasn't exactly a lie per se, but it wasn't a full truth either. So this is a business. Why are old men this cranky and self-important? I just said I don't need anything substantial from him, and he's still probing. I'm not giving you my research if that's what you're after. I scoffed at his words. I don't need the pin particles to crack nanotechnology. Vibranium was already coming a long way there. It isn't called the most versatile metal on earth for nothing. The uses were just too many that not even I had figured out all of them. Trust me, if I were greedy towards your life's work, I would have gotten my hands on it by now. But you still haven't given a concrete reason why you're here, haven't I? I believe my reason for coming here couldn't be clearer. They looked confused, so I clarified further for their understanding. Do you want my help? I had a feeling that, sooner or later, something was about to blow up, and since this was Marvel, yeah, that means every Tuesday. As much as Hank Pym didn't trust me, he actually relented to accept my help just when Darren Cross arrived at his house. It was actually funny seeing them holding their breaths the entire time Darren Cross was here, 
and couldn't believe their eyes, when the man didn't even notice their presence. A little hard light manipulation, and the man thought he was alone with Hank Pym and a neighbor who came over for the baseball game. I could feel that he wanted to kill Hank Pym then and there. But a little nudge from me was all that was needed for him to scrap that plan. I put the thought that it'll be much better if Hank Pym lives to see everything he's ever cherished be completely taken by Cross, and then die. Normally I'd be done with something like this, but the call was Hank's to make. He still wanted to go the route of corporate sabotage, and have Scott steal the yellow jacket. But it was a little boring for me, so I decided to add a little spice. Wouldn't it be better for him to lose everything he's ever worked for on the day he thought he'd finally make it to the top of the world? It only took a few minutes for the database of cross technologies to be as open to me as Hell's Gate is to a sinner. It was filled with all the illegal protocols the man had taken in his endeavor to perfect his own version of the PIM particles. The database of cross technologies was quite secured due to the high number of cyber attacks they get in a single day. And if I had tried hacking it, then no doubt they would have been alerted. But I'd fractioned a part of my mind into a few kilobytes of data, and filtered myself into their internet connection. And from there I'd download a larger part of my consciousness. That was sufficient for the task into their software as cache data and went unhindered from there. So how are we going to do this? An all too excited Scott asked. I'll get you inside without anyone knowing. And all you have to do is get the yellow jacket out of there as fast as you can. Petro will clear out the civilians in the event that a fight breaks out. I explained to them while slowly drinking the tea the old man had been so gracious to make for me. I managed to pick up on the range of frequencies he used in controlling the ants. But I wasn't able to find out how he had interwoven them to form some sort of imperial language that the ants couldn't reject. Well, I'll crack it soon, but I wasn't interested in it. And what will you be doing? Hope asked with apparent skepticism. Me? I pointed to myself then shrugged. I promised Laura's mother that she won't be fighting so I'll be on babysitting role. I'm afraid. But don't worry. I have the entire building under watch. Nothing can get past me without me knowing as long as I'm watching. Perhaps having seen my previous display, she didn't argue too much left for the company. Since she had to welcome some big shots and potential buyers. How about we get this quickly sorted out so everyone can go home early? Hank grunted cursing under his breath in incomprehensible words, while Scott looked hyped up. I could feel Laura's eagerness rising, but I only shook my head at her, and doused any bubbling excitement she was feeling. It irked me a little how much she liked fighting, which she actually didn't. It was more like her body's natural reaction to any visible conflict. It was an animalistic tendency that I wanted her to gain control over. Logan suffered the same thing along with his brother, Victor Creed which made them quite the bloodthirsty duo during their younger years. To satiate their thirst for battle was also the reason why they scripted to fight in the World War. It only got better for Logan after he had his adamantium implant, which dulled his animalistic side quite a bit, but not completely. I received a status update request from Steve along the way to Cross Technologies, which I replied to give him the heads up of what was about to happen. So how do I get in? Scott asked as we parked in front of the huge building. Easy, we walk in. They were all stunned, and before any of them, Hank and Hope could voice their objection. I was already inside the building after going through security with Laura without it triggering a beep. Get moving. I said and made my way towards the room for the secret presentation. It was obvious that the Yellow Jacket presentation was something only a few knew of. So the rest of the people here were for the unveiling of other projects his group had completed. How did you do that? I heard Hope's voice in my head as Laura and I calmly walked behind Darren Cross. As he talked to some key figures, and a few of their identities were interesting to say the least. I hacked into your company's systems. That's also how I included both mine, Laura's and Petro's invitation in their registry. I answered nonchalantly as we entered the dark room with little lights before Cross started his presentation. I have to give it to the guy that he definitely had a sense of aesthetics, because the yellow jacket's design looked good. Somewhere during the middle of Cross's presentation, I became aware that I was being observed, which shouldn't have been possible since, apart from not using my real human face, I was in a psychic zone that diminished any precognitive senses that focused on me or in the perimeter of the zone. It made people naturally forget my presence, making me easily blend into the background. The only way someone can intently look at me was if they were immune to this level of telepathy. Without giving away that I was aware of their stare, I subtly registered the number of presences here with only my telepathic senses and found that the owner of the stair was quite subdued as opposed to the rest here. I looked through the cameras here and saw that it was some middle-aged man. Crossing his face through the registry of this event, I found out that he was called Jonathan Drain. No records whatsoever. Most likely a fake identity. I refocused my attention to Darren Cross, who was about to have his life's work stolen before his eyes and the eyes of his buyers. Gentlemen, I give you the yellow jacket. 
The toy size Jello arm suit was revealed while inside a reinforced glass tube that was protected by lasers, blocking the only open vent that was connected to it. I knew he was hoping Scott Lang was trying to steal it, and he'd already taken countermeasures to make sure that the smaller man couldn't escape. Under the astonished gaze of everyone, including Darren Cross, Something like a fly hit the suit, and it fell down the tube it came up on. Darren was quick to tap a few buttons, and had a small smile on his face, that was threatening to burst out, as he waited expectantly for the now-closed-off tube to bring the Ant-Man suit back up. The audience calmed down since Darren looked as if he knew what was going on, but after a few seconds the room slowly became awkward as the man started breathing roughly, and his face turned a shan as he frantically tapped on the tablet in his hands. No, 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 no this can't be happening. He muttered chaotically to himself, which affirmed the audience that something had gone majorly wrong. While some didn't see it due to how fast it happened, some with more acute eyesight caught the man-like tiny shadow that grabbed the yellow jacket under the microscope. As they were about to leave, Darren pulled out a gun and pointed it at his former mentor, Hank Pym. It was you, wasn't it? He's still in the building, and there's no way he can escape. I looked at Laura who calmly watched everything with sharpened eyes and a steady heartbeat. She looked ready for an assault if anything attacked. It got boring pretty quick, right? Yes, she simply said. She really was a person of few words. Unsurprisingly, the first person to sneakily leave the room was the so-called Jonathan Drain. So naturally he had my full attention. Come on, let's leave. I tugged at Laura and we left the room. Before we left, I sent a telepathic burst that shut down all of Darren's cognitive functions, effectively knocking him out as well as everybody else in the room, except for the stunned Hank Pym. While I didn't have any need for entertaining this as long as I did, I can't deny that I also got something from it. All data pertaining to the yellow jacket have been successfully downloaded notice. Initial scan of the shrinking particles formula used for the yellow jacket shows slight miscalculations in respect to its effect on biological neurons well. It was an imperfect version of the original Pym particles, so no surprise that his was lacking. Darren Cross will wake up to the worst day of life, as he would be facing a life sentence behind bars. If any single one of his contacts try helping him out, well there's always room for more in prison. My work with Hank is done, and it'll be up to him, or Scott even, to decide whether they want to work with me or not. I can even throw a free buy after fully understanding how the Pym particles work, and tackle quantum diving. Just for the sake of it, I believe this is where we make our acquaintance, Mr. Drain. The man in question appeared spooked due to how Laura and I appeared out of thin air, as he was trying to get into his car and leave in haste. Who are you? Oh, he was good, definitely good, with the way he totally acted as if this was his first time seeing me. As if he had not been paying the most attention to me throughout the duration of the presentation. How negligent of me. My name is Vision. I would like to address you as Mr. Drain, but I think we both know that name is fake. He fell silent as he looked at both me and Laura, the former feigning in his eyes gone only to be replaced with an underlying seriousness. What do you want from me? He asked. I looked at Laura and shook my head as I could see her relaxing as she saw that the other party no longer appeared hostile. If it wasn't for the time I spent copying Natasha to a T, I too as well would have been ignorant of the faux pretense his posture suggested. Nothing much, I assure you. I waved my hands in a nonchalant way to show how little my inquiry mattered. I just want to know who you are affiliated with. His face scrunched up in confusion as he heard my question. I don't understand. Hum, you are a mutant, aren't you? I just want to know who you're with. The moment those words left my mouth, he immediately attacked by trying to drive a roundhouse kick to my head in advantage of our close distance. To his shock, the kick stopped just a few seconds centimeters from my face, which was when Laura sprung into action, at least before I stopped her. You are not fighting under my watch, young lady. Not when I promised your mother you won't. What? His eyes widened in shock as he saw that, but was quick to draw back his legs after feeling that he could take them back, but not forth. Who are you? His eyes betrayed the wariness he felt, and I could feel his apprehension rolling out in waves as he looked at me and Laura again, eyes widening a bit in recognition as he saw the two bladed claws slowly retracting back into the latter's hands. Like I said, my name is Vision, and I believe you still haven't told me your name. The police were already coming to apprehend Darren Cross, and I could feel his apprehension growing as the sirens got louder. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you mine, he said. Not even a fake name. Will that work? I chuckled and shook my head lightly. No, it wouldn't. Laura looked between the two of us with confusion on her face, at how civil our conversation was despite him trying to attack me. Well, if you won't give me your name then I can't push it. 
but I'm afraid you'll have to tell me why you were there, and trying to steal Darren Cross research files too. Now that got a more prominent reaction out of him. I had felt a bug when I was digging through the company's servers, and without thinking too much I assimilated it and resumed my work, and it wasn't until he left the presentation room, did I feel a receiving signal coming from his pockets, so I followed him. Not to mention that I had a few hunches of who he might really be, but I couldn't be sure unless he admitted it. I chuckled as he got into a fighting stance once again, but given how close the police were in arriving, I decided on getting this over with. The panic in his eyes flared out and wide, as he found out that all his movements were restricted, and before he could do anything, my hands landed on his chest and using the Mind Stone, I had wanted to break his psychic barrier, but ended up breaking something else her illusion. As if a trail of dominoes, both the suit he wore and his skin rose and fell until what was in front of me was a blue-skinned woman with red hair and yellow eyes. Raven Darkholm. I muttered to myself under my breath which she heard and fought more violently, not at having her identity revealed, but her name which was somewhat understandable as very few people knew her, and even fewer knew her real name. I guess this is the end of surprises for today. Raven, commonly known as Mystique, looked at the man who somehow had nullified her shape shifting with a single touch with fear creeping into her body. You know that I can sue you for sexual assault, right? She said with a chuckle at the confused face he made which slowly morphed into a humorous realization. Can this be counted as your naked body? Vision was genuinely confused as this was something that had generated a lot of curiosity among common folks in his former world. Raven, on the other hand, was a little lost on how to react when faced with such a genuine question, but she still answered nonetheless. Yes. Oh. Vision slowly retracted his hands, and with it their little banter died, replacing the atmosphere with its previous solemnity. Ms. Raven, if you're here, then am I right to believe it was on Magneto's orders? She didn't know why, not even sure if it was because of the powers he used which she had no idea of what they were. But everything about the man calling himself Vision made her instinctually nervous. She shook her head at his question. No, he doesn't know I'm here. She had no idea why she answered him, but she just did. He was that scary. She didn't know how he knew about her and Magneto, but she didn't care much about it. All that was on her mind now was to escape. In Vision's mind, he was running likely scenarios and events in the likelihood that he apprehends Raven here and now. He knew for a fact that Magneto will be forced to move if that happens, and with the way things were at the moment, a mutant's act of terrorism was the last thing anyone wanted, anyone that wasn't the government that is. Raven looked at him in surprise as she felt the hold he had placed on her disappear, and she could escape now, but she wasn't foolish enough to believe she could, if he doesn't want it to happen. Why? Though ambiguous, they both understood what she was asking. It's nothing complicated. You've been keeping a low profile for years now according to what I know. And I believe no one wants a mutant scuffle when the government is against you now more than they've ever been. Her form shifted to a middle-aged woman with blonde hair in a suit, and the moment she did that, he ran a scan of her present appearance. And actually got a ping this time. Bayville High, huh? It looks like this persona of hers was a principal at Bavel High, which was coincidentally where the kids from Xavier's went to school. Is this one of those times when she went on her own or is she still a follower of Eric? Is that your way of saying you are against the Accords? She asked. In a way, yes. Let's go Laura. He said to the girl who was quietly beside him the entire time, and just that moment a boy appeared beside him in a gust of wind, surprising Raven once again. The three of them disappeared before her eyes which astounded her even more, as she couldn't figure out what kind of ability Vision had. Vision POV I kept the meeting with Mystique to myself, because there was no need for the others to know. Seriously, there was no point in it. The only reason I even pursued it was because I wanted to know who was involved, and if not for that little hiccup that happened when I tried reading her mind, I would have just infiltrated her thoughts and left. I knew either Scott or Hank would reach out to me soon, so there was no need for me to hang around or tell them I was leaving. Right now, I was about to do something I've been putting off because of the Accords, and since it was already underway, I pretty much knew those who were for it or not, and those still on the bench. Davis was with Banner and Sarah, the duo running tests on him after he agreed to their requests, and the only two people with me were Wanda and Laura, both for reasons known only to them. What are you doing? Wanda asked after seeing me pull holograms of the Avengers and running some specs on them. Working on outfitting the team, I said as I pulled up the schematics for the first person, Natasha. The costume for the Black Widow was pretty simple and easy on the eyes. 
First things first was a complete Vibranium overall. Thankfully, a lot of Vibranium was salvaged from Ultron's Media City. So I had a lot to work with, and then, coupled with the sizable amount of raw adamantium ore that I got from the facility, outfitting everyone, even Stark, was a piece of cake. It was a stroke of good luck for me that Stark was someone competent and reliable when it came to technology, since the entire compound was filled with them, so there was no need for me designing and building a 3D printer or a weaver for the material I was sewing. Even me, she asked as she saw the specs of her profile, and you got my measurements correct. I stopped for a moment before continuing with the same pace and answered, yes. And if you really want to know, I know the measurements of every single member of the Avengers. She grinned and just nodded to herself, focusing her attention to the detailed parts of her data. Do you have any ideas for me? She asked. I finally looked up at her, and then at the image before replying to her. Well red suits you. So the color scheme stays the same. You don't need anything in terms of defense or offense, so most things stay the same. Honestly, you and Banner are receiving the least upgrade. Well, Banner isn't receiving anything actually, since he has the perfect defense. Yours is just mostly cosmetic. What of me? We both turned to Laura who didn't see her profile amongst the others. You'll want to fight. I asked even though I already knew the answer, and just as I hoped, she nodded. Well then, this is a brainstorming session. So what kind of upgrades do you want? Xavier's school for gifted youngsters after the other members of the team returned from their little reconnaissance mission. Xavier called them all to his office to inform them of the latest change of plans in the government hierarchy. So they got owned by a robot. Ain't that hilarious? Logan chortled causing him to choke on his beer. Be that as it may, at least we now know which side the Avengers most likely stand on. Charles added. Aurora looked at Charles and asked, should we talk to them? The reason she asked was that she knew more than anyone even Charles. What would happen once the laws were made public? Charles fell silent and so did the others. Because they knew this was more serious than they were comfortable admitting. What about this vision guy? We know the Avengers are not for the Accords. But we also know that they can't oppose the government so forwardly. That guy's stunt is bound to bite them in the ass later on. Those old fucks can be pretty tenacious when they want to be. Logan said with no small amount of irritation in his voice. Sigh. And the Fantastic Four. Hank interjected. When groups were taken into consideration, the Fantastic Four were always the odd one out. Given that they were the only ones who had a legal contract with the government, whatever that entailed. Charles shook his head. I don't know. There was something interfering with the psychic energy in the room, probably Reed Richards. But, let me guess, Vision. Hank speculated seeing Charles's hesitation. It's just something off about him the first time I saw him on TV. Probably some wild instincts. But that was enough to make me quite curious about him. He's supposed to be in self-evolving android, right? Charles tapped his temple as he remembered what he felt when he was in the presence of Vision. It was like a bottomless gulf threatening to suck in all life or anything that comes too close. That doesn't sound too user-friendly. Scott quipped. Ha, huh, no shitting kid. I don't think we need to worry that much since he's with the Avengers. Need I remind you what Chuck said when he first tried gauging the Hulk? Or Thor. Logan reasoned. Charles let out an embarrassed laugh at Logan pointing out one of his flaws. He wasn't one to judge someone on appearances or how they felt. But their actions instead otherwise he wouldn't have cared for people like Kurt and Logan. With how the former looked demonic and the other was just a straight-up murdering beast in human form. But then again, first impressions were important when getting acquainted with someone. So, are we talking with them or not? Aurora questioned again. Colossus then asked, Do we really need to? Hank answered before Charles could. No, we don't. But we continuing to go alone will prove to bite us way sooner than we expected. We're exposed to the whims of the government, and should they prove hostile, any act of resistance from us will be seen as terrorism. It's fucking complicated politics I mean. He groaned in irritation, an expression mirrored perfectly by the others. Vision POV getting the Toshas, Wanders and Barton's new jetup was a piece of cake, and it also helped that I could control every single piece of machinery here. So it took less time than it would have if I had done it simultaneously. It also was kind of funny and a little embarrassing for me bearing all the teasing comments and innuendos from Wanda about me, knowing her proportions and bust size, which I was made aware of had increased prior, hence her amusement. It is very refreshing seeing her breaking out of her shell, and expressing herself once again without the guilt of her past weighing down on her. 
This way the future menace known as the Scarlet Witch was going farther from nuking all mutant kind across the multiverse. Right now, I was putting the final touches to Laura's design, which was an all-black leather suit with retractable protrusions for her claws. The suit also functioned as a medium for echolocation due to its vibranium properties, which heightened her senses to a whole new level. Seriously, the uses for vibranium are almost endless. For Steve, the suit had a darker shade like the one in the Infinity War movie, with all the goodies that came with it and more. With his natural strength along with the seamless lining I did with the adamantium mixed with a little vibranium, to make it flexible to the point that Steve wouldn't feel it that much, the suit increases his physical properties a notch higher and he was like a mini Hulk with it. His shield also had a little upgrade apart from the one Stark did that let it return back even when stuck. I added a photon casing around it that charged it up, and with a strong enough throw, it became less of a frisbee and more of a cleaver. A photoadamantium cleaver. Noise. And while doing this, I also cracked the pin particles, quite easily if I do say so myself. Adding that as an accessory to the suit and making it Pro Max adaptable to the point that it could be fitted into a piece of jewelry or a keychain was the highlight of my little assignment. As for the Falcon, his went through a complete overhaul as I had to build it from scratch, and what became the outcome of it was a very sleek red and white jacket that housed all the components of his suit. The bulk was greatly reduced, and when retracted, the wings could cut through reinforced carbine glass. If he used enough force and switched with the adamantium parts for the wings, which was mostly the outer edge, and he could make it a little blunt, if he wanted to help with his flying. Well, he was the pilot so he'll figure the controls out. An explosion just happened at Oscar. A few people of interests are currently at the vicinity of the explosion. Oh, would you look at that? Goblin trouble. This time around I was alone as I made my way to Oscar unnoticed to find out what was happening, and also thinking of what to do. I had no problem with killing anyone, thanks to my thought processes. But am I okay with just killing everyone I call a villain? Oh, don't get me wrong, Norman Osborn is dying, no doubt about that. He might deserve many things, but being alive is not one of them. He was evil, period. What I was thinking of was if it was alright to kill every bad guy I come across. Logic or morality which was better to choose from. Before all this, I was just a normal guy. I had my good side and my bad side. But now, after being influenced by one of the six relics of universal creation, everything now feels different. Well, the changes are welcomed, but sometimes I'm torn between enforcing my change head on regardless of the consequences. Or maybe moving a brick or two, making the waves while also being mindful of the consequences. Sometimes it's like I have to be mindful of the changes I make, while it's okay to leave my mark as I live my life, something keeps on nagging me. That I should also let the others live their life without any input from me. The fastest mind on earth and I still can't beat existential crisis. I joked as I landed on the roof of the budding conglomerate in the research and energy sector Oscar. It was quite funny looking at Peter Parker frantically looking around trying to find a way to ditch and switch uniforms. But the goblin held everyone hostage. So he couldn't make any movements and risk the lives of his classmates and other civilians in the building. So no Spider-Man anytime soon and the police can't barge in since. Well, they'll just be marching to their deaths. Since I was invisible to anything except spectral senses, it was a piece of cake for me to walk in unimpeded. Unlike the former Vision, or the Vision that would have been, I wasn't one to fancy superhero costumes. So I just changed my outfit to a black and red iconic checkered shirt with white fur collars and jean pants. The most casual outfit anyone can get. Don't worry, just follow the line and you'll be alright. The entire floor fell silent as I started directing the bound, well now unbounded, hostages through the barrier-like passage I constructed with hard light. Who the hell are you? The gobsmacked goblin asked with surprise, seeing as how I just appeared out of nowhere, and constructed a road in the middle of his corporate building floor. I ignored him and just made sure the people didn't stampede on each other, and only then did I turn back to the goblin. You, your vision, right? His glider hummed into life making me suppress a chuckle, as the thing immediately fell under my command, with the goblin blissfully oblivious. Glad you know. I didn't bother asking him how he knew me, since a few people already knew what my human form looked like after the meeting. He let out the maniacal laugh he was known for and floated up with his glider. I was waiting for the spider. But since he isn't coming I'll take my leave for another time. And that was panic setting in as he realized that his getaway ride wasn't responding to his commands. Remember what I said about logic and morality. Sometime you don't need either. All you need is a fuck at all mindset. And you'll be surprised by how little most things matter. 
I stretched my hands towards him and pulled him towards me only for my hand to get caught by webs, courtesy of a spider hanging upside down the ceiling. Sorry, but I felt like you were just about to kill him. He apologized before jumping down and crashing down on the glider and destroying it while webbing the goblin to the wall. If it isn't the annoying bug. Pity you came when the party already ended. This just turned annoying real fast. Not that that was going to help the soon-to-be-dead gnome. Call it bias or whatever. But this guy irritated me to no end whenever I read a Spider-Man comic that featured him as the villain. He was the first ever villain I prayed the hero should kill, followed only by the Joker. The web that covered my hand melted after which I just strolled towards the goblin, ignoring the young hero shouting my name behind my back. I don't know how the spider sense works, but it probably alerted Peter of my next action as the boy sprung into action and tired to stop me only for him to find himself buried inside a wall. Despite his shouts, I reached Norman Osborn and just tapped twice on his chest rupturing his heart and ending the goblin with a peaceful death he definitely didn't deserve. Why did you do that? Why did you kill him? Peter screamed with tears running down his eyes which clued me in that he already knew the identity of the goblin. I wanted to say something at that moment, maybe something to console him. But when I remembered the number of people this guy has killed in just the past year, since he's been active just sucked every sympathy I had towards him. This is not a child's game Peter Parker. With those words, I left the building with no camera catching my features. Even the people I saved will find it hard to correctly remember how I look. I could feel Peter's agony, but I wasn't going to entertain it. He knew who Norman was, the type of freak his so-called best friend father was, and he resolved himself to only go after him as Spider-Man. The kid was one of the smartest people in this world, and he still didn't put that smart to good use, except when it came to being Spider-Man. All is good and well, but unfortunately for a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, the world is as black as it can be. Responsibility and self-interest sometimes get superimposed the deeper you go into this murky waters called heroics. Taking care of the Green Goblin for me was something I deemed important. I don't think any villain rightfully deserved to be truly hated as much as the Goblin did. Even when he was within the pages of a book, he gave me the most disgusting feeling I've ever gotten from a comic panel. To be honest, Peter actually needs to thank me instead of looking at me with a rage-filled gaze. I just saved him from a lifetime of torment. I don't know if he actually knew of the secret identity of the Goblin. Or if he suspected it, it didn't matter. What mattered was that he had the power but kept pulling his punches when he shouldn't. I don't believe in killing everyone you come across that classifies as a villain. It all depends on the kind of impact they have on the world around them. The actions of some people are just unjustifiable, and it's better for everyone if those people are retired permanently, in the ground most preferably. This will remain one of the reasons why my favorite groups in this universe will always be the Avengers. When it really calls for it, they are reliable in getting the job done. Half of the reason why the X-Men side of this universe suffered the way they did, and for how long they did was that most times, especially for those villains classified as mid-level threat, was because they had the brilliant idea of locking them behind bars when they should have killed them when they had the chance, at least those that had the tendency of always choosing chaos and destruction. It's a no-brainer that high-level threats rarely happens, and while the low-level ones are always rampant on a daily basis, it's the mid-level ones that truly cause all the chaos, or at least a good solid 80% of it. And that was exactly where the Goblin was categorized. While Peter Parker does truly embody the ideals and aspect of a true hero, it was also because of that reason that he greatly suffered and by extension a part of his city too. You really think anyone, maybe apart from J.J. Jamison, would blame Spider-Man for killing Goblin? I don't hate Peter for what he did or what he didn't do. On the contrary, I had a certain level of respect for his character. But that doesn't mean I have to stand by and let it all come to shit, especially when it concerns one of my most hated characters in fiction. Right now I was just floating above the clouds watching the city below me move on at its own pace. I tried spreading my senses through every piece of technology around 5 kilometers from my focal point, and the amount of crimes that was happening at every second of the day in this city was mind-boggling. Armed robbery, breaking and entering, rape, drug deals, assassination and all sorts of criminal activities were rampant as my mind went through all the information feedback in seconds. What is the best way to end crime and evil in every sense of the word? The best course of action would be evolution. Darwin's speculation of survival of the fittest is the most perfect theory to ensure the actualization of any goal you might have though. It should be considered that not everyone classifies for this method and if forcefully carried out. The percentage of people who will successfully pass it will be less than 10% worldwide and what exact method is that? Global genocide, I didn't even twitch a single brow at that. 
since this was something I once considered when running one of my logical reasoning. What phase of the Ultron protocols is that? Alternative phase 1 Ultron protocols alternate, huh? That's definitely not an alternative I'll be using any time in any foreseeable future. I looked down once more at the city that was steadily creeping towards the late hours of the day, and yet it was still bustling, never dying down. I felt a presence incoming and turned to look at it. And what I saw was a familiar red hue that clued me in on who was coming my way without me probing. Wanda. I called out to her as she came near me, flying a few meters away from me with her red aura covering her body. What's up, this? Having a serene night out. She was dressed quite modestly in a white turtleneck sweater and dark blue jean trousers, and a pair of grey coloured sneakers with an overcoat to top it off and also protect herself against the cold winds of this evening. I'm thinking of picking up a hobby, maybe one I can do at night. I said lightly after acknowledging her presence. You look dressed for a stroll, a night's out for you. She chuckled in amusement as I created a park bench for us to sit on which was me basically creating a telekinetic platform and a little light manipulation to make it look like a bench. We both sat in the sky and overlooked the city below us, while having light conversations which were mostly centered around my need for a hobby. Well, since I don't actually have a need for sleep, I thought it'll be more efficient to do something productive with that time. I told her, one thing I liked about Wanda was that she was quick to understand something, or at least relates to it without ever having experienced it. Unlike the others, she's only ever thought of me as a different kind of human ever since my BIRTH or is it rebirth. So got any ideas? She asked after listening to me tentatively. She shrugged as I gave a subtle look, which apparently wasn't so subtle, given that she caught it. I don't do much during the day, except maybe if we have a mission. So if you ever want company or maybe someone to help you pick a preference, the last part remained unsaid by I knew what she was offering. It might have been because of me, but she was more vibrant and outgoing than what I had pictured she would have been like during her earlier days at the Avengers. I see, do you think I'll need a third-party opinion? I teased her while inwardly grimacing at the rising number of underway crimes happening, as the night got progressively darker. Wanda swung her legs while looking below at the clouds floating around us, with the faintest smidgen of a blush dusting her cheeks. Hum, I don't think so. She said before looking at me as she tucked some strands of her billowing hair behind her ear. It'll just be the two of us. I left what was unsaid, unsaid, and drew back my focus to the city below, a gesture Wanda caught. Anything catches your attention? She asked to which I nodded. I stood up from the bench and turned to Wanda with a smile on my face. I'll take you up on your offer, but before that, how would you like to help me clean up a bit? She shrugged as she caught my meaning and got up from the bench, and dusted herself in a reflex action. Since the night is still young, why not? She said before abruptly dropping herself in a free fall towards the ground at neck breaking speeds. Pull up my ability sheet. Order confirmed flight molecular deconstruction phasing energy projection, energy absorption psychic interference immunity, technopathy density manipulation electromagnetic manipulation hard light man ipul ation subset telekinesis telepathy shape shifting. Quantum shifting form shift it was pretty extensive and when looked at it from an objective standpoint, it wasn't hard to see that I was one hell of an overpowered Jude, with a good number of Omega level abilities under my belt. Might as well put it to good use. Since I had nothing to do, I dropped into a free fall, following Wanda's footstep, but added a small boost to my descent in order to catch up to her. Let's fucking go, Dirk. A group of people ran through an underground parking lot with ski masks and duffel bags. A series of gunshots could be heard from the floor above, followed by gnarly screams before they died down, sending chills down the heart of the five armed men that were running towards their getaway car. What about Trell and Killy? Are we just going to leave them there dash? One of them shouted as he got in the back seat and pulled his gun out the window to aim at anything coming from their back as they kicked their escape into motion. Forget it. That. Which she's already got them by now. You're not hearing the screams anymore, are you? They gone already. The driver shouted with evident fear in his voice as he pressed hard on the gas, taking them away from the death zone. They just escaped as far and fast as he possibly could. As they drove in silence, one of them realized a fact that they were all forgetting, and couldn't help but say it out loud. What of the other guy? What guy? The guy with the witch. The one with the glowing gem in his head. A wave of silence enveloped the car as it drove only for a light-hearted chuckle to interrupt it. 
But for the passengers of the car, it was nothing more than a death sentence. I I I G got a family, man, please. The driver slowed down the car until it came to a gradual halt, the view in front of him sending despair to his deepest heart. The police station, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything to you. The voice said in a weirdly reassuring tone, can't say the same for your other accomplices though. The police station were immediately in alert when an unidentified car parked in their lot and extremely armed individuals came out with bags and guns. But they were in for the weirdest surprise, when their supposed attackers immediately surrendered their guns and the money they stole, even begging them to send them to jail with tears on their faces. Some even grabbed the legs of the policemen who apprehended them, and made them promise that they'll get a prison sentence. For the entirety of that night, the NYPD were faced with the weirdest apprehension in the history of its formation. No, Edward Buckman shouted and flipped over the imported Italian table in his office, as he saw the news of Norman Osborne's death for the first time. He dug his hands into his inner pockets, and brought out a small phone, and dialed a number, while he waited for the other side to pick up the call with bated breaths. The call was picked up after a few rings, and silence flowed in between the lines for a few seconds, before a fluent and rich voice came through. Edward, I wonder what's so important that you had to call me before 9am. Though the words sounded polite, Edward Buckman could hear the unveiled sarcasm and mockery. That was laced in every punctuated word. He snarled into the call, obviously not in the mood for light banter. Keep your pity to yourself, sure. I need your help. The words came out through gritted teeth, but he knew that he had to do this. Why? Of course. What can I do to help? Though the both of them could be said to be on friendly terms, the nature of their business left much to be desired. When it came to interpersonal relationships, Norman was to accept the invitation to the inner circle on the event that he was successful in his research and yet yet. I see he not only perfected it, but got drunk on power and decided to dress up as a Halloween monster and kill people in droves. Yes, yes, quite an astonishing reveal if I do say so myself, but I failed to see where you are going with this. Shaw said over the phone, though he knew where Edward Buckman was going with this, something the latter knew too, but he knew Shaw just wanted to hear him say it. And he did. I was a major backer of Norman's research on the Super Soldier Serum, and since he perfected it, I want everything he has on it. He then said his request. The reason he called Shaw out of everyone in the circle, was that Shaw was the most reliable of everyone he knew. The man had a talent for getting what he wanted done in the most efficient way possible. But nothing was without a price. I'll see what I can do, and in return, how about you fill me in on this project? Armageddon. Huh. I hear it's a game breaker. And this was exactly the reason why asking Sebastian Shaw for any kind of favor was a wrong move. He was like a devil, privy to your deepest secrets. And all he needs to do is wait for you to make a slip up for him to swerve down and take a bite. Taking a deep breath in order not to lose his emotions again in earshot of Shaw, Buckman made another request to tally up Shaw's payment. I see. If you can, help me find out who wrecked Ross's base and my research facility. He said nothing and cut the call, and then deposited his wealthy behind atop a couch. His mind couldn't help but go back to a call he received a few days ago. Maybe he was up to something. Who knew? Training Ground D6 Avengers Compound Banner. Sarah and Vision were overseeing the training of the new intakes, with Banner and Sarah compiling data on the mutate additions, while Vision was focused on the older members going through a workout session. Are you sure he'll be able to phase? Banner asked with doubt as he saw Petro vibrating his hand, and trying to get it to move through a six-inch thick block. Without turning to face neither Banner nor Petro's failed attempts, Vision gave his reply. While speed is the key, it only accounts for 37% of the process. Banner snorted at that as he pulled up Petro's speed data. Your math is not adding up. True, Vision nodded. But we have proof of a lot of technology vibrating at speeds they can't move at. His cells just need to get the reverberation momentum, and from then on it'll be easy. Petro was still yet to vibrate through any since the first day Vision brought it up, but the boy never stopped trying. On the other hand, Wanda was going at it with the grey spiked hulking form of Davis, who was trying his very best to pulverize the Bukes and Beauty into a fine meat paste, but Wanda was doing her best to avoid any close contact with him. A smart decision on her part. On the other side of the training ground was Steve and Natasha sparring against each other, while having wistful smiles on their faces, as their side eye registered all the impressive display of the rest of the team. Looking at it like this really does drive it all home, right? Natasha said with a smile before abruptly driving a kick to Steve's ankles as he tried to answer. 
Steve dodged the kick by lifting his leg up without a change in expression as it was something he completely expected from Natasha. Steve only shook his head and replied, It's better this way. The world got a lot stranger since Loki ripped open a hole in the sky. Just being special isn't going to cut it anymore. And besides, he leisurely blocked her kick with both his arms locked together and grabbed it as she tried taking it back and used his vastly superior strength to flip her over his shoulders to the ground. We need all the help we can get. He said before lending her a hand to raise her up, which ended up being a bad idea as Natasha used that opportunity to drag him down and wrap her legs around his head and poured his hands in a submission hold which Steve quickly succumbed to, as he tapped her leg for release. Steve sighed exasperatedly as he saw a smile on Natasha's face, as she basically stole his win away from him. He looked at the last session of the training hall which featured Sam Wilson teaching Laura the basics of close quarters combat. No, 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 no claws. Sam chided the young girl who looked annoyingly frustrated, as she was unable to land a good hit on him. The only rules Vision had laid down for their fight, was that she wouldn't use her claws, a simple handicap which only turned out a hundred times worse than she had expected. She took a deep breath in and rushed at Sam again, only to have the hand she threw slapped away. But this time she used the momentum caused by her loss of balance, and jumped with a spin, and tried driving her legs from a high vantage point to the side of his head, which the veteran special agent ducked under cleanly. A nice follow-up, but it's still easily interrupted. Remember, no hit is a strike until it connects. Sam advised Laura who was listening with rapt attention and utmost seriousness. Her admittance into the team was still in probation, as none of the older members were comfortable allowing a child into their battle, regardless of his or her battle advantage to the team. Neither Steve nor Natasha were going to allow it had it not been the girl herself saying she wanted this. I want to kill all the bad guys. Those were her words of defense after being asked why she wanted to fight. Steve had hesitated, but he finally relented on the matter when Vision had said he'll look after the girl and supervise her training. Yes, that's it. Sam said in an approving smile as he saw the effort and visible changes the girl was making as time went on. Put more force into your strike, and since you have a small stature, you'll need to know how to leverage your height to anybody you're fighting. Vision watched as the hall quickly erupted in a cacophony of booms and shouts as everyone got invested in what they were doing. He rarely had anything to do since most of his abilities could be learned by him just running calculations and speculations about their applications. Speaking of testing out abilities, he had some too in fact, that needed field testing. Quantum shifting and form shift. The first appeared after he had incorporated the pim particles into his own body, and had also manipulated a part of his flesh to turn into a sack, that produces the required components of said particles, in case he ever wanted it out of his body. The other had appeared after he had taken the Hulk serum, and it was something he's never had the chance to check out once. Even though he had the quantum shifting, he had never tried shrinking down to subatomic, since he was yet to devise a way to safely navigate through the quantum realm, and wouldn't want to risk being stuck there for decades because of a slight miscalculation. One thing he had realized after his little incident was that after he had off Norman Osborn, a lot of notable characters started making subtle appearances, and a few handful of them were of the notorious ilk. But Vision already had a few plans for some, and was just waiting for his turn to make some splashes. Vision POV ever since that day, Wanda and I made it a joint pastime of ours to visit the criminal underbelly of the city at night and serve justice. Honestly, it was just a way for us to have something fun doing in the meantime while also killing crime. Efficient. It was also funny how Wanda was quick to get a moniker after just one night out. The criminals called her the witch, a name which wasn't that far off from what she actually was. As for me, I was just known as the guy who followed the witch the man. A very basic name if I were to give my honest opinion. Not that I cared that much for it. That aside, the reaction of the team when I told them I had killed the goblin was lackluster to say the least. Sure the man was worth a few billions, but at the end of the day he got consumed with his greed for power, and became one of the most hated people in present time. Some part of me wondered how Harry would take it. How would his life be? But then I'm reminded that what happens is no longer under my control. Quite hypocritical some might say, but it's the truth. What am I to do? Make him an Avenger? Hell no. If he goes down the same path his father took, I'll be the same one to reunite him with his dad. Vision, I need your help. Natasha called me over with those words, so I left what I was doing which was joining Banner and Sarah and turned Davis into our guinea pig, and went for Natasha. I met her in what was quickly becoming our conference room going through a few data snippets. You require my assistance. She rolled her eyes at the way I spoke, 
but it wasn't as if I was doing it intentionally. Sometimes the way I speak goes back and forth between sophisticated and casual speech. There's over a ton of data here, and I was wondering if you could just simplify it for me. At least she had the decency to look a little embarrassed by her request. I sighed and waved my hand over the holograms, copying, downloading and perusing through everything there in a split second. You know I'm not some convenient everything made easy guide, right? Don't be such a sourpuss about it. And I won't tell anyone you and Wanda have been sneaking out at night for a little rendezvous. She said with a sly smirk on her face, as she leaned against the wide oval table, that also functioned as a holo projector. I sighed, fully aware of her penchant for teasing. It also didn't help that she was very well aware of what we did at night time, both Wanda and I. I sighed in defeat, fully knowing it would be mine, if I decided to be headstrong against her teasing, and brought her attention back to the matter at hand. Norman's case. Hum. She nodded. But it's not the only thing. At least I think so. I was able to pick out a few things and with it, interesting. It's no surprise Ross had a hand in Osborne's pie. But it seems that both of them had a familiar benefactor. This was the modern age where a lot of things could be done by proxy. And that was what those at the top did, also conversely the reason why it was hard for me to find the main person behind this. I pulled up the data I had gotten from the facility where Laura was made and turned to Natasha. What can you notice? She looked at the data strings and also the communication lines, and then focused on the nature of the three research, and I could see the light of realization dawning in her eyes. They are all based on the super soldier serum. Norman might have been lacking in his, but it's all human enhancement, not to mention how the other two experiments perfectly complement each other. She said while giving them another perusal and came to the likely conclusion. It's like two parts of a whole. I nodded at her words. That's because it is. Though different, the success of one will directly facilitate the success of the other. I guess we found our missing link. But what is the link? That is a lot easier to find now that we have a solid trail. It's virtually impossible to fully hide one's actions in today's age. This will take some computing time. But I'm sure I'll be able to pick up who's really behind all this. I have a list of a number of bad guys who perfectly fit the memo. But due to the incongruity of this timeline, and also my lacking knowledge of everything Marvel, I have no other choice except going the long way. Natasha looked at me with curiosity and asked, And how are you going to find the trail? It's funny how she thinks I'm going to find the trail, but I'm not going to question it. I now that I think about it, how about I just make someone work for it? I think I know just someone who will be more than happy to help us sniff out the trail. Bavel High School being bored for too long can make someone make a not-so-smart decision that they never would have made all things considered. And that also stands for the man with the largest thought processing power this side of the galaxy has very seen me. Walking through the empty halls of Bavel High alongside me was Wanda and Petro. The reason I declined Laura's request to follow me wasn't because I didn't want to but because of the telepath in this school, Jean Grey. I don't want the accidental scenario where she picks up on any of her thoughts. Since the little girl has been made aware of who her unintentionally biological father was, and by extension the group he worked with. Wanda and Petro were pretty much immune to mind reading at her level, unless something out of script happens, and she goes full flame on. That's also not counting the fact that I'm here. Knocking on the door of Principal Darkholm. We waited for a few seconds before getting the affirmation to come in. We have manners and shit after all. Raven's face when she saw us was completely hilarious. And I had the feeling that if she didn't already know a little about what I could do, she would have already gotten into a fighting stance or made a flight decision. Am I being apprehended? She asked with such a calm voice that actually impressed me because I knew she wasn't faking it in the slightest. This only made me remember the kind of life she's lived through the century. I chuckled as I took the seat in front of her while Wanda and Petro stood behind me. No such thing. I assure you, Ms. Raven, or do you prefer Mystique? I asked with the same composed tone that she regarded our presence with. I was dressed in a black blazer suit with a grey shirt underneath, coupled with a pair of fine-cut trousers and shoes to match. Petro dressed the same way but with a white shirt instead, while Wanda went for a dark red shirt with black blood splatter design and jean trousers. Overall, we looked business. Something I probably picked up from Stark's configuration of the Jarvis Matrix. Raven shook her head, Raven is fine, she said, and then gave Wanda and Petro a scan, before finally locking her gaze with mine and continued. Forgive me for asking, but if you're not here to apprehend me, then why are you here? I started. I believe we have conflicting interests. She snorted with derision at my words and replied, and I thought the heroes don't do business with the villains. And that's the reason why they fight all the time. It's my belief that understanding should first be reached by any confronting groups. 
and only when they can't reach that should it dissolve into a fight. I remarked, and I believe there's a chance for understanding between us which entirely depends on you. I added, that seemed to have gotten her hooked as I could practically feel her rising interest despite the unchanged genial smile on her face. Ho, oh, then pray tell what this conflicting interest is. Like you said, it'll be best if we can come to an understanding. She said and leaned forward ever so slightly, a casual motion, but also one that made her cloth naturally tighten against her body and made the outline of her luscious body very visible. Damn, she's good. Unfortunately, there's no way something like this can ever work against me. I mean, I live literally next door to the Black Widow. As if not noticing her very natural actions, I nodded with my most prominent graceful smile. Very well then. I snapped my hands and the windows in the room closed and the curtains rolled over, blocking any outward source of light. The lights dimmed, and before Raven could panic, everything went alit with holographic images. How would you like to help me help you, Ms. Raven? Now why did I meet Raven of all people, in order to draw out the mastermind behind the illegal experiments, when I could spend the better part of the day, and get it done? You could either say it was me satisfying my vanity or me just being nice and trying to make someone matter. Whatever it was, the fact of the matter was that this is all but a little experiment for me. I'm not some super mega mastermind or hidden boss. I just make things up as I go, and besides, it's not as if she, Raven, was some sort of irredeemable villain. Not that I'm defending her or anything. What's all this? Raven asked as she stood up from her chair to get a closer look of what was spread across the room. I still don't know why we need her help. Wanda whispered to my ears as Raven appeared transfixed to what she was looking at alternated documents by me. That only gave the tiniest bits of what was really important. In other words, a bait. It's called resourcing Wanda. She scoffed at my words, not giving it too much consideration. Raven turned to me and asked, What do you want from me by showing me this? An in. I know you can find out who specifically is behind all this. And when you do, I'll help you take them out. Help me take them out. Why do you presume I'd want them dead or even meddle with them? She asked with no small amount of skepticism. Because you want the power that comes with their elimination. I know a little bit about you, Ms. Raven. And like every man of ambition, you desire power, real power. And that's what this gives you. I said. She scoffed. But I could tell she was taking my words with deep consideration. And what do you really want apart from having someone in such a position? I just shrugged nonchalantly at her question. Not glossing over the obvious fact that it'll prove tremendous help towards your goals, it'll help me regulate some bad elements more carefully. That doesn't sound too heroic. She remarked earning a chuckle from Petro, who had been out of character since we arrived. I too waved off her words, since it's not as if I'm doing anything bad or shady. What I was doing was bound to benefit her more than it'll ever benefit me. And not to sound overly confident or arrogant, but the chances of her not accepting were very slim. After all, who in their right mind will deny a golden chance to become a part of the Hellfire Club's inner circle? And what if I betray you? She suddenly asked out of the blue. I snorted at such a poor insinuation from someone I consider smart. I think you're mistaken about something, Ms. Raven. I am not in any way going to condone any illegal activities or acts of terrorism from you or any of your future associates. This proposition of mine is purely to ensure a brighter future. One of the best things about having unlimited access to the internet is having access to most books, besides an unending stream of motivational quotes, is the freedom to learn up on a lot of subjects. Even obscure ones like Sun Tzu's Art of War or even basic psychological ones. Just being scientifically intelligent wasn't going to cut it against normal people, let alone the special types. So, I knew just how to catch slippery people like Raven off guard. While I don't know the current nature of your relationship with Magneto, it will be very easy for me to find out. Don't be mistaken by thinking you'll be working for me, Ms. Raven. The only thing I will require of you at the beginning is information and maybe access. But apart from that all the consequences of your action will be entirely upon you. And as the one who helped put you there, I will personally take it upon myself to stop you. The reason why I chose to speak with Raven about this other than the fact that I knew of her relationship with the club, was that she was one of the morally grey characters I was comfortable with being in such a position of power. Quite a fun fact, but the majority of the women characters in Marvel were very dependable people, when the skewed relationship shenanigans of the writers weren't being it in the picture. And also, like I told her, I wasn't really interested in taking over the Hellfire Club. I'd rather get a few people I can rely on in there and let them do their thing, a mutual relationship so to speak. And besides, I know that currently Raven is still trying to make the world view the mutant race in a positive light. 
So yes, manipulation, which I don't think is bad as long as everyone is benefiting. She didn't reply to words but asked a question. Was the girl with you the last time involved in the experiments? What girl? I said with a smile that didn't quite look genuine. I could also feel the slight turbulence behind me and the unmistakable eerie feeling of Wanda's aura leaking out. Raven nodded in understanding and smartly changed her words. Can you give me a few days to decide? I nodded. Well, she wasn't outright refusing, so it's all good in my books. It's not as if she's an integral part of my plan in dealing with the club. I just don't want to see such influential power go to waste without being put to efficiently good use. I got up from my chair and extended my hand to her for a shake, which she took with a deadpan staring directly back at me. While I held my smile, I've taken the liberty to put my communication line directly in your phone. Don't worry, it can't be traced. I said, hope to hear from you soon, Ms. Raven. We left her office, and I could practically feel the burning curiosity from my two companions, which made me roll my eyes. Wanda was able to keep it to herself, but Petro showed no regard for that. We're cooperating with bad guys now. He asked however I shook my head. It's a little complicated, but everything is not always black and white. But she's part of Magneto's people, right? He asked again, but this time instead of answering, I replied to him with a question instead. And you both once worked with Ultron to destroy the Avengers. Does that make you villains by default? Fuck. Yes. I nodded. It truly is a fucked up world we live in. We made a turn at a corner, but somebody bumped into Wanda. And as she tried touching the person who bumped into her and Reflex, I stopped her hand from going any further and girl from falling with my telekinesis. The girl looked shocked and was almost about to panic, but sighed in relief when she saw that the person she bumped into was fine. I'm sorry. I was a little bit zoned out so I didn't see you. She apologized, but Wanda waved it off as nothing with a smile on her face, while at the same time giving me a questioning eye, since she felt my influence controlling her for a moment. She's a mutant and quite a complicated one at that. I spoke to her through my mind while giving Anna Marie, also known as Rogue, a last look before continuing on my way. How so? She can't control her powers for shit, and it would have been bad for you had both of you made skin contact. I gave a little overview of Rogue's situation to her as he got into a car and left. After Vision left, Rogue made her way to the cafeteria where she quickly located the normal group she usually ate, with which usually consisted of Kurt, Kitty, Scott and Lance. Since the bell just rang, the cafeteria was quickly becoming flooded, and by the time she made her way to their table, she found a new face that usually didn't sit with them Jean. She looked at the others and noticed that they all wore pensive expressions on their faces. What's wrong? Well, Jean here thinks something weird is happening in the school. Kitty said while prodding Jean. It's not that I think but something really happened. I don't know how or why, but for more than half of the last period, something happened to my ability. Jean argued. Lance frowned as he heard Jean's argument. What do you mean? It felt as if my senses were being suppressed. All the voices that usually filter around in the background all disappeared. It, it's like my telepathic abilities were gone. Jean said frantically, clearly overwhelmed by what she experienced. Are you still feeling it? Rogue asked, breaking her silence. Jean looked at Rogue and shook her head. No. It started decreasing as soon as the bell rang. And I no longer feel it now. Ah. She didn't know why. But she suddenly remembered the group of three she had bumped into on her way here. But kept silent since she didn't know whether they were in any way related to Jean's psychic episode. We need to tell the professor, Scott finally said. Raven Duck on POV Raven heaved a sigh of relief as she peeked at the three strangers who just came to her office, leaving the school premises in their car. What the hell is happening? It did not take a genius to figure out why Raven had been quite stressed for the past few days, with everything that had been happening in the mutant scene, and now she was being offered a deal by a robot. In her own opinion though, he didn't feel the least bit like a machine. She groaned as she opened her laptop and saw the notification of a folder downloaded to her drive, already aware of who exactly had done it. The files detailed the specifics of the people she was to gather information on and also the nature of the request Vision asked for. Why was she thinking along those lines as if she's already accepted? The reasons for accepting were very few. And besides, what Vision needed from her was pretty simple as she knew someone inside the club who could get her the information she needed. Logically, there was no way Vision could help her join the inner circle, as any inclusion to it was done through a vote of the members. But even with that, all she needed was to show them her value and influence, both of which she had in spades. This is going to get me killed. She let out another groan. Oh, she contemplated reaching out to Eric. But despite how much she respected the man, 
feared even, she reluctantly had to admit that he was a little over the top in his ways. His vision was as great as any leader's could be. But it tended to grow a tad bit extreme, and after over four decades of being together and helping the other further their goals, everything started growing stale. So, at the end of it all, she decided against it. Besides, it's been over four years since they last talked. Looks like it's time I cash out my return favor. Even though she hated the nature of this shady deal with a passion, she couldn't deny the benefits it presented to her, even more with the information she now had. She had a lot to think about, even though her decision was already set. Did she trust Vision? She's mystique for crying out loud. The last thing she would do is trust a man she hasn't even known for more than a decade. All that was needed, most importantly, was to find a way to secure her safety. In case this is all a bust. And how better to do that than siding with the very people she wanted to overthrow. Her phone rang and she waited patiently for a few couple seconds before the call was picked. And a soft, clearly effeminate voice came out of the speakers. Raven, long time no see. Well, I've been busy running a school. You know how it goes, right? She said with a smile tugging in her lips. I don't. So, why call now? Seeing as how the other party was clearly not in the mood for making small talks, she sighed and got straight to the point. I think we need to meet Emma. Vision POV the drive back to the compound was filled with Wanda and Petro, asking me questions about what I was planning, and why I needed someone like Mystique to infiltrate the club. Like I said before, I don't want to take control over the Hellfire Club if I can help it. But instead what I wanted was to have access to what the club provides. I already have the Avengers and that was enough for me. Not to also mention that having the club under the scrutiny of the Avengers will make it embarrassingly less efficient than if I let it function on its own. Good and bad. Balanced, just as all things should be. So you trust her? Petro asked, which earned him an unamused glare from me. She's been working with Eric the world's number one mutant terrorist for almost twice the years both of you have been alive. At least be a little smart, will you? This time it was Wanda who asked. So she's going to double-cross you? Hum, not outright, but she probably will. Vision said in a voice as if he was teaching them about important things, which he actually was. She's been hiding from the government for as long as she's been alive, so that means she's not one to buckle down under pressure. People like her only work for benefit, and that's what I'm counting on. Petro became even more confused. Wait, wait, wait. So you want her to betray you? I chuckled at that. Psychology really was a complicated field. I don't want her to betray me but I'm counting on the fact that she could. She knows that so she'll be extra careful in the event that she does, which inversely means that the other party is offering more than I did, which is also what I want. So, either way you win. Wanda asks, it's nothing that arrogant but, yeah. I nodded. What do you even need from this Hellfire Club? If they are not good people, why can't we just take them down? I understood Wanda's question, but there was a balance to these things. You won't really know why until you delve in really deep. A simple fact of life was that crime was necessary in every society. Well, more than necessary, it was actually inevitable. I'm not advocating for anything they are doing, since I'll sooner or later end them. But what I'm trying to say is that they keep a good lid on things to prevent them from going out of their control. It's also the same with drug lords. If they weren't manipulating the flow of drugs and building their own cartel and traffic routes, every two-bit thug out there will be selling drugs, and everything will turn to chaos. It was for that reason that I wanted Raven there. If I had any other viable choice, then it would have been Jean Grey or any of the X-Men who later joined the club. But unfortunately I was not in those timelines, which meant I had to go with the options open to me. You've ever heard those theories about the secret societies of elites who run the world? They both nodded. Well, you could say this is one of them, and not just any simple club either. They really have a great deal of pull in today's world, in both the human and mutant side. I then explained how having access to the Hellfire Club will prove immensely useful to the Avengers, or anyone affiliated with us for that matter in preventing some useless conflicts, especially on the mutant side. Tony Stark POV boss, Vision sent his update on nanotechnology. Would you like to see it right away? Well, would you look at that? Barely a year old and he's already aiming to take over his old man. They grow up so fast, don't they? I don't believe he will like you calling him your child. He seems to hate the notion of it himself. Oh, come on. I patented Jarvis, so I should have at least a 35% right on staking parenthood on Vision. I'll be sure to remind Miss Potts of your exact words. Is this the day AI starts taking over the world? Am I the one who will bring the fabled rise of the machines? I pulled up the schematics that Vision sent over, and couldn't help but let out a whistle, as I saw the detailed outlines on his work in respect to how easily the molecules of vibranium could become so tightly compressed, 
that it could even change their shape seamlessly. It appears he's not just going around in circles. I don't know why but something tells me he's already cracked it. I murmured. I can care. But why would he send an unfinished update? Did he specifically say it was the update for Nanotechnology? technology? Or did he just send it under that? I enlarged the molecular design and vision's own changes to its energy conversion. Under the tag. Then he doesn't need me to crack nanotech, since he's already done so. Ah, that smug little bastard. I gasped with mild irritation as I finally understood what this meant, but still turned to my trusty AI sidekick to verify. Is this what I think it is, Friday? I believe it is, boss. That piece of metal fibers has gone ahead and done it now. It appears I've been too lenient for far too long. Because who in their right mind would otherwise give me, Anthony Stark, a homework? While Vision happily educated the Maximoff twins on the need and importance for subterfuge and psychological warfare when dealing with certain people, the atmosphere in Charles Xavier's office was on the other end of the spectrum. So let me get this straight. Basically, you lost your telepathy in its entirety for over 30 minutes before it gradually came back. Logan asked in narration before turning to Charles. Is that normal? Charles had a pensive frown on his face as he wheeled his chair towards Jean, who looked just as confused as Logan was. No, at least to my knowledge. Jean dear, please try and remember how you felt when it happened. You said you didn't lose your powers right? She nodded. It felt more like they were there but far away at the same time. It was as if all my telepathic abilities were pushed back out of my reach. Jean said, trying to explain exactly what had happened from her point of view. What are the odds, Charles? Hank asked. Charles turned around to face the other people in the room. It could be either one of a very few things. Either she actually lost control of her abilities, which is highly unlikely, since I'm seeing nothing wrong with her on the mental side. Or what? Aurora asked concern clearly visible on her face. Something likely happened in the school. Either something or someone suppressed her telepathy. Is something like that even possible? Lance asked. Yes. It's not easy. But it usually only happens when the victim has a vastly lower level of psychic mastery. In other words, it shouldn't have worked on Jean. Yes, Scott. At least she would have felt the attack coming. The situation was confusing the hell out of Charles. But he didn't know what else to make of it. He's already checked her mental barriers and even the event that happened, so he could say with certainty that whatever it was didn't originate from Jean, but from someone else in the school. Did you see anyone new or suspicious around the school today? Charles asked, but all of them shook their heads. Unfortunately for them, Rogue wasn't here as the gothic girl was busy in her room listening to soft songs as she focused on her assignments. So am I supposed to be not curious after you went to take care of it? Natasha walked into Vision's room where the person in question was just staring into space with little dilations in his eyes. Probably something internal. Well, the target this time is the Hellfire Club, and as much as I'd like to just storm in there and put those bastards behind bars, we unfortunately can't. Vision said. Natasha leaned against the door and squinted her eyes trying to get a red on him. But in the end she just sighed and gave up. Mind telling me why? She said as she grabbed a chair and sat in front of Vision. Firstly, it isn't just a club for the rich and snobbish. Believe it or not, they are strongly tied to the world government, and hardly anything ever happens without them knowing or directly or indirectly having a hand in it. It's a coalition of influence. Hearing all this made Natasha groan as she massaged her head. Don't you think you're moving too fast, Vision? Hey, eh? I mean, it's awesome that you know all this. But you don't have to spearhead at all, you know. I'm really not, though. She only gave him a look that said really. Which made Vision wonder if he really was doing what she said. Well, I guess I can't actually understand since I don't have an infinity stone. Or whatever it is, stuck in my head. But the least you can do is let us help out. She didn't know why nobody ever bothered to tell Vision to slow down. But she knew one day, despite his intelligence, with the speed he was going. It won't be long before he made a fatal error. I know you're strong to handle any situation you come across. But do exercise restraint. Ross, Davis, Laura, Scott, the Goblin, even now with this case, you're trying to solve it all yourself. You didn't even bother when I dumped it all on you. Irrespective of the lesser amount of time she's known some of the newest additions to the team, Natasha cared for all of them. They gave her something she will forever cherish. And she wasn't about to let one of her teammates shoulder everything just because he could. It was what got them into this mess in the first place. Vision on the other hand looked at Natasha stunned as he was speechless to even give a rebuttal. You told Tony that we'd do it together. But that's not what you're doing, is it? Just because you're strong enough to do it with ease doesn't mean you always should. Not when there are people willing to help. That's... Vision tried to speak. 
but nothing escaped his mouth, as the only thing that was surprisingly left in his head was confusion. You know, for such a smart guy you're awfully quiet. Suddenly lost your voice. She said with a teasing smirk. I, I guess you're right. Vision finally said. In my lame defense, I did it subconsciously because dash. Because you probably thought we wouldn't be able to do it as efficiently as you write. With the way Vision visibly flinched, Natasha was sure that she hit the nail directly on the head. Yeah. I've noticed how you love throwing that word around. And while I can perfectly understand the need for efficiency in any mission, sometimes you just have to go in guns blazing. Not everything deserves to be cleanly executed. Vision remained silent as he listened to each of Natasha's words. He knew he was in the wrong, and whether it was due to him subconsciously seeing them as comic characters, hence knew their flaws and strengths, or whether it was his logical reasoning, which probably judged them as less that competently required. It was still a fault of his, and he was going to start rectifying it from now. You're terrifying, Natasha. Anyone ever told you that? He said with a small smile which she reciprocated and shrugged her shoulders coyly. If you think I'm that good, then you've probably never heard it from Clint. I have a feeling you two would have hit it off if he was still active. I see. He nodded and ran a hand through his hair. Thank you, Natasha, for looking out for me and making sure I heard that because I really needed to. She just laughed and waved it off. Think nothing of it. We older ones have to look out for the younger ones, don't we? Vision groaned as there was no way he could rebut that as she was technically older than him. Heck, everybody was. The both of them looked at each other and burst out laughing. So let's hear it. What ridiculousness did you do now that concerns the Hellfire Club? Natasha asked after getting her composure back. After hearing all she had to say, Vision no longer thought of hiding what he was doing and just came clean with Natasha. You know Mystique, I've heard of her. A shape-shifting mutant who is also a trusted subordinate of Magneto. What of her? I gave her a way to get a sitting inside the inner circle of the Hellfire Club now. That I'm saying it out loud for someone knowledgeable to hear? It does sound extremely stupid. Vision, tell me you did not just give one of the most wanted people on the planet access to greater influence and increase their social standing. If it wasn't for her training and experience with weird things happening in today's world, she would have likely thrown a fit after hearing that. Unlike what Natasha was feeling, this time Vision appeared really calm. Don't worry about that. She's already under surveillance. And she just spoke to Emma Frost, CEO of Frost Pharmaceuticals, who is also the White Queen of the Hellfire Club, a few minutes after I left her office. Wait hold on for a moment. Did you go to her office? Like you know who and where she is? Yeah, she's a principal at Bayville High School. And on the off chance that she does contact Magneto, I'll then be able to track Magneto and know where he's hiding. It's a bet I have very little chance of losing. Seeing Vision's confidence and also the competent nature he was known for, Natasha was tempted to believe him based on those alone. But in the end her spy instincts won out. Fill me in, and don't miss out a single detail. She said as she adjusted her position to become more comfortable, while Vision just rolled his eyes, as she looked exactly like a normal girl ready for prime gossip material. Vision POV updating protocols changes based on your actions on the existing timeline have been recorded in logs. As a result, the prediction probability has further lowered. After the much needed eye opener from Natasha, I was quick to realize what I was doing wrong. It wasn't something monumental, but instead something like a subconscious behavior that would later on snowball into bad manners. At least she gave me the heads up early on, and not later down the line, where I would have inevitably classified them as inefficient. Maybe this is how Simon usually feels. Mage M. Who knows? It wouldn't do me anything to be more human, now would it? Natasha's confrontation actually helped me answer a question that had been plaguing me ever since I came to terms that I was Vision. Is it alright for there to be mistakes in my actions? While I do endeavor to have fun here and there and be myself, when it comes to a mission it's like doing something mistakenly shouldn't happen. That is why I make sure it's always cleanly done. If they deserve to die, they die. No second guessing. Maybe I am the one stressing about it too much. Protocols here and there. While I don't doubt their effectiveness maybe at some point it's just better to wing it. Let's just forget about it for now. Right now I was doing my nightly workout of decreasing crimes in New York, which to my constipation was proving inefficient. I wasn't too much bothered with public scrutiny. So I always use my N-O-R-M-A-L human face and since I have no need for concealing my identity, I was already making a name for myself in the criminal underworld. Normally I'd go with Wanda, but I needed this one to safely drown in my thoughts. And it's not as if we always go together. We do that most times. 
But it's not that important, is it? I think the best thing being Vision has ever done for me is finding out how useless money and most human needs really are. Or maybe it's not because of Vision but my point of view. I mean, I can see humanity's darkest and documented history anytime I want, so most things have lost their value to me, which isn't that bad if I might say. Attempts to trace all contacts in Raven Darkholm's connected devices was unsuccessful unknown resistance identified him. That's new. I thought as I saw the notification. It took me less than a second to come to a conclusion about why that was given the evident lack of a digital stamp and IP address even if a fake one, a mutant. A technopath more specifically. Fun facts about technopathy. At least the powerful ones was that the inner world of technology was like their own universe where they can be gods. Some can just hack through things just by touching a computer, while others can enter into the digital world and create their own domain of sorts. I was of the latter category, and even with that finding someone who was my match was, for lack of a more tame word, hard. I could destroy whoever was blocking my access, but doing that would clearly alert the other side, and since I don't need them to be that rattlejet, I refrained from using the Mind Stone to destroy whatever defenses he had created. Put a tag on their digital signature so I can find them anywhere on the internet whenever I'm ready. Order a firm now where was I? Hum, that's right I looked around the underground bunker I was in inside the result of my work which was some dead dealers, some with broken bones and limbs, and some just restrained. Self-generated task progression crime bases wiped out dash 14 100s that's progress if I've ever seen one. Wanda and I first started it out as a game, most likely to her amusement, after earning her moniker of the witch. So I mapped out 10 bases, and we cleaned those up before moving to 50, also cleaning those up. And now we started all over again, with the limit being 100 this time. Incoming call from Natasha Romanoff Natasha. Is that you on the police feeds? She asked. Yeah. Just figured I'd clear my head for a bit. I looked at the bunker and nodded to myself for a job well done. The police were only two minutes out, so I'd better get going. She snorted from her side and continued. So I did a little digging, reached a few of my old day contacts, and turns out that they have been an almost even distribution of alien tech in key spot in America, Europe and Asia. You know I could have just found that out if you'd let me know what you were looking into. I said offhandedly. She sighed over the line and grumbled something incomprehensible. I thought we've already been over this. I'm just saying. I shrugged as I turned invisible and started walking out of the base, since the police had already surrounded it. Just because I don't care about my identity doesn't mean I, in any way, enjoy all the shenanigans that came with an exposed one. Okay, let's do this. How much money do you think Tony has? She suddenly asked out of the blue. Um, give or take 100 billion dollars dollars. Why? I said after running the numbers. Well, you're wrong. Huh. It's closer to 150 billion dollars. How? I mean, I'm currently seeing the numbers. And it was a lot less than what Natasha was telling me. So either she was blatantly lying or I was missing something. Well, as much as most people would like to believe Tony isn't stupid in any way possible. The numbers you're probably seeing, yeah, that's just the accumulation of what everyone thinks he owns. All his semi-public investments and portfolio. There's this thing called proxy which I'm sure you've heard of, and it basically means keeping your names out of certain things and places, even the digital world. He's already made sure that no one can make him broke again. I understood what Natasha was trying to say and remained silent. Whether I liked it or not, the internet could be manipulated in a way that leaves absolutely no trace. So while it's heart-wrenchingly enviable how you can manipulate the internet like putty in your hands, don't forget to build a social network too. Believe it or not, it's much more reliable than you might probably see online. Well, she's speaking facts right there so there's nothing I can say. I remember telling that to Simon all the time. Julie noted, so about the weapons. Well, I did do a good job digging in on my part about the Hellfire Club, and coincidentally, some of their members' stocks in public companies went on during the time frame when the weapons were being newly distributed. She informed me. I was now walking along the streets of New York and thought for a bit before stopping at the library just to pass time doing something mundane. So you think that it's somewhat connected? Stick around rookie, and you'll be surprised how many companies profit off of gang violence and other sorts of illegal activities. I chuckled at the way she phrases the starting of the sentence. 
but said nothing in my defense, and just listened to how she narrated her findings. She once complained about how ignorant all the members of the Avengers were streetwise, so she usually takes on most of the hands-on job. So what's your angle? I asked her as I picked up a book on human anatomy and started glancing through it. Nothing obvious for now. At least till Mystique reaches out any day now. We can also do a little poking here and there and watch who flinches. Well, I'm game. Mate Shem. Now that I think about it, this is a good time to pay the Fantastic Four a visit. I said as the thought crossed my mind. And why is that? She asked in a curiously inquisitive tone. I shrugged. Just because. I heard her snort, and I could practically feel her pressing me for more answers. Why the skepticism? You are someone whose motto is being efficient to a sickening degree and I don't remember you having any vested interest in them, so what gives? If not for the fact that I was in a library, I would burst out laughing at the way she said it. Well, you're not completely wrong there. I'm thinking it wouldn't be so bad to have some type of teleportation station with an interlocutor in space. She remained silent for a few minutes before saying her last words and cut the call. Just don't go overboard. I never do. Whether I was telling her that it myself remained unknown. Leaving the library... I contemplated whether letting my arrival be known beforehand to the team of supers, but decided otherwise, not for any particular reason, but just because. It didn't take me up to a minute to reach the huge building, with the giant four plastered on the sides while flying at average speed. Instead of just entering unannounced, I stopped by the door and made my presence known, which quickly alerted the security bot, printing him to report my identity to its creators. It didn't take long before the Storm siblings came down and let me in with excited looks on their faces. At least it was much more prominent in Johnny's. Hi, sorry for coming unannounced, but I was at a library nearby, so I thought I should just make a pit stop as there was an open invitation. Whoa, check out this dude, sis. Johnny, who was dressed in a smudgy mechanics overalls, exclaimed while checking out the device strapped to his arms. Sue rolled her eyes and coughed a little. Hey Vision, welcome to the Baxter building. I was led in, and the both of them took their time to show me around the place while going forward. How fast do you process data on average? He asked. Quite at an astonishing pace if I do so myself. I simply replied, I was ever evolving and that inclusively counted for my processing speed which increases every day. Johnny wasn't deterred by that and pushed further. So what kind of specs are you running on? Gotta be something Stark specialized right? Johnny. She shouted at him with a rebuke, but the younger boy just waved it off and looked at me excitedly. At least give him some space, would ya? A deep bass voice boomed out, taking the both of them by surprise as Ben Grimm made his appearance. Hey there, I think this is the first time we're meeting. Ben Grimm. I just smiled at him and offered a fist bump, and the huge grin on his rocky face told just how much he appreciated the sentiment. You can just call me Vision. I said to him, gotcha. He said with a nod before asking, any special reason for visiting us? Well, there was an open invitation, and since I have nothing of much importance to do today, I thought it'd be better I'd just drop in. I said, and then added offhandedly, that, and also to pick the brains of the resident geniuses here. Haha, <laughs> sounds more like it. He laughed. I observed the dynamics between the three of them, and saw how close they were. I didn't even need to read their emotions to see that. We were about to move in a specific direction when the sound of something exploding caught our attention from the other side of the building. Please don't be a reality warping shenanigan or any alternate reality bullshit. I followed them and came before a room, and saw as Johnny and Sue powered themselves up with the former catching on fire, while the latter had an invisible energy field around her hands. Me. I just stood behind them and waited for Ben to blast through the doors, and when he did the other two rushed in. The room which looked like a very sophisticated workshop, was currently filled with smoke which I easily dispersed only to be met with a scene of Reed Richards, entangled around strange looking robots, that I was pretty sure were trying to kill him, if the readings I was getting off from them contained any bite of truth. Reed, the hell man, again stretch. No questions were asked as the team pummeled their way through two robots, with Johnny having the most problems, as he was literally the man on fire. So it was hard for the mobility and space his abilities required. System override initiated a robot was wielding what looked like a saw, and was about to turn Mr. Fantastic Unit Mr. Spaghetti. Foreign systems override initiation completed engaging forceful shutdown. The room fell silent as all the robots powered down, and that was where I finally got to know what was really going on. Basically from what I was seeing from the robots and my own assumptions, Reed was probably trying to make his own version of me. It wasn't anything close to what I used to be. But I could see the blueprint of it. At least it's not an alien invasion, right? 
I mean there was a lot that could go wrong, and it's just pure luck that Reed wasn't trying something eerily ominous when I got here. Thank you for the save. That was quite the pickle. He said after making sure that all the robots were completely shut down. It's nothing. Though there is something I want to ask. I said after we all got seated with me facing the four of them in a makeshift living room. Ask away. What are your thoughts on spatial displacement? I asked straightforwardly. Teleportation. Johnny asks. But Reed only shook his head. Though they both have indiscernible similarities, it's the advanced fundamentals that makes it different. The obsessive scientist corrected. He then looked at me with surprise and interest as he most likely wasn't expecting such a question. Are you specifically talking about teleportation or space manipulation in general? Everything in and under. Surprisingly the one who first answered was Sue as opposed to Johnny and Reed. It's quite the complicated subject since there was once a theory in the 1950s about how every part of space is mapped and possesses a spatial point, and if one could access those spatial points. It could either directly teleport them or open a portal between the distances connected with that point. And now that I think about it, that theory has already been proven with what happened in New York. Reed then added to what Sue had said. It becomes overly complicated when trying to identify the spatial points. Personally, I believe the key to this query lies in quantum energy. If it is true that time and space are relative to and of the other, then the theorized quantum realm is a domain which is the closest thing to an immaterial world between both planes of existence, and both conventions hold little to no meaning there. Hum, interesting indeed. Reed started going off on a tangent, and I have to say this guy's intelligence really was something. He started theorizing facts about the quantum realm just based off of preconceived notions, and they were actually feasible, at least at 63%, but that wasn't optimistic numbers so it will be shelved until further testing. I ended up picking their brains, and they did mine too, and at the end of it all, I was glad for the Mind Stone, because had it not been for it, I would have been the dumbest person in the room. This also opened up a new route for me to try when it came to my energy deficiency and over-reliance on the Mind Stone. What if I keep it in the quantum realm? but with an almost identical wavelength to present time and place. It should enable me to draw energy from the Mind Stone from anywhere I'm at, possibly even another universe. I guess I won't be building an international space station anytime soon, I guess. Vision, what's your view on mutants and superpowered people? The room turned silent when Ben asked that, but I just smiled and shook my head. It's nothing that great, but I believe they are people too, and hence should be treated as one. Bad is bad and good is good. It's like owning a gun, just because you have it doesn't mean you're a bad person automatically. But you still need a permit for it, right? Read, not forfeiting even a single ground to me or anyone else. Only because it's a tool and it can't be judged. Giving them a publicly special brand is no different than segregating them from the wider society, and what will now be called normal. If they had presented the bill with sincerity and not segregation, then it would have been the mutants who would have supported it more than normal humans. I got up from my chair and was about to leave when I remembered something I should have addressed at the beginning. Those bots. What were you trying to do with them? His shoulders slumped, and I could feel something akin to depression clouding him. Helen Cho beat me to perfecting a seamless biomechanical fusion, but even with that she couldn't address the core of an issue I think you face. And that is, energy deficiency. I don't know what your power source constitutes, but the level of psionic reading I'm getting from you is not something a particular telepath I know can pull off. So I was thinking of upping her and start combined by creating a sentient and self-sustainable robot that runs on a matter slash quantum energy to clean energy conversion. But dash Christ Jude, you want to kill us all, don't you? Ben shouted. Hey, Sue also wasted no time in giving him a dressing down. No offense to you Vision, but I don't think Reed here understands the hassle Stark and Cho went through after your birth. Helen has been sanctioned by the government, and while they still can't hold Stark, he's still careful not to overstep his bounds. And you want to create another killer robot. Reed tried defending himself as the trio ganged on him. I wasn't trying to dash, but Johnny cut him off. Excuse me, you were saying. A bunch of robots were about to turn you into macaroni. They spent the next few minutes admonishing Reed, and also banning him from his lab for one week, which I think killed the man more than anything would have. Sue and Ben walked me out of the building, while the latter apologized for anything she thought I took slight offense to. If you don't mind me asking, why exactly were you thinking of teleportation and quantum travel? Sue asked cautiously. Let's just say it's something that is closely related to the energy deficiency that Reed mentioned. Was all I said before leaving them with a smile on my face. 
This visit surprisingly helped me a lot. Decoding key to successful quantum travel dash 60% 70%. You know I could get killed just for meeting with you this openly, right? Emma Frost lightly said as she twirls the glass in her while addressing the duck-skinned woman sitting in front of her desk. Oh, please, we both know you're just exaggerating. The woman waves off the White Queen's concern, as if they were trivial worries which in turn prompted a chuckle out of Emma. They laughed for a few moments before Emma's face got serious, as she addressed a pressing concern to her. How did you come across such information, Mystique? Mystique, who was disguising as a black American woman, only shifted her face to that of a man that Emma recognized, due to his affiliation to a potentially hazardous group. They call him Vision, right? Emma commented in a light tone. But her mind was already going through a whole slew of what-ifs. Do the Avengers know about the inner dealings of the Hellfire Club? If so, this will be very disastrous for me. One of the powers of those in the inner circle of the club was how easily they blended into the crowd of pigs in the real world. They hardly made the headlines unless it was for something that would positively impact them. Isn't it weird how a robot has such autonomy? Mystique snorted at Emma's words which somehow surprised the latter. But Mystique clarified before she could ask. It's like everyone blatantly forgets that the robot is not just made up of metal. Emma's eyes widened as she understood what Mystique was trying to say. According to the information they were able to peruse from Vision's advent, it was explicitly mentioned that he was part organic and part machine. She wanted to ask more about any information of his personality. Mystique might have gleaned from whatever interaction they had, but waved those thoughts away and focused on what was currently important. Do you have any idea how he came to possess such detailed information? She really wanted to know, and depending on what Mystique said, she would decide on whether to help her on this promising undertaking of hers. What she was stealthily snooping around for was to determine the extent of information vision, and an extension the Avengers had on them. Who really was a step ahead in their war for power? I have no idea. Emma, but I think it's safe to say he's not alone in this. I doubt a group as inwardly volatile as the Avengers would allow someone like Vision to walk around and do whatever he pleases without one of them keeping him within a scope's sights. Not to mention after that stunt he pulled at the hearing. Mystique's reasoning normally would have been on point, but she was entirely wrong because of one thing, and one thing only which flawed her entire perception of who Vision was. The Avengers were all geniuses. Regardless of the disparity between the comparison of each of their individual characters, they all excelled at their specific field, with hardly any rival in sight. And as history has always dictated, geniuses were always the weird ones. I've heard what you are trying to say, but what do you want from me, Mystique? In case I never made it clear from the beginning, I want nothing to do with the Avengers, least of all an antagonistic relationship with them, so unless what you're offering is of monumental value, other than the heads up you've given me, I'm afraid I will have to cut our meeting short. Emma said, reverting back to her business persona that she's created and perfected since her teenage days. No offense love, but it's just business. How would you like having half of the club supporting you? Mystique's words immediately gained her attention. I'm listening. I know you already have some damning information on a few of those in the circle. And all I need is for Vision, or whoever is behind him, to go after one of them. While we use this chance to clean up some space. Um, the two of them smirked and a coalition was set. At the same time that Emma and Mystique were having their secret meeting, Edward Buckman and Sebastian Shaw were having one of theirs. The details, though slightly different in context, were about the same topic. As agreed upon, I did manage to have my people salvage whatever they could from Norman's serum. And now it's time for you to live up your part of the deal. Shaw said while sipping a 30-year-old drink. Edward snorted at Shaw's attempt at the noble comparison of a lone shark. Project Armageddon is something I've been planning towards for years now, even before my admittance into the club. It's all about safeguarding our natural interests as humans against any invading species, for example mutants. Shaw's face betrayed no emotion as he beckoned for Edward to continue. With the emergence of mutants, it won't take long before they filter their way into every industry under the sun, and by then us humans will be relegated to nothing more than defects in their perfect world, until we are killed off and project. Armageddon is the solution to that. How so? While it's still not practical, it's more than halfway there. Despite the dangers, the mutant race brings with them, we can't ignore the treasure they brought also. Edward said with his eyes flickering in excitement for Shaw to ask what he meant. Shaw rolled his eyes but played along for the time being. And what are these treasures? They're genes, Shaw, they're genes. Edward said with a huge smile on his face. Not only the mutants, but mutates also. So far I've gotten the mutagene of the Hulk, and alpha level telepath and a slew of others. But I've not yet cracked how to perfectly fuse all these mutagenes to create the perfect weapon. At least that it was until something happened now Shaw was without a doubt hooked. 
Who knew Edward who lacked any real substance behind his actions was spearheading something as ominous as this without anybody knowing. He had thought Edward only had a fetish for trafficking mutant organs, which was why he regularly kidnapped them. Come on now, old boy, don't keep me in suspense. Shaw joked as he refilled Edward's glass and prompted him to continue which the latter gladly did without the alcohol even prodding him. Helen Cho Cradle successfully fused organic tissue and machines together to form a sentient life form. It was a stroke of brilliance. But I want to push that forward. Instead of just tissues and whatnot, what if I succeed in fusing multiple mutagenes into one, and fusing that with the vessel for my perfect soldier? The more Edward spoke, the colder the chill that went down Shaw's spine became. But he never let the small smile on his face vanish. If I can do this, I will finally have the perfect weapon to erase mutant kind from the face of the earth. It was only then that Shaw realized just how dangerous the man he's known for years now truly was. The hatred he had for mutants was not something natural. But then again so was mutants. Hate couldn't be rationalized most of the time. Sometimes it's just something one grows up with. His thoughts were forcefully snapped short when he heard Edward's following proposal. Do you want to join me? Sure. Unlike the others in the circle, you are the only one I can trust with this kind of information. Hearing the sincerity in Edward's voice, Shaw was almost tempted to forego his plan of killing Edward when he was through with him, and he's outlived every aspect of his usefulness almost. Of course, my friend. While the others might party hard and blow away through every sort of luxury on this planet, at least there's someone I can count on to look at the bigger picture. Shaw said with an impassioned expression, as if lamenting a forgotten regret. To the future, to the future. The both of them clinked their glasses and drank their wine before falling into smaller conversations. To the future, indeed. Vision POV One thing I dearly miss about being human was the refreshing feeling of satisfaction one gets after a good night's sleep. I can't even fall into a deep sleep talk less about taking a peaceful afternoon nap. Any schedule for the day. Generating today's workload since I have nothing of importance to do today. Other than my normal daily routine, I think I should spend it doing a little introspection. While walking out of my room to the kitchen to grab a healthy breakfast, I went through some things I've been putting off for some time now. The Mind Stone can now be safely dislodged be advised. Removing the Mind Stone completely from your influence will drastically hamper the efficiency and functionality of some of your rather extensive abilities what about finding a way to traverse the quantum realm? And, who knows, maybe pocketing a part of it. Collection of data regarding the quantum realm cannot exceed 70% as most of its progression is highly based on theories and might fluctuate lower. Once the veracity has been verified, the most efficient way to increase your knowledge of the quantum realm is to quantum shift. And we're back to that. There's a reason why I still have yet to dive into the quantum realm. And that's because of the innumerable dangers and problems that came with it. I have it on good ground that there are more than enough viruses and other unexplainable phenomena there. That could outright affect or kill me. And while I might just be overreacting, it is better that I have all my bases checked and accounted for before taking a step deeper. Phasing through the kitchen door, I stopped to look at Laura who was sitting on a stool and staring in my direction, waiting for me. Memen, she nodded, seeing I wasn't the only one ready for a morning fix. I immediately went to work with something like pancakes. Mind helping me out. She left her stool and helped me mix the batter while I attended to the toast. And whatever add-ons the others might want. Will I become weaker by just removing the stone from my head? Negative. Though there are factors that will reduce your use of the power of the mind stone, with distance the most prominent of them. This was nice, and all. But I still have yet to come up with an alternative power source. And honestly speaking, there were none. What could be a better power source than an infinity stone? Wait, can the infinity stones work in the quantum realm? It's a probability. Based on information gathered so far, the quantum realm is a nexus point between multiple universes, which means it eclipses most, if not all, universal laws. While it will be severely hampered, it won't be a problem for you to use the power of the Mind Stone to fully power yourself as normal though. It might be impossible to exact influence on the realm itself with the Infinity Stones I see. That takes care of a lot of problems and opens up a lot of avenues for future enhancements. Vision. Hum. I raised my head to look at Laura who was holding a bowl of perfectly mixed batter. I smiled and took it from her and set about making pancakes. With Laura not being a talker and me being an empath, conversation between us flowed smoothly and unspoken, while remaining peaceful and light-hearted. The others joined us for breakfast, those currently around, and since I volunteered for the morning work, I had to make enough for everyone. Petro and Davis, you're coming with me after this. 
I told the both of them and Davis eagerly nodded, already knowing what was in store for him. After breakfast, the both of them followed me to one direction of the large expanses of the land around the compound. Our training is simple. I'll be gauging Davis' mental faculties while putting him through high stress, and as for Petro, you better start moving those limbs of yours. Those words were the only thing they needed as an impetus to get moving. Davis grunted and went on all fours, as he shed the outer layer of his skin, to reveal the huge bulging muscles underneath, with bony spikes growing from different parts of his body. Let's rumble. Enable defensive and counter-attacking protocols against target Petro and Davis. Nah, no need. You sure you want to fight the both of us? Davis's deep growly voice sounded out as he got up from his crouching position. Trust me, there are easier ways to handle my mornings, and this so happens to be one of them. They must have been irked by my words as they forwent all thoughts of probing and came at me, as if I was the one who murdered their dog. Petro rushed at me before Davis could even take a step, and this was where dealing with the speedster became frustratingly annoying. I can't move my limbs as fast as Petro. Since this was just an observatory battle, ending it quickly will serve no beneficial use for what I wanted for the both of them, so I had to figure out a way to keep up with Petro's movements. I charged my body with electricity, and despite what most people might think, that didn't automatically make me fast. Not it did, but it did give me a way to deal with Petro for the time being. A barrier appeared in front of me, narrowly stopping Petro's punch from reaching my head, and the moment where he took to react to the surprise, was all that I needed to use the shield to bounce back all the kinetic energy that was impacted on it in the form of an electric blast. After sending Petro crashing a few meters away, a huge shadow came over me, giving me the only advice I needed to change my position, before Davis crashed into the spot where I once was. How is he? Despite the peak in negative emotions he's currently feeling, all his mental wavelengths points to him still in full control of himself good, then let's switch it up a bit. I ducked under the punch Davis threw, and my eyes actually widened in surprise, as I saw Petro running through the body of the grey behemoth trying to catch me off guard, which he did for an instant. But me seeing there was no way I could react with enough speed to dodge the both of them, went for one of the few options available in this scenario. I sank into the ground, thereby dodging the both of them before turning invisible as I exited the duck ground and flew over Davis, before grabbing his head and slammed it into the ground, shocking them both. Petro tried to move, but I was one step ahead this time around as he found his leg buried under the ground. Davis's growls alerted me to turn around to see the bones around his knuckles and joints, extending outwards by a few centimeters. I'll redact my statement. There are more productive ways to spend the morning. Based on the increasing number of striations bad longer bones in his body, Target Davis seems to feeding off from his frustrations directed towards you though. It's nothing new for a Hulk variant. It doesn't make it less interesting. Petro and Davis were heaving after having survived an onslaught from Vision, and though the both of them were fine physically, it did not mean that they were having an easy time. With Davis's high resistance to any kind of damage, and Petro's healing factor that got faster as his average speed increased, they both were in tip-top shape under Vision's sadistic watch. You know, you both could do a lot, but I think expecting such a display from you is selfish of me, given the time you've had your powers. Vision said while floating a few meters from the ground, Well sorry, we weren't the one who woke up with an infinity stone stuck to our head. The bite in Petro's voice was all too clear and noticeable to anyone listening, letting them know of how little he was amused by their current situation. Damn robot, android or whatever. Davis on the other one was confused after having to deal with the newer and wider range of emotions he had to go through when in his transformation. It felt as if everything was dialed to 100 and it became that increasingly more difficult to control himself to the edge of his sanity. Vision's first thought for their little fight had been to determine the limit of his tolerance and the risk of his presence in an extremely stressful environment. One banner was enough, no one wanted another. You feeling good Davis? Vision probed. Yeah, though the thought of ripping you apart seems progressively appealing. Davis said, feeling a little lost as it was hard to keep track of his real thoughts. Vision laughed as he heard Davis's words. If that's the extent of it, then you're okay. The surroundings around them had been leveled into unnatural heaps of upturned earth. Vision looked around and frowned a bit, but shrugged as their location was a good distance from the compound. How about we go for round two? Petro and Davis tensed as Vision uttered those words, already in optimal position to respond to any perceived attack from the good-looking man in front of them. Vision smiled at the way both of their states changed under a moment's notice, and was resolved to push them a bit harder, this time focusing on the Swifty Speedster, who escaped a good amount of his attacks in their previous bouts. Let's go with a little misdirecty dash back quote. The tense atmosphere suddenly shattered at the sound of a chirping ringtone echoed out from Vision's ears. 
Incoming call from Natasha, way to break the moment, Natasha. You do undash Vision, we have a problem, those words killed any snarky remark. Vision was about to trade with Natasha for her interruption. Natasha, what happened? He could feel the even cold tone she used to cut him off and report what happened which already told him that right now, Natasha was in her Black Widow persona. It's nothing good, that you can be sure of. Cap is rallying everyone, and we are about to take off. We need you back here, ASAP. This time the frown on Vision's face became more prominent, letting both Petro and Davis know that their impromptu training was going to be cut short. Natasha, what happened? Vision asked again. The news is already calling it a preemptive mutant terrorist attack. They just appeared out of nowhere and started destroying everything unfortunate to be near them immediately. Vision's interface pulled up every mainstream news channel and radio in New York, and was greeted with a sight of super-powered beings wreaking havoc in the middle of New York. I'm on my way, Vision said and shot off towards the base with Petro behind him, and a leaping Davis struggling to keep up with the two super-fast individuals in front of him. As Vision approached the base, his mind scattered into smaller bites of data, and filtered into networks that aligned with the file array he set up for the particular accident happening right now. Unfortunately for him, there were no phones or street cams, with a recording on that had captured when the mutants causing problems, started their acts of destruction. It was a fuckfest. He didn't bother slowing down as he phased through all the obstructions in front of him, and landed in the conference room with a pensive-looking Steve in front of the holographic projector, watching everything with rapt attention. On the side was Natasha, Sam, Banner and the rest of the group, including the pair of Sarah and Laura. Well, this is the worst PR I've ever seen. Banner said, trying to break the still atmosphere after Vision arrived. No kidding. I can already feel the increasing number of phone calls made to the White House in the last 10 minutes. Vision remarked in response to Banner's quip. Steve turned around and saw that everyone was already gathered. Sans the offer, Thor and Tony who was God knows where. We need to move out now. We'll assess the situation and final course of action when we get there. They all move out the very second after those words left Steve's mouth. Since the Quinjet was big enough to hold them all together with a little size manipulation from Vision, all of them boarded it, while Sarah and Banner remained behind. Don't worry Sarah. I'll be looking after her the whole time. Vision assured the worried mother who was having a hard time convincing her daughter otherwise. Even Vision had to concede this one to Laura, after feeling just how much she wanted to help in her own way, however she could. All the training and fights she watched the others partake in, left her stewing for a fight of her own, and she was just a bit off from blowing through the limits of her patience. He already had contingencies to ensure that any negative comments from the media that were attributed to Laura or anything resembling child labor was to be quickly dealt with. He'd be damned if he let anyone spoil her first taste of action. I gotta say Vision, you really did a number on my gear. Sam said with an impressed whistle as he looked at the sleek red and white jacket he wore, looking as if he was going for a stroll. There were a couple of ways to get the working which ranged from different manual cues and hand motions to being connected to the goggles he was wearing. The rest of the team was also wearing the remade version of their suit, even Laura and Petro. They all appreciated the suit, even Steve couldn't help but praise the new aesthetics of his suit. Seeing how they all took to Thea New Jedi, Vision decided to hold off on telling them that what they were happy about was nothing more than his first prototype. He also couldn't help but worry about what this meant for the mutants as an attack of this nature at the worst time possible. What was he even thinking? I already know how this will play out after this. And it's for that reason why this is such a mess. Police scanners said it has already escalated towards Edison and Fifth. We'll be dropping off at the heart of it. Vision, you're on Overwatch. Call it as you see it. After confirming Steve's orders and being a few meters from their drop-off, Vision fell through the Quinjet and immediately set up her information network with all the street cams, scanners and even the news helicopters flying ahead. Cap! There are three groups of these mutants, and I can already count in some beastification, energy projection and combustion mutation. Got it. Davis, Petro and Sam will help the police calm the breakout on Edison. Wanda, Natasha and I will hold down those at the mall me. Laura immediately asked Steve after not hearing the task that was set aside for her. Don't worry. You and Vision will take the last location these mutants are currently attacking Steve really had to thank his lucky stars. That as much as Vision prioritizes efficiency. The man in question was just as efficient as anyone could be. Despite being on constant surveillance and not letting anything escape his view, that didn't stop Vision from engaging enemies without impeding on his given duty. The team immediately dispersed with Laura and Vision remaining, as the former patiently waited for Vision to do whatever it was that he was doing. Thankfully he didn't waste any time at all, and turned to Laura. Try and subjugate them as much as you can, was all Vision said, and she nodded. It went without anyone saying that some deaths were inevitable, and so while they prioritized subjugation, the moment they sensed their life in danger, 
they go for the kill. How good are you at sticking your landing? Laura tilted her head in confusion at the random question, but before she could answer, Vision cut her off and continued. Don't worry, take it as a part of the field experience. Her confusion increased, and before she could make it known, her balance shifted abruptly, and the world spun in fast motions, as she was telekinetically thrown towards her battlefield. Rule number 9 of being a hero. Always stick the landing. She would have cussed at Vision if she knew how to express herself that way. So the only thing she could do was listen to his words, and take out her indignation on the prey that just entered her sights. Finally getting her bearings, she twisted fluidly midair, and set her trajectory towards one of the mutants, who looked as if he was made up of different metals for different parts of his body. As Laura descended towards her marked target, an adamantium blade extended from one of her legs, as she was just meters away from landing. The mutant, sensing someone behind him, quickly turned around. But he was too late as Laura's blade effortlessly pissed through his shoulder blades, as her weight fell upon him, and brought him down to the ground. Seeing her downed opponent, she nodded a job well done to herself, and did a backflip off the body. She was about to run in another direction, but her senses blared, and she dodged to the side to avoid an extended blade piercing through her. She looked up in mild surprise as she saw the person who was supposed to have suffered a fatal injury from her landing get up, and then something happened. The different metallic part of his body shifted haphazardly, until the silvery part that used to be around his stomach area, moved towards his shoulder, and the hold that was there closed. Mercury. Laura thought as she caught the smell of the different metals he was consisted of. He rushed at Laura without so much as a word spoken between them, while Laura got into a defensive stance to receive him. His right hand flattened to a blade which he swung downwards to cleave off the little girl's head. But Laura just ducked under it, and in a quick stepping motion, she got into his personal space which rendered his blade ineffective due to how close and small the space she occupied was. With a pair of pristine gleaming adamantium blades jutted out from both hands, Laura twisted her small body to narrowly escape the side punch from his other hand. Moving precisely as her instincts dictated, she slashed her claws toward the incoming blade arm, and severed it without much resistance. But no groan of pain came from her adversary's mouth. Capitalizing on the opening created from his lack of balance for losing an arm, she used his chest as a platform to step off from, and used her other leg to give him a roundhouse kick that disoriented him. She looked at the stump of his arm that wasn't bleeding and frowned even harder at the lack of reaction she was getting from him. He really looked like he was made up of metals both in and out. The man transformed his other hand into a golden mace, and brought it down on her, which forced her to step out from his space to dodge. Unfortunately, that turned out to be a wrong choice of action, as the man picked up his other arm, and moved his mercuric portion to the stump, before fusing it with the severed limb, which immediately gained the mercuric property upon contact. Laura groaned as she saw him back to being whole, but didn't panic, as she formed an action path, with the goal of cutting out the part of him that was made of mercury. Piece of cake. She muttered and this time took the initiative of attacking. With Steve's group, they were facing off against a group of five mutants, which consisted of a behemoth of a man, wobble horns and hoofed fingers, a guy with two tail that looked like stingers, clearly poisonous at a glance, a woman with a weird mouth and heavy belly with unknown abilities, the guy who explodes anything he touches, and one with spikes from all sides of his body, as if he were a porcupine. The moment they saw Steve and his group, the one with the spikes, sent a volley of spike projectiles at them, which was stopped by Wanda, who caught all of them midair and sent them back to their sender. Three of the mutants dodged while the horn man and the weird woman stood their ground at the incoming spikes. The woman opened her mouth, and a great suction force flew out from it, and took in all the projectiles sent her way, while the man just stood there and let them crash against his body. I'll hold these two off, Wanda said as her whole body got covered in a red glow. I will take Spikey and our arsonist. That leaves me with Tail. Steve and Natasha went after their chosen opponents, while Wanda faced off against the two mutants in front of her. Since they were lacking in numbers compared to their opponents, their best decision was to engage them very quickly to prevent the other from branching out from their reach, and that was what Wanda and Steve did. It was a race for them to take care of their enemies quickly and help the others. For Wanda, she smirked and looked at the two and said, You'll do just fine. As there was no need to draw this out any longer than it had any right to be, Wanda flew directly towards them, and threw a car at the woman who opened her mouth once again, and sucked the car inside stomach. The horned brute rushed at Wanda with his intimidating tall and broad figure, only for him to be slammed sideways as a pole swatted him. Wanda saw the woman opening her mouth as she wanted to focus on her downed opponent, which prompted her to shoot her hex blast towards her to halt her action. But not only did the woman not dodge, instead of a suction force, 
What greeted Wanda was different object of varying sizes hurled at her at breakneck speeds, which forced her to put up a barrier. Seeing as how the woman had no intention of stopping her onslaught, Wanda flew backwards and erected shields that shielded her from the attacks. A red intense glow covered her hands, and she punched it into the ground, causing it to crack in a progressing line towards the woman, with red spewing out of the cracks. Seeing the incoming attack, she closed her mouth and attempted to dodge, but it was at that point that she was covered in a red explosion, that downed any scream she could have let out. Now it's your turn, she said, addressing the horned man who was preparing for a charge in a bull-like way. As the man started his charge, red chains spewed out from Wanda's back, and shot forward to bind him, wrapping against every part of his body, until his charge became static. The chains clung tighter to his body, as he tried wriggling his way out of it. Darkness cast a shadow over him, and four barriers went up around him, which made him look up, only to be greeted by the sight of a falling tanker that exploded in a fiery blaze as it crashed into him. Hum, not what I expected. While Wanda was taking care of the two mutants she squared off against, Steve was having a bit of a hard time fighting a ranger and a bomber. Dealing with them wasn't too hard, but the problem was that they were not exactly making it easy for him. All the Combuster needed was to grab anything lying around, and it became a literal bomb in his hands. Steve dived through the window of a coffee shop as a glowing block was thrown into it, which sent the cafe up in a blazing explosion. One, two, two seconds, maybe less. He said with a slightly uneven breath due to all the jumping around he's been doing. I got this. Psyching himself up, he tapped the ear region of his cowl and it simultaneously covered his exposed mouth and eyes. His shield let out a whirring noise as the edge of his shield turned red like plasma. Taking a deep breath, Steve jumped out of his hiding spot, and immediately threw his shield towards the spiky mutant, with his full strength causing it to tear through the air with negligible resistance, as it covered the distance between Steve and its target. Steve dashed towards the combuster who held a couple of glowing rocks in his hand that he threw towards Steve. Two seconds, maybe less. Steve ignored the squelching sound he heard, as his eyes were focused on the bombs halfway towards him. With his higher than average physical factor, he jumped towards the incoming bombs. And with a flicking motion of his hand, his shield shot back towards him from where it had been lodged. After dissecting the spiky mutant halfway, the shield flew towards him with a speed just as fast as the one he threw it with, and landed in his hands at the exact moment the bomb got in front of his face. In a display of an applaud rewarding gymnastics, Steve dodged the bomb with a sideways 360 degrees, but before the bomb could sail harmlessly past his reach, he swung his shield as if swatting something, and hit the bomb with a backhand smash, that sent it flying back to its pitcher. The mutant who never expected Steve to be able to dodge the bomb in the first place, least of all hit it back, was in the middle of another throw, caught off guard, as his own bomb appeared in front of his face, which caused him to freeze involuntarily. The bomb which Steve had already calculated the time frame between its explosion and time of impact, exploded right in his face, setting off a chain reaction with the other bombs the mutant held. Now, that's a home run. Your area has been cleared, Cap. Vision POV seeing Laura dealing with the guy that looked like a high school student's chemistry experiment. I turned my attention to one of the main menaces of mine and Laura's location. It was over 10 feet tall, and the empathic signals I was getting from him, it, were all sorts of wrong. The jaws of this thing was as wide as fuck, and the visible teeth peeking out from its receding lips was more than enough to give anyone who came face to face with it nightmares. It had four small eyes that could move in any direction independently. Not only that, from the wrist down was some sort of carapace that just went from the wrist to form five glowing fingers, that was brimming with energy on both hands. It had a spiked tail that periodically let out bursts of dark purple, almost violet, electricity that fried any metal or technology in a few meter radius of it. Honestly, it looked like a mad scientist's attempt at cloning Godzilla, and the only thing they got right, although wrong, was the scary appearance. Looking at the pattern with which they moved and attacked while spreading out, I couldn't find any rhythm to it. It was as if they were sent just to cause havoc and public unrest. It is really unnerving how they were just moving about and attacking anything they saw. I guess I'll be dealing with you first. I don't know if it heard me or understood what I was trying to say and imply, but it let out what I would interpret as a roar of defiance, causing a massive burst of electricity that probably blacked out a few blocks while its hands and feet thrummed with whatever energy were contained in those digits. The Mind Stone has detected multiple shattered sentience in the subject in front of you so someone sent it. Well, that much is obvious seeing as how they are not using the chaos they created to further any sort of plan. I managed to stifle the sigh that hung around my throat, and worked with the information I was currently privy to. Can you find out if there is any receptive signal they might emit? Negative. The consciousness of the subject before you has already likely been programmed and closed off after it was given an order I hate Marvel. 
For some reason, I have been feeling like that lately. And I don't know why. But intellectually speaking, just why? Why the fixation on clones and mutant experiments in Marvel? Still keeping the sigh within. I shook my head and muttered to no one in particular. Let's just get this over with and find out which among these attackers know anything about whoever is behind this. Finally turning my full attention to the thing in front of me, I watched with an analytical gaze. How it was gathering the energy, and smoothly distributing the energy from its hands and feet to any part of its body it wanted to attack with. From afar we looked like a hero facing off against some mighty monster with me floating around in the sky, with my duck cape billowing behind me. As much as I don't appreciate superhero costumes, I don't exactly have an alternative to it. So I went with my former suit, after making a small color scheme change. Unlike Godzilla, the thing in front of me looked human, despite its monstrous stature and appendages. If finished charging whatever attack he had been cooking in and in one swift burst, let it all out at me. In the face of its attack, I raised my hand and the space in front of me contorted as I formed an electromagnetic field that stopped the blast. Incoming energy can be absorbed in moderation to prevent any instances of blackout. Due to its nature don't bother. As soon as it stopped its energy blast, the electromagnetic field in front of me broke apart like glass as I closed the distance and punched him into the ground. Shit. Probably should keep the damage to a minimum. It grunted and tried to stand up, but I brought my leg down on its face and caved the ground a few meters deeper. Its fingers once again thrummed with energy, as it tried to slash it at me only for an energy blast of mine to be fired from my legs to impact his head. Despite the point blank hit to its face, it still tried to struggle. But I wasn't having it as electricity cackled around my finger and dove towards its head and engulfing it in blanket of blue light as the electricity fried everything in its head despite the fact that he could absorb electrical energies. Your area has been cleared, Cap. I informed Steve as I looked at the burnt face of whatever this was. Unfortunately for it, I had the edge over it in energy absorption and manipulation. Since there was nothing I could salvage from this thing, I left its body there and moved towards where Laura was dicing up her opponent. The man couldn't even make a straight motion before Laura diced up a part of his body and kicked it far away. There's one down the street so finish that one up quickly. I said before going in another direction where a mutant was currently thinning a herd of humans. Without stopping for a moment, I grabbed him and took him away with me. With a command from me, my mental power poured out and flowed into his mind and brutally broke through any flimsy mental barrier he might or might not have had. ECH? I snorted and threw his vegetable body away, as I found out nothing of importance. Run a scan. Register all the brain wavelengths that are similar to the other two I killed. Fuck. Guys, none of these are people. They are all program puppets. I informed the rest of the team which was giving them free reign to do whatever they want. An enraged shout took my attention for a couple of seconds as I turned to look at where Sam's group was fighting. Vision. I turned to Laura who was already done with the two opponents she fought and smiled at her. Finally content. She nodded and came to stand beside me as I landed. Most likely this attack was carried out to worsen and force the parliament into signing and passing the Mutant Registration Act. The problem here is that the number of people who would want to do something like this are many. Come with me Laura. Let's go do some rescue while the others round up their fights. Laura and I went about helping people we could in retrieving the bodies of the dead ones and doing what we could to identify their families. It was safe to say that whoever did this knew what exactly they were doing and making it look like it was a bunch of rampaging mutants. Depending on how we handle this, whoever did this could spin the narrative and get the public on their side. After they were done, Petro and Wanda helped out with the rescue, while I attended to those I could by either applying first aid or mending broken bones, before the paramedics came. Though it ended as a small attack, if they had been given enough time they could have caused some substantial damage. That would have been had to deal with. Do you have any idea who might be behind this vision? Steve asked me as I finished helping out those I could. You guess is the same as mine. Whatever Ross and the facility where I found Laura was working on are connected. We know what they were trying to do. But we don't know who they are. I said. But give me a little time and I'll find out who they are. I added. Message received from Raven Darkum. We need to talk. I let out a small smile as I saw that message, knowing fully well what sort of answer she would give me after seeing what happened today. You think they'll push the accords on us more after this happens? I nodded. In the movie, they pushed forward the accords after Wanda mistakenly killed innocent civilians, which also included foreign dignitaries, while trying to deflect a bomb. While it is indeed a worrying subject, I advise not to put too much thought into it. I advised. Steve looked surprised at my advice and asked me why I said that and my answer was simple. 
Everyone has already made their choice in the event that the Accords are passed. The reason I'm strongly against the regulations listed on the Accords is because of how it will affect humans and mutants both. I don't want to see what an Omega-level mutant who is pushed to his final limits will do in retaliation. I see. I really need to start putting people in places of power. I hate the fact that the only way I can go against them is brute forcing my way through any law they make. This is one of those instances of the pen being mightier than the sword. Just like everyone predicted, the evening news was something else to watch. Surprisingly, only J.J. Jemison's Daily Bugle newscast spoke about how bleak the future of mutant kind will be in the country after this attack. Other channels spewed the same thing with a little rehash of what another one said. Whether they meant it or not, they were basically fanning the flames of a witch hunt against mutants. This is the reason why we need a regulation of the super-powered individuals in the country, and this is exactly what the Mutant Registration Act and UN Accords are made for. Just imagine the disaster that happened today. And yet there was nothing we could do. No one was held responsible and we couldn't reach out to any mutants to help. But the Avengers were present on the scene, and they stopped the disaster from spreading, yes. They did, and we are thankful for that. But the painful truth is that the damages were already done before they arrived. Lives and infrastructure had already been destroyed before their arrival. It's also saddening to think that though the Avengers claim to want to protect the Earth, none of them have been forthcoming when matters of the Accords were put through them. The reactions varied from people to people, but the politicians were mostly rallied under one banner. The consensus was that the super-powered individuals should sign the acts and accords when it is passed. Unfortunately, the reason why those familiar with politics, mostly heroes and mutants, were hesitant in signing any of them was because, for heroes, it meant that the government had the right order them anywhere irrespective of their choice, and also had the power to restrain their movements to certain places, if they felt it will threaten the stability. For the mutants, however, signing up for the Mutant Registration Act was no different than submitting a pending conscription for the US military. While it is not as blatant when given a first glance, the Registration Act coupled with the Accords was a sure-fire way for the government to create their own personal super-army. If it had been under different conditions, both the Registration Act and the Accords would have been the dream of every mutant, but humans' unending greed for power was more than powerful enough to corrupt the purest of intentions. While some argued that the super-powered individuals of the country should come forth and support the new movement in order for something like this not to happen again, others weren't subtle in pointing fingers. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Nothing good will come out from the mutants. And while the so-called heroes are currently helping, who knows when they will turn against the innocent citizens they once sworn to protect. I mean, seriously. The one they call Hulk wrecked the Culver Institute and then proceeded to destroy Harlan and now he's being hailed as some kind of hero. This is the same green beast that fought against Tony Stark in Johannesburg a couple of months ago, after he lost control of himself. My question to the American citizen is this. What are you protecting? While the actions of the Avengers after the fight helped alleviate the critics they were getting, it did nothing to quell hate they were currently heaping on their heads. While a lot of people were using the recent incident as a political boost and a way to gain a public voice, there were others who had completely different views to what was being aired on the news. The Avengers were heroes. That was a fact that no one could deny regardless of their bias. And whilst their heroics affected some negatively, they also were others who they saved. I don't get it. They did nothing wrong. Yes, I believe that they should be held accountable for their actions, good and bad. But what I don't support is when people ask what have they done. I live here in New York and three years ago the sky split open directly above my head and aliens attacked. I remember seeing people being killed as the aliens attacked, and I was sure it was going to be my turn next, but Captain America saved me. And then during the recent attack I was in Edison when the fight started, and yet again I was saved by the Grim Hulk. What do you mean by they are not trying? Did no one see them being a part of the rescue effort and helping out with first aid? Or have everyone forgotten how the fight ended in mere minutes after their arrival? While random street interviews and news channels relayed what happened during the destruction by the group of mutants, the internet basically social media, were set ablaze with opinions, videos, interactions and comments about everything that was happening so far. While the elders entered their world of listening to the news at 9pm, those who were born during the age of the internet and those who were drawn into it expressed themselves more openly behind their media handles and usernames. Thunderbunny. AMG less than did anyone see the video of that lady in red dropping a tanker on one of the attacking mutants. That was so hot pun doubly intended. I am not sus. 
Thunder Bunny can you be any more pathetic? People are crying and yet here you are fantasizing about a woman you can never have. Thunder Bunny. I'm not sus, I'm grieving in my own way. And besides, I'm looking on the bright side where it's hot and sexy. Disciplera. Kinks and fetishes aside, anyone have any idea who the new faces in the Avengers are? I mean there's a grim looking Hulk for crying out loud I am not sus. Yeah, like the lady in red with some type of red construct powers and the other guy who disappears every second. Is that really how someone with super speed moves? Giant damn. Full on panda. So I'm guessing no one has seen the video of the guy with the black cape stopping an energy blast with one hand and literally stomping on his ops. I tell you, Mans was on some of that black air force activity. Thorsome ksks. It's full on panda I saw. That almost caused me a little crisis. I kid you not. The not bothered look on his face as he bathed that mini Zilla's head in electricity by pointing a finger at it almost became the deal breaker for me. 80 Spuddle. I was at one of the sites where he gave first aid, and I heard Captain America call him Vision. Deprivate Fox. I know we all agree that the Avengers are great and all, but who got any info on the girl that fought with them? I'll also buy any hair samples and any 4K HD pictures of her feet. And Jelbank. Oh great, another weirdo. You need to get cured, man. I can tell you're already dancing on the thin edge. Thunder Bunny. Deprivate Fox my B-R-O-T-H-E-R less than I managed to procure a picture of her slicing someone's leg off in an angle. That made her little butt come out. More the user handle named Deprivate Fox no longer exists. The user handle named Thunder Bunny no longer exists. Silent Creeper. And off they go. Good riddance there were numerous threads on social media with these sorts of conversations running rampant. There was no way for the government to fully censor or manipulate the events of that day when almost every youth had access to one of these numerous threads. It frustrated them so much to the point that even if they took one down, two more posts would take its place. The ex-mansion the mood in Charles's office today was a very grim one, and it only turned grimmer when they had turned on the news later in the day. Everyone sitting in the office knew just what an attack like this meant for mutants. While they had been towing the lines and limits of the government in respect to mutants, this attack just flipped everything on its head. Charles Hank said with an Ashen face as they watched members of the Senate giving a speech about calling another hearing two days from now. Is there anything we can do? Even Colossus who usually remained quiet, was spooked by what happened as it took everyone by surprise. Feeling the rising horror and dread in the minds of some of his teachers and students, Charles knew that he had to do something and do it fast. Aurora looked at the news and what they were saying, and it hurt her heart. Was it that hard for simple understanding between two people to be met? We are not going to just lay back and let them do all this right. The sky turned a little dark, perfectly displaying her current state of mind. They were all triggered. We are not doing anything yet. Charles said, trying to assuage the dark thoughts currently swimming in their head. I will reach out to a few people I know. In the meantime, I would like you all to try and calm the younger ones down. They need it now more than ever. The teachers nodded. But they just couldn't clear their head of what was happening, and what this meant to them and their future going forward. Edward Buckman was beside himself as he saw how effectively he had manipulated the public opinion towards the mutants. It had been a constant worry on his side as he saw people no longer caring of the danger that the mutants represented. And all that was needed was a little coaxing from his friend Shaw. And he effortlessly got them back on the right thinking path, as they were once again reminded of the ticking time bomb that walked in their midst on a daily basis. He would have been overwhelmingly ecstatic about the whole thing, if not for one little piece of information he got during the whole squabble between his brain-dead experiments and the Avengers. Weapon H and X-23 had been acquired by the Avengers. He was appalled when he found that out, and soon realized that it was the Avengers that destroyed Ross's military base in Nevada, and sabotaged their joint coalition by killing all the top officials and the scientists spearheading the experiments. Not only that, they also completely destroyed one of his facility that was sponsored to restart Stryker's past research of mass-producing unkillable soldiers. And then there was Norman Osborn's death. Given how the first two incidents were caused by the Avengers, he held little doubt that they too were responsible for Osborn's death. If he had only lost two specimens of two important experimental research, he wouldn't have been that bothered by the loss. But in this event, he not only lost his prized possessions, but also every speck of data pertaining to those research and experiments. The loss was too monumental. The three-step loss of his investments forced the actualization of his project, Armageddon to be pushed back indefinitely. Damn fucking Avengers. He was not worried about his involvement in those experiments being found out, because he was sure not to leave any paper or digital trail of his participation. But what he was worried about was how the Avengers would react 
if he made some of his friends in the Senate press for the custody of the two of them. Doing something like that would definitely alert them that someone involved in those inhumane experiments was finding a way to get them back. At this point, I don't fucking care anymore. The Avengers are already on their last legs and would soon be put on a leash like those kids from the Baxter building. He could just wait it out. But there was a chance that they could go hiding, just as Bruce Banner had done for almost a decade. And his experiments would be lost to the wind. Or someone might get their hands on them first before he did. A disadvantage of working in the shadows was that there were always some restrictions with every action you take. Won't it be better if I just take them now than face the possibility of losing them when the Avengers go under? But then again, it's the Avengers. He pondered out loud as he watched the bright city nightlife from his office. Minutes. That was all it took the Avengers to put an end to the chaos of the rampaging mutants. And that was without the inclusion of Tony Stark, Thor and the Hulk. They weren't a ragtag bunch like those wanted vigilantes that were playing at being heroes. Each of them were an asset that any sane military power coveted, and together they formed a very powerful organization. That made the American government exceedingly cautious. For Buckman, due to the pressing importance of his project, Armageddon, he couldn't afford to be passive when he could not predict what kind of actions the Avengers will take if pressured too much from the government. He was a businessman, and so he knew how to identify stubborn people, and those who will fiercely fight back if they are cornered, and the Avengers were such people, at least the members he's met. Should I tell Shaw? He shook his head at that thought because even if he trusted Shaw to a certain limited degree, he couldn't let him in on his every move, after all they were business, and seeking profits was their whole modus operandi. Coming to a decision, he looked at the huge building in the middle of New York with words stark emblazoned on it, and held his drink towards it, while motioning a toast. To a greater humanity, Raven Duck on POV Mystique simmered in rage as she watched the recap of the news that was recently circulating everywhere. For the first time in recent years, Magneto had reached out to her to ask her if she knew anything about what happened, and she answered truthfully to her knowledge. She had not the slightest idea of what the hell had happened. The reason for her anger was not because of the predictable foolish decision that will inevitably be made by the country's leaders, but because of the effect such decisions will have on other innocent mutants. She wasn't afraid to go against the full might of the world to secure her right to live in this sickening world. The only thing that held her back was because she did not have the means. She was not like Eric Charles or even Emma. The power she held could amount to nothing in front of these people. The only thing that had kept her alive all through the years she's been alive was her intellect and her ability to shapeshift. If only she had a little bit of the power like her two friends, she was sure she would have done more than any of them had done. Seeing how interview after interview only gave those hateful people a neutral ground to express their hatred for her kind, she in a rare moment of regret, wished she was born with a more powerful ability. The only reason she left Charles for Eric was because the latter had the power and the drive to bring about the change he wanted, and while he did deliver on it, the result of his actions warped him so much that she found it hard to be near him at times. So she left. She knew that with the recent events happening, Eric would no longer sit aside and move in the shadows. The world would soon see the re-emergence of the world-class threat known as Magneto. And she knew that for a fact. She took in a deep breath and switched off the TV and reclined into her couch. She picked up her phone and opened her messages and tapped on the contact listed as Vision. Vision, huh? What a fucking irony. Tomorrow, after school hours, she didn't know how to feel about the text and what it meant for her going forward. For the first time in a long while, she decided to put herself out there and try to stir the new change, as much as her abilities allowed her to. She was Mystique, the ever-changing enigma. She represented the tenacity of living beings adapting to the changes of time. She left Vision's text and scrolled a bit down, and came across the contact of a person that meant a lot to her. She hesitated on whether to give her a call, but she couldn't risk it. She knew of Magneto's paranoia, and figured that the metal head had probably sent one or two of his lackeys to keep an eye on her, and report her movements. Also Vision had tampered with her phone when he saved his contacts inside. She just couldn't risk it. All it'll take is a little while. She softly muttered and shifted into a more comfortable position on the couch, as she closed her eyes, and let sleep take her to the illusory world of dreams. Baxter building the members of the Fantastic Four, each wore a pensive look, as they saw news reports of mutant settlements being exposed and set on fire. This ain't right, Ben said with gritted teeth as they watched a mutant father with slitted reptilian eyes use his body as a shield to protect a not more than six years old child, with a tail and noticeable scales on different parts of his body. None of you can tell me this is right. Despite being the one with the rock-hard exterior, he was one of the kindest people on the team. 
and even among those they knew outside. As sad and inhumane it is, there's very little we can do, Reed said with an apologetic expression. Hearing Reed's words, Ben scoffed in irritation. Yeah, and whose fault is that? Come on guys, we shouldn't do this now. Johnny immediately tried to placate Ben so as not to let the matter escalate and create more discord among them. He looked at Ben and tried to reason with him as softly as possible. Unfortunately, bro, Reed is right this time. There's nothing we can do. Their position in this whole mess was a little awkward, which only worsened it for them, as their movements were constrained. We might not be able to do anything, but what I do know is I'm not signing any shit. If those bastards are going to let something like this happen. Ben said as he stood up and walked away with heavy steps. The living room they were in fell into an awkward silence as none of them knew what to say after Ben's outburst. You've been awfully quiet, Sue. What's eating at your mind? Johnny turned to his sister who had uncharacteristically remained quiet throughout the whole thing. Shaken from her thoughts, Sue waves her hands as if it was nothing of importance, causing Johnny to shrug and lay off it. Sue, in the confines of her mind, was plagued by a question that was flowing through a lot of people's heads after the recent carnival of madness. What am I supposed to do? Vision POV I was currently sitting on a bench at the bank of a lake, along with a middle-aged Asian woman sharing the bench with me. We spent the first few minutes in silence just watching the random passers-by and the occasional joggers, until Mystique broke the silence. I didn't peg you for a nature-loving guy. I'm not. But I am of the belief that tranquil and aesthetically beautiful things should be properly appreciated. I said lightly before finally turning to look at her since my arrival. You said you wanted to talk. Right now, I was in my Simon disguise. Since I don't want the scenario where I'm identified in public. I blame my lack of concern for a superhero secret identity on the Avengers, because none of them cared about it. Each of them were public celebrity slash superhero figures. It's about your proposal. I want to know in detail your intentions and what you stand to gain out of this, so that I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. She said while paying attention to the newsreels and blog posts on her phone. My reply to her question was a simple sentence. The complete upheaval of the Hellfire Club. Despite already resolving myself to be someone who will leave his mark in this universe, of his history, that I'll be known for generations to come, despite sympathizing with the unjustified hate and persecution that the mutants went through in their early days. I still will not put myself in a position that I will appear as a savior to them. Who said they needed a savior or a messiah? While I am far from being the smartest person alive or the most experienced, the fact that my data log reach extended as far back as the advent of the internet has to count for something. In my opinion, Eric and Charles failed in the singular aspect that they both portrayed themselves as the mutant kind saving grace. Charles believes that his actions will be the pivotal point of change for the mutants, while Eric outright put himself in a position of being worshipped as a king and believed he was needed for the future of the mutants. This was why the mutants, on most occasions, were always divided between Charles's faction and that of Eric's. Seeing that I meant exactly what I said, Mystique gave me a side glance and asked again, And you intend to do that by having me infiltrate the inner circle? There must have been a criteria that I pass for you to seek me out. What is it? I can tell that she has already agreed with my proposition, and this back and forth was just a way for her to get a mental picture of me. I don't care much for it, on the contrary it's better for her to create her own opinions of me with a conversation like the one we are currently having. Criteria. Well, I won't lie and say that I didn't put together a few considerations when deciding on who I wanted to work on this with. I informed her as I rubbed my two palms together and blew into it. First thing I considered when deciding on it was perseverance. While staring directly at her as if I could see her innermost thoughts and heart desires. I gave her the first reason. You stuck with Eric for more than four decades despite his numerous shortcomings. That requires an inhuman level of perseverance and focus. And I'll very much like that when working with someone. She looked stunned, more in shock and surprise with a little bit of wariness. But I didn't give her a chance to break my momentum and continued saying things out of my ass mixed with what I knew of her. Moral alignment aside, I believe Eric wouldn't have gotten to where he is as fast as he did without you. Not to be presumptuous, but I believe he considers you an irreplaceable asset in his organization. That is if he hasn't gotten senile. I couldn't stop my lips from twitching as I remembered the astonishing number of betrayals and number of times she switched sides, or just played two groups altogether. Oh, she definitely was no saint, no doubt about that. While you come with your own fair shares of trouble, I could care less about them, since you are pretty capable as you haven't lost your head after more than a century. Turns out that this version of Mystique was the one over a century old, because I had found a picture of her in 1968, in her adult polymorph form. So in essence, what I'm basically trying to say is that you've been around for far much longer than either Charles or Eric, 
and you've been by their side long enough to remember all their behavioral tics and subconscious tells. And yet you are the one who has faded away. Now we were both staring into the other's eyes to ascertain any bit of falsehood lying deep beneath. I've already made it clear that this was not a proposal of equal partnership, as that would mean we are working towards a mutual goal. We aren't. On my side, I had no reason to lie to her as there was nothing I stood to gain from it. And it's not as if I needed something from her. Her being here with me was a choice I made after ascertaining who I was dealing with. So while there's an 80% probability of her betraying me later down the line, the betrayal won't affect me in any way. In fact, if that does happen, there won't be anything stopping me from attacking her. I laughed a bit as I could feel her shock and surprise turn to curiosity, which also spiked her wariness towards me. With nothing else to say to her, I ended my monologue with my conclusion. You are not a good person, Mystique, nor are you someone the fates played a hard hand against. You are evil. I don't care, though I think it's impossible, if you want redemption, repentance, or try to make amends. The only thing I want from you is being someone capable. We fell into another wave of silence as I ended what I had to say to her. I rested my back against the bench, and just enjoyed the soft peaceful caress of the wind, before I had to go back and fall back into routine. I felt Mystique shuffling and recomposing herself, putting a stop to any distracting thoughts that might be swimming through her head. How long did it take for you to come up with something like that? She asked with the shadows of a smirk hanging on the edge of her lips. No time at all. I came up with it on the fly. She exhaled and I could feel her relaxing as some of the tension she came here with bled out of her system. You're right about a lot of things about me. But I hope you don't think you have me figured out with just that. I wouldn't dream of it. Good. I hope this alliance of ours becomes fruitful. She said and stood up from the bench and changed into another form this time a young man. I'll be in touch, Vision. And with that she walked away. Oh, and there is one more thing you got wrong about me. I do care. Without it being explicitly said, I am very impressed. Not just by her but myself as well. It's such a wholesome moment when I come face to face with the fact that I'm worlds apart from who I used to be a few months prior. Feeling a bit light on the inside, I got up from the bench and made to leave. You're not the only one who cares. In an undisclosed location, garbed in a dark red suit and a purple cape that hung back from his shoulders, Eric Lencher, known worldwide as Magneto, sat on his lonesome in an empty room, whose surface reflected light with its cold metallic silver. At his side was his trusty helmet, that had followed him through more than half of his life. At this point, the metallic helmet was not just a handy tool to block out telepaths, but had become something like a symbol of his identity. A knock resounded through every corner of the room which prompted the sitting, eyes closed, cross-legged man to speak out without breaking his meditation. Report. Sir, everything has been carried out as you ordered. And Charles. There has been no intentional movement both in and out of the mansion, except for the kids going to school. The man on the other side of the door diligently reported, and Mystique. No movements from her side either. Magneto asked nothing else and focused on his practice, while the person on the other side of the door patiently waited for any of his orders. After five minutes of saying and doing nothing other than measured breaths, Magneto opened his eyes and stood up from the cold metallic floor he had been sitting on. Tell them to get ready. We have work to do. He said and took his helmet before gently placing it on his head. And tell them to prepare a fitting gift for our human friends. Vision POV as expected, the days following the disaster were hectic for everyone else, as hundreds of calls from the White House, Congress and Senate came flooding in every single minute of the day. It got unbearable to the point that Steve had to ask me to reroute the system's network to divert calls coming from specific IPs, before we managed to secure enough breathing room. On my end, since I know that Raven will be working her ends while having Emma's backing, I wasn't too worried about her failing. All she needed to do was give me an opening, a single reason to crash and burn whoever she picks as her first target. Out of the members of the inner circle, some would prove a hard assignment if she were to try to usurp their throne, and the prime example of those people would be the two kings and queens. She was more than wise enough to steer clear of Celine's path. So that left only three big cakes in Shaw, Frost and Buckman. Trying to take down Shaw as the first target without diminishing his influence would destroy the club. So he was automatically out of the target list, meaning only Emma and Buckman were left. Since she had some dealings with the White Queen, Buckman was the only one who would fit her prime target criteria. But all these speculations were based on the fact that she went after one of the main powers. And knowing Raven, that was exactly what she would do. That aside, it seems that the recent mutant terrorist attack had forced some small-time heroes and vigilantes to pop up from every corner of the state. From the rumors and blog posts that were caught in the algorithm I had set in place, 
It seems like Daredevil and Luke Cage are now up and about. Hopefully this is all for the best. Since it was given that we couldn't ignore the constant calls coming from the government offices forever, Tony, Sam and Steve were out running damage control and giving a perspective of the attack to the press. Right now I was currently in the lab with Sarah and Banner after Sarah had called for us. I got your call. Something up. She excitedly beckoned us to follow her and we did to a spot where some culture tubes were kept. So, what exactly are we looking at? This. She pushed a Petri dish into our hands and gestured for us to check it out. I looked at Banner, but he just shrugged at me showing his ignorance on the matter. He took the Petri dish and placed it under the microscope and zoomed in to observe it, before turning to look at Sarah in confusion, not understanding. While she gave him a human DNA sample to observe, I could see what he was seeing, and even I failed to understand what she was trying to tell us. But as we both looked at her for an explanation, she became more visibly excited. We waited for a few seconds to let her ride off whatever high she was on and finally asked her what she was trying to tell us. First of all, that's not a human's DNA. At least not specifically, she said. What do you mean not specifically? Banner asked. Because that's not a pure human DNA, but a mutant's. She finally revealed, and while Banner was gobsmacked, I took the dish and placed it under the microscope, just in case my interface made a mistake. And yes, I know exactly how ridiculous that sounds. I took a good look at it, and made a detail of every outline and placement of the cell structure, and then I saw it. Humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 paired chromosomes, and while mutants too have the same 23 pair of chromosomes, it is the last pair that makes them entirely different. In humans, they have 22 autosomes and a pair of sexual Xi or XX chromosomes. For mutants, they have 21 autosomes, a pair of either XX or Xi sexual chromosomes, and then a pair of unidentified X genes. But what I was seeing now was different. The one that was supposed to be the X gene was taking on the appearance of neutral autosomes. How? That was the first thing that escaped my mouth as I looked at Sarah, as if she suddenly grew another head. She then proceeded to explain to us and show us her research and the records of numerous trial and error she carried out. Not just me, but even Banner was impressed with her intelligence. I mean, I knew she was intelligent, but not this intelligent. Why is this such a freakish thing? I don't know, maybe it's because she just cracked one of the scientific mysteries concerning the mutant race. The only thing that made my non-existent heart calm down in its crazy rhythm was that it wasn't permanent. For some reason she still was yet to figure out, she couldn't fully suppress the last pair of chromosomes as it slowly reverts back to the X gene over time. You really outdid yourself this time Sarah. You could even win a Nobel Prize if you make your achievements known and publish it as a thesis. I said after trying multiple times and finally managed to get over the fact that my employee just created a mutant cure, although a temporary one. Well as much as that is the dream of anyone who majors in the sciences, I'm afraid I can't push this out to the public. Least of all right now when everything is tense. She said with a disgruntled expression before looking in my direction and scoffed. What? You really don't think I was actually thinking of putting this out there and letting the government have unbridled access to it, right? Well, it's not as if it was such an outlandish thing to expect. If word of this got out, the situation with mutants will become a hundred times worse overnight. I don't even want to think of the rubbish and retarded reasons they'll give just to force the administration of this serum to any mutant who made the wrong decision of signing the registration. So what are you going to do to the research? I asked her. Well, it's all saved up in my head, but we should upload one in yours as a safe backup. We can delete the original data, and I'll just continue from where I stopped and try to unravel the mysteries of the X-Gene. I couldn't help but have a newfound respect for Sarah and her decision to shelve something monumental like this. She was throwing away something countries will actually go to war for, and that was no exaggeration. Banner looked at her in fascination as he couldn't believe she would just throw away a breakthrough discovery like this, because he knew without even needing to look deep down, that if he were in her shoes, he wouldn't have given up his research for anything. After all, it was that same stubbornness that made him into the monster he was today. I understand what the both of you are thinking of, but I assure you I don't need to think much about it before making my decision. She said with a small smile as she looked at me. My daughter is still a little girl and a mutant at that. I'll be damned if I contribute to destroying her childhood with this. With a reasoning like that, I don't think I have anything else to say otherwise. I said with a wry smile, 
understanding a little bit about why the decision came easy to her. Well, if that's all then I'll be taking my leave. See you guys later. Upon leaving Sarah's lab, I received a text that just made my day progressively brighter. Raven, got something you will want to take a look at information successfully downloaded proceed to assimilate. Yes, with a mental command, a block of foreign data was added to my steadily increasing pile of knowledge. So Shaw and Buckman have recently started working together on a secret project. Huh, what are the odds? It's times like these that I regret not reading much of Marvel Comics, because apart from knowing some of their names, affiliations and moral alignment, I knew nothing else about these people. People like Shaw, Celine and Emma were the ones I knew of to an acceptable degree, as they were prominent characters in the franchise. But apart from being stupidly rich, part of the Hellfire Club, and doing some shady deals that all successful businessmen do, what else was he? Well, it doesn't matter as Raven already picked him as her target, and she's doing well so far. But I guess that much is certain given who she is. Her ability was specially tailored for blending into any environment after all. Now then, what am I to do? There are quite a few things that require my attention. But I think I can have some fun at the expense of Buckman. Pull up a list of all known companies under Edward Buckman's ownership, sponsorship and shares. Even if I know I can't get all of them, the ones I have access to should be more than enough to drive him mad with despair and disbelief. The first thing I did after I got my list of Buckman's lifeblood was to first ascertain which one held the most potential and was probably a long-term investment. I don't want to sink him at once and leave him scared of death, no. What I wanted was for him to despair as he slowly drowns, bit by bit, and by the time he finally realizes that he is at death's door after fighting for his life. Then, and only then will his eyes open to see that he has already lost everything while fighting for his life. It's nothing personal, it's just good business. As I walked through the hallway, I contemplated on what sort of approach I should use when dealing with Buckman. Start small, aim big. Maybe go hard or go home. There wasn't much to consider given what I wanted to do so maybe I don't really need modus operandi. Haphazard chaos for the win it is. Since some of the others are out dealing with all the annoying complications that keep crawling up at every second. I don't believe anyone will require my assistance in the time being. What's the first thing we can hit? Give me something small. Looking at the first option, I grinned and shot off towards the privately owned dock of Edward Buckman. I had half thought that this dock was perhaps a front for maybe drug or weapon trafficking, but it looks like I'm underestimating this Buckman. Some of the containers had extra layers to them, and Buckman used those special containers to trafficked organs. Mutant organs to be precise. Well, I'm not one to spit in the face of evidence. So at least his heinous crimes will serve for the greater good. Based on the location of the port, it was pretty easy to tell that this was one of Buckman's prized assets, since it allowed him to move almost anything unhindered. He was basically shipping anything he wanted from any continent due to the location of the dock facing the sea, and the obvious fact that he had the sea guards and mariners in his pockets. Despite his own organ trafficking, he allowed other of his business associates to use his docks for their continental trade for some royalties of course. So how do I go about destroying a port while also using it for PR? Aha! Uh -huh. I smacked my hands together as I came up with the most perfect plan for this scenario. 30 minutes later, Buckman's port was surrounded from all angles by police cars and helicopters. After performing a city chase for the apprehension of some rival gang members, who had no choice but to run towards any open route in panic. It required a bit of mental manipulation from me as I instigated two known criminal syndicates into an abrupt war, while also tipping off the police, so that they would be quick to act. Suggestions here and little manipulation there and I had half of the NYPD in hot pursuit of four heavily armed subs, which the criminals used to escape into the port for reasons unknown to anyone but me. Since what was supposed to be a closed and gang fight escalated into a citywide pursuit, the cops were forced to put on their mean pants and made a show of their power to the public as the whole city was watching them and they desperately needed good PR after the dwindling faith the public had of them after the recent mutant debacle. The port was indefinitely force closed and since it was part of the crime scene and location of an intense shootout, the police immediately put it under investigation and Captain George Stacy ordered his men to case the entire dock with utmost precision as he wanted to know why the criminals escaped here. And who would have expected it? A little mental nudge from me was all he needed to ignore all the phone calls he was getting from privately owned law firms, and even the chief of police, to take his men, and vacate the private property they were illegally searching. Minutes was all it took for them to start unnithing the hidden cargo of gun shipments, drugs and the icing on top. Hell, I even gave the public front row seats, as I also tipped off most of the news channel, who were currently circling around the dock in their helicopters, 
and transmitting it live to the citizens of New York. This is just the start. I went through all that trouble just to make it look like an unfortunate but natural case of a police chase gone bad, in order not to immediately tip Edward Buckman off that someone was onto him. I even made sure that one of the groups I used for this whole intricately designed ploy also used this particular dock for the weapons shipment. If one could be said to be a coincidence, then what a five. Edward Buckman POV an extremely angry Edward Buckman threw his glass of wine at the huge screen in his office, as he was one of the citizens who got a front row seat in watching the live event that was currently taking place in one of his privately owned docks. Fuck. He cursed as the matter became increasingly complicated, as those damn vultures had the gall to put his picture on their screen. After he was identified as the owner of this dock, everything happened too fast that he simply did not have enough time to react before it all came crumbling down in chaos. The last that are needed at this moment was to be in the spotlight in a negative way. He ignored his cell that was buzzing with messages, and picked up another one to make a few calls, as he knew the police were currently on their way to put him in custody as they had more than enough damning evidence and warrant to do so. Unfortunately for him, this wasn't the only thing he had to watch out for. Vision POV I smiled to myself at the perfect smoke screen I created, and in order to make it more darker and thicker, I made a phone call. You can start releasing those evidence pertaining to his publicly owned assets and companies. I am quite tempted to know how you got all that done so quickly, but I have a feeling that you won't tell me. Anyway, I will be holding up my part of the deal I didn't say anything else to her and let her do her thing while I focused on mine. Unfortunately for Buckman, while he has his hands full and his attention focused on wringing himself free of the net he was in, I will focus on making sure that he got more tangled in it as the investigation goes on. He'll burn himself out while thinking of a way to get out, only to find himself completely lost when he realizes that he's in a maze of his own doom. In the next few days, Buckman will be plagued with unending series of misfortune as a lot of companies and businesses he is involved with will shortlist him and vote him out due to the numerous charges that will soon be placed upon him once Raven starts uploading the lists of his crimes that I managed to dig out. Since I don't want to passively wait for that to happen, I think it'll be best if I stir things up in the direction I want them to go. Raven Duck on POV Buckman wasn't the only one caught off guard by the recent development even Raven and her associate Emma Frost were. You said he had information on some of the members of the Hellfire Club, possibly all, right? Emma asked absentmindedly as her gaze remained transfixed on the hot news currently being headlined across numerous newscasting channels. Yes, was Raven's simple answer. The possibility of what this meant sent a chill shiver down Emma's spine. And even though she tried not to show it, Raven caught note of it. As the white queen of the Hellfire Club and also an accomplished businesswoman, naturally she wasn't a saint, and her hands were just as bloody. What made her wary was the thought of what would have happened had Vision targeted her first, instead of allowing Raven to pick. All it took was 45 minutes, and Buckman, with all his wealth and protection, found himself in police custody for a very damning case. And that wasn't even the end of it. It couldn't even be called the beginning after she was made privy to a few of the things Buckman had his hand in, that she was blissfully unaware of until now. Does he know we are working together? Emma asked after considering the thought for a moment. Raven paused what she was doing and thought of it. Does he know of my alliance with Emma? Probably, yes. At least that's the assumption I'm working with, she admitted. Faced with that blunt reply, Emma started making some plans of her own. After all, she did not want to be caught unawares like Buckman. I see you've been quite busy. Vision turned to look at Wanda who was leaning against the door to his room. Well, it had to be done at some point. Hearing his answer, Wanda nodded and noted that the Mind Stone was visible in his forehead, which meant that he was currently using it for something. So what next? She found herself asking. Seeing the apprehension of Edward Buckman on the news yesterday was all it took for her to know who was behind it. And now she wanted to know his next course of action. What some people don't understand, heroes in this case, is that heroes thrive during times of chaos and now is the most chaotic time as of recent. Seeing as she didn't understand what he was saying, he was forced to break it down a little bit for her. Despite how bleak the current situation looks, this is the best time, if any, for heroes and the heroically aligned vigilantes to be more active and try to change the public opinion as doing so will leave a more prominent mark now than if they were to do it on a normal day. Wanda more or less understood what he was saying. But what she didn't understand was how it correlates with what he was currently doing. What I'm trying to say is that the thing that will be most ideal in the current public is to take away their attention from going all to the guillotine on mutants and focus it on something else. Escape goat. 
I see you're catching up quickly. He said, impressed. And Buckman is just the first of many to fill out that role. Having gotten a general overview of what was most likely Vision's next course of action, Wanda asked. So what are you doing next? Easy, he said cheerily. Since the fire's already been set, we'll just have to wait for the smoke to drive out our targeted rodents. Wanda had a weird face after hearing what Vision said, and the person in question only raised a brow in inquisition. Somehow, all what you just said just doesn't seem like something a hero would say. Hearing her thoughts, Vision laughed, not out of mockery or because it was funny, but because of the irony of the entire thing. He walked past Wanda and gestured for her to follow and started speaking as she kept her pace beside him. The word hero and villain are very subjective, and mostly based on individual perception so the concept itself is flawed and complicatedly biased. He paused a bit and continued after seeing that she was paying attention instead of outright debating against it, he expanded further. But unlike the two previously mentioned concepts, the concepts that are not skewed or biased against are good and bad. Heroes are called that because they do good for the general public, so rather than trying to be heroic, I'll rather I remain being good. Helps put things into perspective and creates a very balanced moral line. One thing Wanda was quick to notice about Vision was that he liked making himself as clear and precise as possible when he spoke, which made most of the things that came out of his mouth when talking about specific things sound like an advice, sometimes even a lecture. Rather than a simple flowing conversation, she doubted it was something he did intentionally. So she just shrugged it off as another apparent behavioral feature of him being an AI. Perhaps because of Jarvis code structure, he does have similarities to Ultron too, except for the sarcastic retorts. That's a pretty good narrative, but you still haven't said anything about what you want to do next. Oh right, it seems I got carried away. Ever heard of the phrase strike while the iron is hot? Sebastian Shaw read the latest reports his associates had sent him regarding Edward Buckman's case, which had suddenly turned into a national lawsuit with multiple states, filing a case against Buckman. His face remained impassive as he read through the detailed and lengthy write-up that explained just what Buckman would be facing at a minimum. Even if he tried to weasel his way out of this, he would be scarred for life. I guess this is the end of your road, friend he said with a small smile on his face, before picking up the intercom on his desk. Send a message to the others. We have to discuss Buckman's case, and whether or not the club should interfere. Though he said those words, he knew just what those vultures would do, and the decision that they'll make concerning Buckman and he was all too pleased for it to happen. All the better since he knew more about Buckman's underhand businesses than anyone else, which meant that the larger piece of the pie will be falling in his hands, while everyone else will be scrambling for the crumbs he'll leave. You have to feed the wolves under the table after all. Not too much that will have the energy to take a bite at you, and not too little that they will starve and turn rabid on you. Because the Hellfire Club prioritized maintaining a low profile despite their wealth and influence, Buckman's little stunt gone wrong had a very high possibility of blowing their way, and if there was one thing elite businessmen hated more than anything was having to deal with someone else's trouble. He put out another call and gave out his orders as soon as the other end picked it up. Contact Buckman's lawyers. Tell them I have a business proposal for them. One they would rather not want to miss. And just like that everything falls into place. Wanda Maximoff POV even though I had first doubted it when he said so. That woman called Mystique really is something else. She has already managed to integrate herself into Buckman's life so seamlessly that the poor man couldn't even tell the difference between her and his wife. Literally. Guess shape-shifting and top-tier espionage skill sets really come in handy when you need it. Right now, I was currently going solo, raiding an underground storage facility where Edward Buckman kept some of his things. The problem was that there were quite a few of these, and he didn't bother specifying what was kept where. Which meant we had to manually cover the bases in case any of them turned out to be of any substantial importance. Hopefully this better makes the trip worth it. And of course, there just have to be guards and whatever that defective Ultron lookalike is supposed to be. Rich guys do spend their money on the most random things. I mean who else will spend millions just to guard an underground storage facility in the middle of nowhere? Getting past the perimeters was easy, but unfortunately that was where it all ended, as it turns out that I must have unknowingly triggered some sort of sensor that my abilities for some reason didn't register. The Ultron lookalike turned towards me and started spouting some robot talk that I have no time to pay attention to, since I was busy making a mental count of the people currently converging on my location. Sorry guys, it's nothing personal, but this is my first time flying solo on something major, and I can't afford to mess it up. The Ultron ripoff was already flying towards me, 
but I easily caught it in a telekinetic hold, and flung it to the side in favor of dealing with the multitude of armed mercenaries and mutants. For another I made the ground around them start sinking, in which started another panicking round of the usual warnings of careful, she's a mutant, as if it wasn't obvious from the start. Trying to create a little breathing space for myself, my eyes glowed red, and whoever was unfortunate to meet my gaze, immediately fell under my control. Regrettably I don't have Vision's level of telepathy and mind control, and the only type of command I can give them with these methods are simple ones, which was perfect in this situation. Kill each other. A simple order given was all I needed to give those ensnared under my gaze, to start attacking their own people. Turning the already chaotic place even more chaotic, two projectiles immediately hit the barrier I constructed around me with a resounding explosion, and the cause of the explosion was none other than the robot who for some reason, looks like I just became number one priority on its kill list. I fired two hex blasts at it, with the first one causing it to stumble briefly in its flight path and tanking the next one with a more balanced ease. Quite durable, huh? Before the robot reached within a few meters of myself, a red chain shot out from my palms, and wrapped around its neck, which I used to draw it faster towards myself. It did try to react to the sudden pull, and tried to grab me when I was within distance, only for my form to fizzle out with a red mist, as the illusion faded, only for the robot to be pulled directly into the ground, as if it was a viscous liquid. That should hold you for a while until I'm through with the others. I said before turning to the mess of the surrounding battlefield. Now that I think about it, it's been a few days since the last time we went night patrolling. I'll tell him we should hang out after this. Maybe bust down a few operations. Vision POV with Buckman having no way to escape the multitudes of allegations made against him. It was time for Raven to step forward and fit her place into the empty seat in the inner circle. I was a little surprised that she chose to impersonate Buckman's wife. But I didn't say anything to judge her way of doing things. It's not as if the woman in question was some sort of saint either. Since someone's seat could be inherited by a family member, no one would say anything about Buckman's wife taking up his seat, and some might even think Buckman was just using her as some sort of figurehead in a bid to secure the influence that came with being the White King. I guess the best thing about being a polymorph is being able to imitate the entire aspect of any living, being so things like Buckman's fingerprint, signatures, and even eye scan, were all easily accessible to Raven. As for his hidden caches and safe houses, as it was yet to be revealed that Buckman was putting his wife in his seat, the other seat holders at the table were going to do whatever they could to acquire as much as they could once they get the confirmation green light of Buckman's sentence. Luckily I foresaw that and already have Wanda and Petro once I got their location. The twins were the only obvious choice I had to get the job done quickly, and with less complications, which were all sold with Petro's speed and Wanda's all-round and all-purpose magic. I thought it wouldn't be bad to check out whatever he hid in those storages. While going through the files Raven and Emma procured from Buckman, I could not help but rub my temple, as I was once again left wondering what was with Marvel's bad guys, and cloning and genetic mutation in general. The first thing was obviously the project, Armageddon which Buckman was pumping a large part of his wealth into. This project, Armageddon however did not just focus on genetic mutation, but also had the bony framework of what would be the Sentinels in the future. Now I'm seriously wondering if maybe I let Buckman off too easily. This guy was clearly bordering on the realms of obsession and madness, with the way he became transfixed with the idea, and wholeheartedly supported it. But when I know who was behind the push that made him stumble till his eventual fall, I can't say I'm that surprised. Sublime. I mean come on. Not to mention that this guy just up and disappeared after Buckman's fall. So my virus containment plan will have to wait for later. But before all that, there's something I need to do. I was about to get moving, but I thought this might be the best time to gauge Steve's mental fortitude and also his most likely thought processes. So I went ahead and grabbed him for my little sightseeing. That and me and my dear old captain needed a heart to heart. Man to man. Anyway, I shot off towards the main coast where the island that housed the research and experimental facility for Project Armageddon. Steve just remained quiet while I had him under an electromagnetic field to prevent him from having a whiplash, while I kept breaking matches after matches, shortening the time I would need to get there. We are here now so do you mind filling me in on what you dragged me all this way for? Steve asked as we hovered above the island. I shook my head at him and just gestured towards the longest building on the island. You'll find out soon, let's go. With his shield strapped tightly to his arms, we dropped down on a tall building, and phased directly through the roof, and landed on one of the higher level floors, which was thankfully empty when we entered. Our destination isn't too far from here. Hold on for a second, 
I walked towards the door and touched the keypad, and from there I gained access to the digital network coverage of the entire island. I walked towards Steve and put my hand on his shoulders. Let's speed this up a bit. Before he could say anything else, the world around him spun, and this time we were standing in a very large warehouse-like space with people walking around, but none of them reacted to our appearance, because we were currently invisible. Seeing the look on your face, I'd say you already know what is going on or perhaps even familiar with it. No. Biologically engineered soldiers. His bland voice inquired. Biologically engineered mutant soldiers. I corrected. Congratulations Cap. The super soldier serum is no longer a prime coveted scientific miracle. After all, why settle for a strong soldier when you can have a stronger super powered super soldier? He surveyed the room and the people walking around, scientists and soldiers alike, before lastly turning to face me. Why did you bring me here, Vision? Tell me what you wanted to achieve by showing me this. It's simple, Steve. This cannot go on for much longer. Nor can the people who would do this. He frowned at my words and asked. You want to kill them all? A soft despondent laugh escaped me. But my gaze didn't move away from Steve for a minute. I only make sure to kill those directly involved with cases like these, and also the armed personnels. But no, I'm not talking about killing. He expressed his confusion with a straight how, and my answer to that was something I've been trying to make clear to him since day one. It's no longer about putting them behind bars. Killing is inevitable in our line of work, but the only caveat is as long as we know who to kill. We'll start laying everything bare for the world to see. And even if they escape using money or connections, we will put them back there regardless of what anyone says. We are past the point of caring about how they spend their words, as long as things like this continue, we'll do whatever we will to stop it. Public opinion be damned. We don't call ourselves heroes because we listen to what they say. We do because we know what we are doing is right, necessary. If we want to enforce the kind of change we envision, we continued staring at each other, but none of us budged a muscle under the stare of the other. Who will keep us in check then in the unlikely event that one of us goes rogue? He asked without withdrawing the intensity of his stare and my reply to that is a smirk. You have me, don't you? I think I'm more than enough to beat any of the others back in line. We both stared at each other before breaking off into a brief moment of laughter. His posture was a lot more relaxed and the heavy air around him seems to have lessened by a lot. Obviously he had also been thinking of something along the same lines as what I just said. That's quite the claim, but I'll hold you to it. He turned around and looked at the view playing right in front of us with a hurt expression. We need the others to make the same decisions as we do if we want for this to work. Of course. And on that note the case is temporarily adjourned. We don't have an operation to destroy after all. And this was just the prelude before all hell broke loose. The sudden appearance of two people in the middle of the most guarded place on the island spooked everyone as none of them knew they did it. Care to do the honors, Captain? Sure. He stepped forward a few steps and cleared his voice before making an announcement. Everyone please, for your own good and for my peace of mind, surrender. His words were replied with bullets pelting against his entire body. But none of them inflicted any amount of damage, as the empty shells all fell to the ground. Well, at least no one can say I didn't try. I think I might have made Steve a mobile tank because of the suit I made for him, with the way he jumped right into the free, and just started pummeling his way through unimpeded, without caring for how much he hurt them. And why should he in the first place? He was righteously angry, and if anyone who knew anything about him saw him now they would feel it too. If it's about making a statement then I guess we really need to make it memorable. Unlike Steve who was going berserk, I was calmly walking to the other side of his huge ass floor. I found something really interesting, so I wanted to verify it with my own eyes. I did not bother with the people that were trying to attack me, as they were quickly dealt pierced through with the electricity that was dancing around my body, while also being as thick as a fist. Upon getting to the place, I smiled a little and ruffled the raven black hair of the pale girl, sleeping on a medical bed with different pipes inserted inside her body. Seeing Domino sleeping peacefully despite everything happening inside this very same floor was actually a bit amusing. It made me wonder if her powers had anything to do with it, but that wasn't much of a concern at the moment. Apart from Domino, there were four other test subjects, which made me understand just how hard it was to have a successful experiment in new research. The place alone had burned over $5 billion in just the past year, and this alone, and yet they had nothing substantial to show where the money went except the equipments. Well up you go. Based on the time, it looks as if she was just a few minutes away from undergoing the same procedures she and the other four do on an almost daily basis. Ignoring the grunts and constant resounding booms, I went towards the place where the others were kept, and sure enough they all felt anxious and hopeful after hearing the sounds of gunshots and fighting. They all recoiled as they saw me carrying Domino, 
but the worry they felt was practically visible to me. Another timeline inconsistency. It's not like it matters anyways in the first place. The doors to their cells opened, but fear still had them rooted to the group, trembling to even take the first step of the freedom they dearly hoped for. Are you guys going to move your legs or spend the whole day moping around? They flinched and we all just stood there looking at each other until one of them gathered enough courage and came out of the cell, and like a magnet in a bucket of pins. The rest practically flew towards him and stood there while waiting for me to lead the way. It was a simple gesture, but seeing how I remained patient with them until they suppressed their fears, released the trembling and fear that had been draped over them like an overpriced Italian silk. Let's not dally any longer and leave. You guys good with that plan? They all nodded timidly, while two of them yelped as they heard the sound of something exploding. With a snap of my finger, a translucent barrier covered all of us, and that immediately switched, or rather lessened it to a greater degree as they now watched in awe the scene of Captain America America in his way through the whole base, as if he had a bone to pick with everybody. I think these kids just found their idol with the way all of them had their eyes glued to the destruction he was wrecking, without giving one shit about who was on the receiving end of it. Captain America, I heard one of the kids mutter under his breath, but I said nothing and just directed them to a safe corner, and we watched Steve wrap up his fight with half of this floor destroyed which made no sense whatsoever. Since the guy didn't have one speck of special ability, he was a little surprised to see the kids around me, and also a little awkward when he realized they were probably watching his fight for time, prompting him to glare at me. What can I say? Even though those fists were rated 18 plus on a normal day, it still was fun to watch. Are they? Yeah, I see. He said with an understanding look as he hung his shield on his back. Well, let's get out of here. I was about to nod and make a plane construct, just for the sake of easing their mental strain, only for my senses to register the camouflaged aircraft that just landed on the island, with a group of peculiarly dressed people, making their way over with haste. We got incoming. I said and continued as I saw Steve about to pull out his shield for a round two. They are not hostile. And only then did he relax a little. Seriously, this guy needs to chill. I looked at Steve, silently asking if we should meet the new arrival, after connecting one of the island cans to the HUD in his suit, allowing him to identify them from my database. It wouldn't hurt, right? I just shrugged nonchalantly, and we then started making our way downwards to the base floor of the rather large building. On our way down, I curiously eyed the five kids with us, even the one pretending to be asleep in my arms, and made a note of how they seemed to be taking the death they've seen in a more composed stride. Sure, they were irritated by the blood and gore, and some even felt their skin crawl upon seeing broken bones and spewed guts. But they managed it well, and tried not to focus much on it. As for the approaching group of X-Men, while it might have been something I would have looked forward to a while ago, spending some months in this world and also as Vision, let's just say that I'm feeling quite passive. Hum, talking about perspective, let's try a more extensive approach. 376 mine partitions have been created so there are still 376 people alive on this island. Perform a mine sweep and highlight those that fall under the irredeemable tag. I felt a few mines having some sort of mental defense, but for once I did not bother with the limits I've been putting on the mine stone, and effortlessly broke through them, and let the partitions scan the minds of everyone present here. I'm well aware that I can't create a bloodbath here, but that doesn't mean I should always limit myself because of that. 202 individuals fall under the tag irredeemable well, most are hired weapons and a few deranged scientists, but the numbers are honestly not what I was expecting. I sighed and turned to Steve and gave him a simple number. 202. He looked a bit indecisive for a moment, but at the end, like me, just sighed and got to work. He's already gotten the, the information and location markers he needed from me, and the X-Men downstairs. We're actually doing a good job taking care of some of them, so he just had to start thinning the herd from our side as we go lower. Which was also the reason why I didn't just carry everyone out of the building. Why am I leaving Steve to handle the heavy lifting? Apart from his sense of duty and willingness to bear a burden, with me keeping an eye on the children will ensure that their safety is completely assured. Under Steve's charge and some assistance from me, we made our way to our destination without having any time lag as every hostile we came across was swiftly dealt with. The moment we made our appearance on the floor the X-Men were currently fighting on, the room fell quiet as the remaining handful of armed men suddenly found themselves in the middle of two very scant, yet absurdly powerful group of superpowered individuals, and made the sensible decision of laying down their weapons without me even making the mental suggestion. I could feel the relief from them after they confirmed the safety of the kids behind me. 
before they turned their attention to me and Steve, with their introduction following prompt. Hello, my name is Storm, and these are my colleagues, Beast, Wolverine, Colossus and Cyclops. She said and gestured to the rest of the team as she introduced them. Steve Rogers. Vision. Ours was a little reserved, but that was the only thing we had for any kind of introduction to give. Most people, if not everyone, knew Captain America's true name and mine was just what it was. Maybe I should try getting a civilian identity. Hum, could be useful. Do you mind if we take a bit of your time? It's about the kids. She said while directing a glance towards the children causing them to flinch a bit. I already knew where this was going. So I just looked at Steve and nodded. We followed beside the X-Men as we left the building before coming to the place where they landed their aircraft. The sight of which caused the rather gloomy children to appear stunned as they beheld the specialized aircraft of X-Men. Are these them? Steve whispered as we followed the group, stopping as they reached their named craft Blackbird. The Avengers weren't completely out of the loop in respect to knowledge about certain things, one of which concerned the existence of the group of mutants in front of us. Yeah, probably here to take the children. Well, that was their MO, and to be honest I'm a little glad they did. The compound was not yet specified to take care of children, so there was no way we could efficiently look after them. Not to mention that the only one in the compound close to their age group was Laura, and she wasn't the best talker around. At least with the X-Men I can trust them to actually look after the children and give them the semblance of a childhood rather than letting them stay in a militaristic environment like the compound. The children were at the side getting checked by Hank, with Scott helping him out, while Aurora and Logan asked to talk to us for custody of the children from the base. It's not that I doubt your intentions, but can I at least see where you'll be taking them to? Steve said. It's not like we have much of a choice. We can't babysit and provide enough emotional and mental support for children like them who have been through a lot. But that doesn't mean we are just going to give them to an unknown group. At least for Steve and the others. Aurora wanted to say something. But she paused, and from the telepathic wave I felt emanating from her, it seems like Charles just contacted her. After the abrupt call from Charles, Aurora's mental tone changed from a defensive one to acceptance which let me know the decision they came to. It's okay. The professor said he'll like to meet the both of you. She said while giving me a side glance. Now, if you will please excuse me for the time being. She left and went inside the ship, leaving us with Logan who had been quiet since the beginning, possibly contemplating something. But he shook his head at the end and kept it aside. Leaving Steve and Logan, I went to check up on the children Hank was attending to. From the mental probe I did on all of them, I could tell that they all had some form of PTSD. Naturally, stemming from their time there and whatever experiment that was done on them. The only reason they weren't overreacting in panic to Beast giving them a medical checkup was probably because of Steve's and my nearby presence, mostly Steve. It didn't take long to wrap it up, and by that time everything they needed or wanted to do in the base was already rounded up, so boarded their jet that took us to the Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. Honestly the first impression I had of the estate was less of a school, and more of some 1800s castle. Sleek. When we alighted the plane, there was already a small group of three waiting for us at the hangar, which consisted of the proprietor of this establishment, a young Jean Grey and Lance Abbas. Professor, I nodded towards Xavier, followed by a handshake from me and Steve. As you must have already known, my name is Charles Xavier, and welcome to my humble school. He said fluently before gesturing us to follow him. Please this way. I believe we have a fruitful discussion ahead of us. Following Charles, we entered inside the manor with Charles directing us and exchanging some perfunctory words along the way. We saw some kids hiding behind doors as they spoke with excited hushed whispers at the image of one of the countries, the world's most iconic hero walking through their halls. See that? You're a celebrity, Steve. I chuckled, my words drawing a weary smile from him. He really wasn't comfortable with the celebrity status his identity gave him. Well, I think I can say for all of us that the actions of Steve Rogers was something we've all heard at some time growing up. Charles said as got to the spacious office that had a touch of old air and subtle modernity. It was quite a welcome surprise when we heard that he somehow managed to survive through the years. I was about to say something when I noticed that Jean was making a confused face which I took note of, but wasn't going to question it. However, it looked like someone had something to say to me about it. Um, mister, looks like I might have to come up with a civilian name. Vision. I replied Charles. Mr. Vision, would you mind suppressing your telepathic dome? It's making my student quite a bit uncomfortable. Charles said, making me understand what was going on. It was some sort of passive telepathy that I always had on and one I used for accessing the moods of the people around me. It's something I never had to worry about since, well, none of my teammates were telepaths. But looking at Jean now and also seeing how her own telepathic signature was struggling to stay firm, 
made me realize a function of it that had never bothered me before. It was actually suppressing her telepathy. Hell, she couldn't even use her basic empathetic powers. For a young telepath like her, it must feel as if her eyes suddenly had foggy vision. I said nothing and withdrew my telepathic presence, and just let it wrap around my body before turning to Jean with a slightly apologetic look. Since we've gotten that little hiccup out of the way, what is it you wanted to discuss with us? I said, so far I haven't seen anything about the man that'd make me want to keep him at arm's length, or have a negative opinion on him. Hearing my question, the man in question smiled a little and started with a thanks. First of all, Thank you for rescuing those children. It's unfortunate that something like this is happening, especially to children. Cons of being a human, I guess. As unfortunate as it seems, he said weakly. But that aside, I wish to know the stance a group like yours have on the issue on ground. From what I understand, you refused the signing of the registration. Why? This time it was Steve who answered with a calm voice and even tone. It's made solely for their benefit with little care about people who are to sign up for it. I see. He then looked at me, and you. I don't know what he's playing at or what he's trying to look into, but at least he's being honest with his question. I can tell that he really wants to hear what we have to say. But while I can read a little into his intentions, I can't read his mind as brute forcing my way into it was out of the question. Who knows whether I might turn him into a vegetable. Nothing big. It just looks like a poor attempt at hiding a stupid prank. I said and reclined ever so slightly into the chair and took a good look at the people in the office. The bad thing about this is because the mutants don't have a public voice. An advocate of sorts. That brought out wry smiles on their faces since what I said was true. Sure, there were some mutants who made themselves public and tried to stir the public opinion towards them by defending that mutants were still humans. A good endeavor. But the problem is that their voice is not loud enough to reach the people that need to hear it. Quite a conundrum, isn't it? Charles murmured. It's not exactly something that needs a genius pointing out as someone who had the faintest idea of politics. Can easily paint out that great flaw. Unfortunately for Charles and Eric, it was something they weren't. Even though Charles was vocal about his support for mutants, and also the numerous petitions he's put forth for the consideration of his kind, he still didn't have the required voice to stand against the lawmakers. As for Eric, no matter how you look at it from a neutral or human standpoint, his actions let much to be desired, as he proudly hung the brand of the world's most dangerous MAN highly debatable, and terrorist on his head like a crown. Anyway, thank you for your time and also answering my questions, he said, but both Steve and I waved it off. Now that that is out of the way, I want to assure and also assuage some of your worries about the safety and well-being of the children. You can also drop in to visit from time to time and check in on them if you want. He said while wearing a good-natured smile on his face. Steve on the other hand wasn't placated with just that, and I could tell that if not for the inadequacy on our side, he would have taken the children with him. Fortunately for him, he wasn't someone who enjoys the idea of child soldiers. I see, then I'll tell you in advance if I want to stop by. He said in all seriousness which took Charles by surprise, but the elderly man composed himself very quickly and replied with a simple, sure. The rest of the talk were mostly inconsequential things until we excused ourselves to leave, but not before meeting the kids we rescued. Jean kept sneaking glances at the both of us, while leading us to the medical lab, where Hank was doing an intensive checkup to figure out if anything was done to them after all the experimental procedures they went through. Well, you guys will be staying here for the time being, but don't worry. They'll take very good care of you. I said with a hand on Domino's shoulders while patting the head of the boy near her. They were already teens, intellectually sharp but emotionally imbalanced. I looked at Domino with surprise, since I could feel the way she trusted me and actually wanted to leave with me. It was rightfully surprising to me since it's only been a few hours since we met each other. It could be for a number of things, but unfortunately for her, I think it's better if she stays with them here and learns how to socialize once again with society. Don't worry, I might drop in sometime in the future to check up on you. Don't know when though, so fingers crossed. I said and she actually gave me a full smile. Gotcha. Her trusting mine might be because of her abilities which I have no idea why it works. Or maybe she's just like this. Who knows? Wanda care to explain what I'm currently looking at? I asked with a few twitches as I looked at the piece of metal she just dropped in front of me. Wanda who was standing beside me showed a flash of irritation as she looked at it. An Ultron bot on steroids. I don't know. But it was incredibly annoying to deal with it as it kept trying to stand up. A sentinel. An undeniably old model but a sentinel nonetheless. Seriously? 
Why can't every villain in this world just pop in some chill pills every now and then? Were you able to find anything else? Just some research materials and harvested organs. It is surprising how disgustingly low some people can go. Well, you're not exactly wrong about that, my dear. But most of these things were out of Buckman's control. He's by no means innocent. But there's undoubtedly someone, or more precisely something, behind his actions. Everything so far just has the shadow of Sinister and Sublime, and while both were tricky opponents, Sublime takes the cake. How does one even go about finding a bacteria? I stopped for a moment to read the message Raven sent about her getting the seed of the White King. I bet Shaw would have been quite furious, but I'll let it stew in for now. As for the Sentinel, at least they were smart enough to make this one run on automated directives. If I had been the one who fought it, then I would have found out where it was sending its backup logs to. Everything that can transmit any ounce of data in this thing has melted or is broken. Was Petro? I asked since the speeding youth was nowhere around the compound. He said he wanted to hit one or two extra bases if he finishes early. Wanda said before pulling out a chair and sat in front of me, observing all my actions. Do you need anything Wanda? She only made a hand that left me oblivious to what she meant, and kept watching me rip apart the robot in front of me, to see if the level of upgrades it had were anything I can gain from. You are going to watch me work the entire time. I said, pausing to give her a brief look before focusing on what was in front of me. It's not like I have anything better to do. I smiled at her words, letting the amusement I felt be known to her. You are making it a little too obvious. You know that right? I half thought she'd take it back or maybe even make her intended thoughts clear. But she simply squeezed her lips in a cute way before shrugging. A little isn't bad. That's a straight ball if I've ever caught one. A well-appreciated sentiment on my part. I didn't say anything else, and since she said she likes seeing me work, I left her to her own amusement and masterfully took apart the Sentinel. Time passed slowly as I focused mostly on the Sentinel, though I was unable to discern anything useful from it, leaving Wanda watching me the entire time even after Petra came and left. A bust. I nodded before compressing everything to the size of a football, and throwing it to the recycle bin, and then turned to the red-clad lady waiting on me for quite some time now. Yeah! And now I'm free to further notice. I said as I morphed my clothes into something comfortable. So, got anything in mind? Wanda and I spent the next few hours terrorizing the criminal elements of New York, and also driving further the modern myth of the witch and the man. Honestly at this point, we just kept continuing doing it not to let out some steam, but to have a few laughs at the expense of some poor sob. I mean, it's a date. No one is saying it. But anyone, even with a dumb brain, will know that this was just a date. Plain simple. The only difference was that instead of having fun at a restaurant or going to the movies, we had our fun with making criminals scream and pass out from fear. Her magic too was coming very handy. It was already leaving the realms of just hex blasts and constructs too now affecting matters of different states. It has started getting absurd to the point that even when I'm referencing from my entire bank of data, I am still stumped in trying to explain how she does most of the things she does. Maybe I should start thinking of paying the masters a visit, since I was sure that Wanda wasn't going to go crazy anytime soon, or even in the future. I want to help her with her magic, and what is the best way to do that other than having her learn from the Sanctum? She already has the potential of the Sorcerer Supreme and more in spades, so I'm sure whoever is heading the Sanctum at this time will help her out a lot. Having Chon's avatar and prime successor as one of their supporters is a flex as big as any even when taking the wider Marvel multiverse into play. How many now? Wanda asked as we made our way inside a cash slash drug house which was a site we've gotten used to by now. 17. I said with a whistle as I tallied the amount of liquid cash in this place to be a little over 15 million dollars dollars. These crime lords really do have some serious money. What do you expect? Wanda said offhandedly with her hands and eyes covered in an eerie red glow. People spend a lot of money on things that give them pleasure. That's why porn industry's worth is the same as the world entertainment industry. I could see the sneer on her face as she said that while looking at the group of girls dancing naked on platforms with money thrown at them at the crackheads. That all had more than one lady in their arms. I guess I can understand that in context. I said with a dry chuckle narrowly avoiding the cold eyes that were about to be sent my way. So, your call. It's not as if there's any merit in leaving them alive, she said. I went to the bar and sat there before tapping on the board to call the barkeep. Sir, two shots of death in the afternoon. He nodded and went to mix the rather ironic drink, when taking what was about to happen here in the next few moments. I could already feel a few eyes on me due to my unfamiliar face. Given that I just materialized when nobody was watching, 
and was now ordering a drink in a gang-exclusive cash house. Or, Cabron. I turned to look at the two people behind me with guns in their hands, looking me dead in the eye. The boss is calling you. They said while tilting their head in the direction of a man who was having his dick blown, raising a cup in my direction with a smile on his face. Sure. I took the two drinks from the table and made my way to the boss. This was all just Theatrix's wonder and I quickly figured out that just running through base after base made it a little stale. And since we were trying to have fun, a little role play could spice things up for the next three minutes. And I also get to have a drink in a crime den. That's a double check for me. I ignored the crowd surrounding me and the room that suddenly fell quiet and sat in front of the man who at least had the decency to keep his dick in his pants. No points for him though. Two questions. Who are you and how did you get in here? He said while dropping his firearm on the table while everyone else cocked their gun at me. With the same gait at ease, I shifted the gun's nozzle facing me to the side and set down the two glasses in my hand. Two answers then, I guess. A man, and I walked in. The room fell silent as I set my cocktail. And just as the so-called boss was about to order them to blast me to high heavens, something splattered on the ground and sprayed the others with a red sticky liquid. Before one of them could let out a scream, someone clamped his throat and started vomiting both blood and intestines on his face, which scared the man into shock. E Baba Yaga. Seriously Wanda, that's Kinderdark. Sorry, I was trying out something new. Might bray so, then by all means, carry on. Do you know who you are messing with? My attention was drawn to the convulsing trembling boss who had a gun to my head. This warehouse belongs to the kingpin. I ignored him completely and focused on my drink. I don't know what type of horror Wanda was playing out in their eyes. Since I was using my abilities to cancel out any attempt at illusions affecting me. That, and I am not much of a fan of eldritch horrors. Those not affected were huddling at a corner and crying at the crazed actions of those unfortunate. It was magnified even more when they looked at my direction and saw the featureless face of a man drinking a cocktail mix. A minute and a half was all it took for the entire cash house to quieten down. I raised the other glass and gave it to Wanda, who had a little smile on her face as she took it. That's one of my cleanest work yet, she said with satisfaction as she looked at the clean cash house behind us without even a drop of blood or broken item. So this kingpin what's his deal? This is his third base we've run down. Forget about him. He's just some crime lord who has a lot of the city officials in his pockets. I said while waving off Wilson Fisk. I had more important things to focus on than giving significance to the oversized boss baby. Got anything else in mind then? I think I've had my fill of crime hunting. If you're asking, there's the Order of Sorcerers I think we can visit to help your magic or put that off for another day. We could also drop by at the mutant school you wanted to take a look at. I threw out a few suggestions as we left the building the same way we came in. Sure enough, the NYPD was about to have another busy day. Despite my efforts in looking for sublime and sinister, I was unable to come up with any lead on any of them. Both were immortal mutants, with the other actually being a bacteria, with a penchant for behind-the-scenes manipulation, and a raging boner for making mutant lives miserable. I don't even want to entertain the idea of them working together sadly, that thought of mine was a 83% valid possibility. Buckman was still trying to wriggle his way out of all the accusations heaped on him, by trying to blame them on some of his proxies. But it only took me a few seconds of my time to add them to his downfall while also making sure that the media had no choice but to have it on mainstream, since his crimes were no longer against the state, but also a few countries where he ran his illegal activities. As far as I was concerned, he was gone. Even if he deceives the system by pulling a disappearing act after being sent to jail, I still had eyes on him. Raven was doing a good job acting as Buckman's wife, and even was giving Shaw some encrypted messages from Buckman. Emma Frost already had all of Buckman's lawyers under her thumbs, but none of that concerned me. I don't care what the both of them do with their increasing power and influence, as long as it doesn't damage the society even further. Just Buckman's arrest alone halted a lot of drug and illegal firearms activities and trades along the East Coast, and Mystique was even receiving threats to reopen those docks once the case died down. As for sure, while he didn't head a lot of companies, he sure had a lot of shares in a multitude of business conglomerates, which includes but not limited to Stark Industries. Hammer Technologies, Oscar, and even a few of Emma's companies, except for Frost Pharmaceuticals. It looks like Emma made sure he didn't have any sort of power in any of her company. Looking at the topics currently spanned across headlines reassured me that I was currently on the right path. Instead of mutant hate propaganda and censored mutant persecution videos, 
The topic that was being discussed was the crimes and inhuman activities of the country's elites, islands, hidden research facilities and even public companies that ran illegal mutant and human experiments. There was no way they could sweep something like this under the rug when a lot of people have already taken their placards and banners to the streets in protest. They don't even have the time to push the registration bill, talk less of sanctioning heroes. Check and check. Movement detected hum. I pulled up the abrupt notification and imagined my surprise when I saw the same biotechnological slash digital presence of the same technopath. That blocked me from accessing Magneto's contact from Mystique's phone. Is Magneto moving? An expected outcome, but not a welcome one. Hopefully he's the reasonable sort. I know the guy's a villain through and through, but his cause for the path he took was because of his mutant brethren. I am hoping he still has a smidgen of that pure passion hidden somewhere in his cold iron heart. The last thing I want is for an agofuel Magneto to throw a wrench into the plan I have for the mutant community of this world. Give him a light tracking. I want to know where his streams of data are going. Since I don't want them to know I'm already into them, I want to keep track of every single cyber action they take and try to figure out what they want to accomplish with their sudden movement. Clearing the notification of the undergoing task. I start thinking of what to do now. Since my plan with the club is steadily progressing and I also have an eye on whatever it is that Magneto is planning on doing. Maybe I can finally divert enough attention to accomplish one or two of the ideas I have on pending. Let's review all I know concerning the quantum realm. With that, I spent the next few hours going over everything I know, and also making a few calculations of mine in respect of the topic at hand. Laura and Davis came to check on me, but I waved them off since I was currently busy as the importance of this subject was one that will help me a lot, not just individually, but also help with the portal station I have in mind. Unlike the Watchtower from DC, I have no plans of putting a base in the cold expanse of space. I very much like the scenery down here. Thank you. From my understanding, since I have it on good factual ground, that the quantum realm is both the physical and metaphysical nexus of all material universe in this multiversal reality, and it acts as its own individual reality space, where its influence and laws eclipses every other universal space. It means that I can use it to access every spatial point in this universe. At least with a higher chance of precision on Earth. Thor and Rakeen used it to go to Asgard in the Infinity War movie, which means that it's my sure ticket to deep space travel, and also jumping through universes. Maybe even multiverses. The possibilities are practically endless when it comes to the quantum realm. Hank Pym must have been on some serious shit when he came up with the Pym Particles because the possibilities of it and the avenues it opens up is not something one can think of in a normal mental state. That man must have been oozing something heavenly in the 60s. In my own personal opinion based on my experiences so far, the Pym Particles should be one of scientific marvels of any universe it exists in Chizofark. Reviewing everything related to the Quantum Realm reminded me of Hank's wife still lost in the Quantum Realm, and highlighted the threat of Kang. If there's one person apart from Doom that I don't want to face until I fix my energy deficiency issue, then you can bet your last cent that it's Kang. And not just any Kang, but Kang the Conqueror. Just the amount of technology accessible to any one of them makes them a frightening opponent. These guys have rolled over multiple iterations of the Avengers, Fantastic Four and even the X-Men. So yes, I'm not that arrogant and ignorant of the kind of threat Kang's possesses. Since I don't have a coordinate to navigate the quantum realm like Scott and the Pims did in the movies, which is a result of my intervention that didn't allow Scott the choice to quantum dive to stop Darren Cross, I will have to manually search for her, and hopefully not run into Kang, because if there's anyone that knows more about the Avengers, which includes me and other versions of Vision, and the Infinity Stones, then I can bet my rare or ass 100% that it's Kang. Honestly, this endeavor was already piling up more cons than it's worth, and even if I'm overreacting, I still have it on good ground, that it's not entirely out of the realm of possibilities. Definitely not when an overlord with a multitude of conquered universes under his belt, and is actively seeking to conquer the multiverse is involved or whatever it is that their deal is. I'm not overreacting, right? Am I too cautious of Kang more than he's worth? Based on notions and information, both factual and assumptions, extreme caution is needed when quantum diving. Any instances of making contact with the individual known and identified as Kang the Conqueror is extremely advised against and there it is. This is as humbling an experience as any. It really drives home the point just how dangerous this world is. I haven't even seen the guy, and the results from referencing the guy to a threat level has been rethinking my actions. The main problem is not just the fact that I might face Kang, but also the fact that I'm Vision. While there's no doubt that I'm different from what this Earth's Vision was supposed to be, that doesn't mean that I'm that much different from other iterations of Vision, specifically strength-wise. Well, hopefully I don't run into the guy. 
I pushed my dreary thoughts away from Kane, and focused on the part that is under my influence, and on that same topic Avastar alias, Ghost Affiliation, Shield Special Operative Agent Operating Field, Assassination and Espionage Special Attributes, Temporal IMBALANCE Molecular Deconstruction Just Another One of Shield's Numerous Sins. Based on the information I got from her profile on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s database, and that of her foster father, Bill Foster, it can be plainly deduced that she's running on fumes, and her molecules are breaking down at a hyper-rapid rate as long as she keeps using her abilities. Temporal imbalance, huh? At the rate she's breaking down at, sooner or later she will break down to the point where she permanently merges with the quantum realm, which will undoubtedly erase her consciousness since there's no way her human brain can comprehend the vastness and peculiarities of the quantum realm. Maybe if I study her and her abilities my understanding of the quantum realm and my quantum shifting ability will increase. I said and stood up before grabbing the mind stone from where I had it running some tests. The stone sank into my hands and started circulating my body in a bloodstream-like pathway which I recently designed. I grabbed my overcoat and threw it over my shoulder and walked out of my workspace with a task in mind. Time to talk to a ghost. From her logs and the digital stamp on her credit card, Arva Star was currently having a few weeks off from any assignments and was on her way back from grocery shopping. I let myself inside her apartment and sat down in an obscure corner and dimmed the lights a little, even going as far as bending away the excess light coming in my direction. The doors were unlocked and she walked in with hurried steps, hungry, but as soon as I sensed that she was about to change her clothes, I decided to speak. No perverted scenarios for this android, I'm afraid. Arva Star. Definitely not the scream I had half expected as she currently had a gun to my head with a knife in her other hand. Who are you? She asked while slowly flicking on the lights to illuminate the whole room, all the while not even blinking for a moment. Not how I got in here. I asked as I crossed one of my legs across the other. Why not just approach her like a normal person? Well, I just felt like it. You're already inside and it's also easy to pick a lock. She replied calmly, fingers just a little push away from triggering the gun in her hand. I won't repeat myself. Who are you and what do you want with me? Without beating around the bush or any further theatrix, I answered her and gave her a brief rundown of my reason for being here. My name is Vision. I'm a member of the Avengers and I'll keep it simple. I know S.H.I.E.L.D. hasn't been forthcoming in their promise of help, and that's exactly what I want to offer. She looked at me without showing a single emotion on her face for a few seconds before she replied. And how can you succeed where S.H.I.E.L.D. has not been forthcoming? Because unlike them, I don't have that much on my plate, nor will I give you a single excuse for 10 years. And I also don't think that I need to convince you of what exactly is your worth to them. I laid it on the table as plain as anybody can put it, and gave her the choice to make a decision. And what do you stand to gain from this? Do you want me to work for you instead of S.H.I.E.L.D.? To kill for you? She said as she took a few steps forward, her body vibrating through states as she did. Data. I need as much data as I can get from you. And no, I don't want you to work for me. I'll still help you since that's my offer. But whatever you do after is up to you. I answered her. The scientists of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Bill Foster had no idea what they were trying to do, which was the reason why none of them could help her to what she wanted, though the latter did do a good job on slowing down her molecular deterioration. If not, she would have been lost years ago. Why me? I reckon you could have found a mutant or two with the ability to walk through walls. Why me specifically? Now she was just a few feet away from me, unafraid probably because of her faith in her ability. Why you? Simple. I don't know who else suffered from a quantum wave that destabilized their molecular structure to complete shambles like yours. This was the reason why I needed her. I could have gone ahead and just shrunk myself subatomic. But if there was even a 2% chance of me increasing my knowledge on the elusive realm, then I'm taking it. Who said Kang's presence was the only thing I was cautious of in a quantum dive? I have no idea what kind of organisms and viruses are there, so I'm betting everything on increasing my chances of a successful quantum dive. How sure are you in helping me find a cure? She asked. Desperate. 100%. That or I'm 1 or 2% off. I said with confidence. Curing her was not a problem at all. What I wanted was how the chaotic way she exhibited her quantum properties. People like me or Kitty Pride have a seamless molecular deconstruction when we use our abilities. But in a way that was false, quantum shifting as the quantum realm itself was a chaotic void space. If she enters the quantum realm, can she easily navigate it by connecting with it? 
if she can safeguard her consciousness. These are the type of questions that I wanted a near practical answer to. About leaving S.H.I.E.L.D., you don't have to worry about them, as I'll make sure to take care of it on my side. So what do you say? Are you sure about this? Ava asked as I pushed her inside an enlarged capsule that I tweaked to read her molecular fluctuations, and just how loose her molecules are from their natural physical makeup. Yes, just bear through it okay. Well, obviously she agreed since this was something she's been looking for more than a decade of suffering from the excruciating pain she feels when her molecules start falling apart. As for how I'm going to cure her, let's just say I'm going to have to pull a Shang Tsung on her. I turned on the machine and started downloading the bits of data from every fraction second sequence her molecules underwent. Wavelengths, the individual known as Arvastar, is having her biological makeup being dragged between two different diverse vibrating frequencies, and since Earth's physical laws can be easily suppressed by those of the subatomic space, it's affecting her and forcefully and haphazardly breaking her apart, hence the pain. The current energy reading from her shows that she has no clamp on it except a forceful shutdown synchronizing your energy absorption. Electromagnetic manipulation and quantum shifting abilities will help you siphon the abundant chaotic quantum energy that she's saturated with of course, it's all wavelengths. Everything, material and immaterial, vibrates at their own specific frequency. And if you can vibrate at that frequency, you can achieve a similar state as the object whose frequency you are vibrating at. But with the infinite expanse of the different levels of the quantum realm, it was bound to have an exceedingly infinite range of frequencies, since it's formless, stateless, and the lack or unfettered effects of physical laws. But Arva was vibrating at a level that if care wasn't taken, forgetting about just being subsumed as part of the quantum realm, she might very well just become a part of every existing reality. She could go anywhere, anytime, in any state, to any point or aspect of the myriad universes connected to the quantum realm. She is a fucking walking, breathing and almost dead quantum boom tube, with a theoretically multiversal built-in map. The only downside to it, in respect to her, is that she just doesn't have the mental capacity to download all that spatial coordinates. She'll sooner fizz away into nothingness than register a single spatial coordinate. I opened the hatch of the capsule and caught her body from falling, and winced in pity as I felt the pain she was feeling, as she wheezed for air. Tell me you got what you wanted. The look in her eyes told me she wasn't taking no for an answer. Don't worry. I think I got more than what I bargained for. I said with a smile while helping her up. So, meaning it's time for me to fulfill my end of the deal. And it comes with two choices. The first being I'll help you tweak your ability so that you can easily control it. While the other being I take it away permanently. I proposed but she didn't even spend a second to think about it and made her decision. Take it all away, saying nothing else. I gave a mental command to start the process. Rerouting all excess energy in flux to the Mind Stone synchronizing energy absorption, electromagnetic MANIPULATION subset, and quantum shifting abilities together. The temporary fusion of the three abilities has produced a new ability, quantum siphoning Arva screamed in agony, as I fused my own quantum property energy with hers, and started siphoning all the abundant quantum energy she was drunk on. To her it probably felt like ripping open a decade plus scab wound. For the first time in forever, my head hurt from the sensation going through it, despite the fact that the Mind Stone was drinking up everything else I couldn't handle on my own. It continued like that for a while before everything subsided and simultaneously stopped with a sweaty, heaving and delirious ava in my eyes. Haha, <laughs> sorry about that. I said, apologizing for the pain she felt as I felt her tethering on the edge of losing her consciousness. I promise you'll feel better when you wake up. I placed her on a bed and fixed some drips into her before leaving to the other end of my workspace. Are we good to go? Affirmative proceed with quantum shifting. Hit me. Warm fires. My journey. If it could even be called that to the quantum realm was short, pun intended. More so to the point that I had to play it at steady repetition in my head in order to give everything I saw an analytical once over. Unlike the Ant-Man suit, my ability didn't shrink me at a decreasing pace. Instead, it was more like a downward hill slope. I just kept going until I hit rock bottom. Where the hell am I? The place I landed after shrinking down for who knows how long, or how short, looked as if it was a mishmash of the different seasonal cycles. It looked trippy as fuck. It was as dark as a starless night. And yet I could see very well, even without any aid. The laws of physics really took the backbench when it arrived here. Do you know how long we've been here? Negative it feels as if every single point of distance space in the quantum realm runs through different time cycles. It'd be best if time is calculated based on the individual, rather than the chronological flow of this dimension well. That's a bummer. I kept a stopwatch running just in case before flying in a random direction to see if I can pick up anything. I don't know how long it took me. 
but I had the sudden feeling that this place was alive. It was just a feeling, but it definitely felt like that was the case until I used the Mind Stone to confirm if my guess was wrong or right, which surprisingly didn't give me anything useful it couldn't exactly tell if the whole realm was sentient or not. Hopefully not. The reason I came here other than wanting to solve quantum travel and building a worldwide instant teleportation network and possibly hopping through universes was to see if I can find Hank's wife. I was already releasing a signal identical to that of the Ant-Man suit to see if anything could pick it up so I can backtrack to give me a direction, but so far nothing. No longer caring for the time I spent here, I started learning as much as I could about the quantum realm, given how it was some sort of nexus to all other universes. I was in the midst of pulling up sequences after sequences to find a way to power up a portal from the quantum realm to any point in my universe. But after another round of repeated failure, I finally felt something that was running its way towards me, and it felt huge. Like way too huge. It was some sort of rocky, fleshy, vibrating mass. That looks like something that came out of a cross-breeding session between a scorpion and a praying mantis. And it was then that I finally understood that I might have shrunken down even further and my size became more diminutive than I'd thought it was. Weirdly enough, it felt as if it was coming for me, and despite it having no eyes, antennas or any sensory organ that I could identify, it still paused and turned in my direction, before letting out an ear grating sound. That honestly irritated me so much so that I just blasted the thing to quantum dust or whatever. Maybe it was tracking me because of the frequency. I didn't think much and turned off the signal. Have I been broadcasting my location since I stepped in here? Hum, thoughts for later. I shot off in the direction that thing came from, since it's the only clue to any sense of direction I've gotten since coming here. I met a few more things. Some outright phased through any obstacle in their way, all coming for me. I didn't try to hide from them since I wanted to know where they were coming from, so I just blazed my way through those poor suckers. It was interesting to note that some of them actually melded partially into the ground after being killed. That's something you don't see every day. How the fuck did these things sense me all from wherever the hell they are still coming from? I asked no one in particular, which only stoked my frustration even more. If we were to go by Earth's time cycle, then I'm pretty sure I've been following their trail for over a day and a half now. But I still haven't found where they are coming from, or how they came or even aimed for someone from such a long ass distance. I got so frustrated that I started spamming my triggers every time I caught a glimpse of them from the never-ending horizon. Figured anything out about these critters yet? Negative biological signature tells that they're not alive. But since that is clearly wrong, it must be that we simply do not understand anything about the quantum realm, as it laws completely differs from human science. What about the fusers? We can classify them as energy-type organisms, right? I walked towards one of the carcass that had sunken halfway into the ground and raised my hand over it. It pulsated for a few seconds before it started breaking down and dissolving into some type of dark energy cloud, before being promptly sucked into my body. So that's quantum siphoning. I wonder what I can do with it. I can already quantum shift, and since the former is classified as an entirely different ability, instead of being tagged as a subset of the latter, then it has another branch of application that I simply haven't started using yet. Highlight any new feature that came with me absorbing whatever that was. Even with everything I know and my large computing power, trying to understand something one has no data and information on is almost impossible, of course, unless you're Reed Richards or his Wall of Descendant. Luckily for me, I am able to skip a lot of steps when it comes to analyzing and processing data and information. Let's try this. The Mind Stone hovered over my palms as I prepared to do something pretty stupid, or pretty wild depending on the preference of whoever cares. Instead of siphoning quantum matter as energy or even shrinking down to greater quantum degrees, I used the two aspects of quantum shifting and quantum siphoning, which was reducing distance and absorbing the quantum energy between these subatomic distances, and made them act on each other. The result was a swirl of a perpetually shrinking subatomic distance, within the very quantum energy that was directing it. Here goes nothing. I took a deep breath and let the Mind Stone get sucked inside, while also focusing all my attention on the connection between the two of us, waiting and waiting for something to happen, but it didn't. Nothing happened. Yes. Despite the ever-sinking feeling I was getting from it, the fact that I was 100% connected to it perfectly solved everything. With those two abilities, I can always draw whatever amount of power or energy from it without any lag, since I'm connected to it at a quantum level. Hopefully it works out well on the off chance that I get stranded in another universe. With that problem solved, a lot of my reservations bled out, so with the effect of those two abilities, I shroud myself with the same fog and then shot forward, but instead of moving at thousands of miles per hour, I actually teleported. Oh, I'm so going to love this. 
With the constant teleporting which I later found out was just the subatomic way of diffusion, involving me hiding or covering myself with quantum energy. And just let it permeate, and then reappear from wherever it permeates to. I don't think I can do this on Earth, but I'll be fixing that very soon. Under the novel experience of teleportation, I was quick to notice the conglomeration of different organisms thousands of miles away from me. You've got to be kidding me. This is not what I wanted in any way because what I picked up even without seeing it physically and just based on the energy readings that were definitely sentient and biological. Well, they were not the quantum noughts which means I'm currently heading towards the base of the rebellion. Do I want to deal with Kang? Fuck no. I actually want to avoid the guy if possible, since anything that puts me in his path means a future of unending troubles for me. Being a hero is damn hard. I wind up my wish to save Janet, since I cheated Hank of his chance to get his wife back. No wonder heroes are called trouble magnets. I just had to put my nose in where I had no business being. It was easy to single out Janet since she was the only human here, and was also the person I was looking for. Turning invisible, I dashed inside the vicinity of their hideout, and then shrouded myself in quantum energy for a short teleportation. That took me to her side, and before she could react, I whisked her thousands of miles away from the base after a few teleportations. Great, now I'm kidnapping her. Unfortunately, my thoughts were cut short when she tapped something which actually forced me to separate from her. Relax, if I wanted to kill you then I wouldn't have carried you all the way out here. This is going to take some explaining. You're a human. The old woman screamed with an excited shock after I told her who I was, and I was honestly expecting some heavy distrust. Well, kinder, I said with both legs crossed as I sat in the empty AIR space. Let's just say I owe your husband one so I figured I'd get you out since I'm here anyway. And that was basically the whole gist of it. With the Mind Stone safely stored away and my worries of having someone nullify its abilities has drastically lessened. She was about to answer, but then her face showed regret and indecision, and inwardly I was already hating whatever it was that she was cooking up in her head. Can I ask you for a favor? She asked. Depends. What is it? She took in deep breaths to calm herself down. I want to help them. Her voice this time was full of conviction, and it was then that I understood where everything went wrong. The time in here and the time out there were in a constant state of flux against each other. So instead of the Janet Van Dyne that readily left when the time to leave came, this one looked as if she was still knee-deep in helping their rebellion against Kang. Obviously this is not a good outcome, whatsoever. You could leave to see your family right now, and yet you want to fight a rebellion instead of jumping at the chance to see them. Why? I will give anything to see my family again, but I have to fix what I helped start. She let out a self-deprecating laugh before going on, and telling me about her and the whole Kang fiasco, which only served to confirm my assumptions. I just want to try my best to help them as much as I can. But correct me if I'm wrong. You said you destroyed this core he needed, so there's no way for him to leave the quantum realm. So there's no need to run it in his face, is there? She sarcastically laughed at that knowing fully well that Kang deserved any and every bad thing that should happen to him. I sighed upon seeing how she looked resolute in her decision, which only served to twist the net already twisted inside my stomach. Remember what I said about being a hero is hard, because of their tendency to poke their nose into things that they have no business in, turns out Janet Van Dyne is suffering from an exposure to it. I mean, that's how she got in here in the first place. As for me, simples. It's all a matter of plus and minuses. I don't know what's this whole deal with the Kangs is, but I don't want my timeline erased, because mini but actually bigger Thanos is the vengeful prick, and when he gets out in the future, he'll make sure to find Janet's timeline, and have her pay for double-crossing him. I'm extremely cautious in fighting Kang due to all his future tech, which is definitely better than anything I have. Energy manipulation. The dude's a master at it. Let's just get this shit over with. I looked at the smiling woman and urged her over before whispering under my breath. Should have brought Wanda and Petro along. We arrived at the base, and the people were immediately notified which ended with us being surrounded. But Janet managed to calm them down to listen to her explanations. They seem to have a lot of distrust against humans, which is understandable considering all Kang's actions against them and their home. Even though I could understand what they were trying to say, and I could easily read their intentions, so I knew when they were insulting me, and when they were rejecting my trustworthiness. But I said nothing, and just let them say what they wanted. From a third party point of view, their actions are all justified, since Kang did slaughter them by the droves, and force them out of their homes. Vision, these are Kryla, Jintar and Gwaz. I didn't have anything to say so I just nodded. The others cleared out, leaving only the four of us in a room, with Jintora being the first one to ask a question. Why did you decide to help us? 
You have no reason to help us, so why? I groaned at the question and stopped any of them before they asked their oil questions. The only reason I'm here is because of the grandma sitting over there. That's all. I'll help you deal with Kang as much as I can. Whatever that amounts to is something I can't promise. Kryla snorted at my words, probably annoyed at the laid-back tone I used. And how do you expect to deal with Kang? If Kang was that easy to deal with then we would have done that ages ago. And that's something I can do nothing about. Though I'd advise you to speed up whatever preparations you've had on the works. How are we even going to get past the barriers? Not to mention the hundreds of thousands of foot soldiers he has at his beck and call. Jintora said with gritted teeth as she glared at me. And do you think you can actually fight Kang? Don't misjudge your worth, human. With that she left, followed quickly by Gwaz and Ben Kryla who looked at Janet for a moment before exiting the room, leaving behind only me and Janet. They are right, you know. Janet looked at me and for the first time, I actually felt pain from her. Kang, he's too strong. Ever since he rebuilt his armor, he just destroyed everyone who tried to stand in his way. If you're that worried, I can go back up and bring a lot of people to help fight. I suggested, but she shook her head. Who knows how much time would have passed by then. True, I can't track the time in the quantum realm. I don't think anyone can. And there's also the fact that unknown years might have passed on Earth by the time I arrive, which was why I needed to learn how to navigate the time-space stream that runs through a specific section of the quantum realm. Then we make do with what we currently have. That was the only choice we had if we wanted to fight. I mean, the probability of losing is up there. I gestured to a height above my head, which made her let out a small dry chuckle. If you're so gung-ho about fighting, I take it then that you're a good fighter. I still have no idea what you can do. Her words died down as everything in the room floated up, including her, with lightning and light constructs dancing around. Don't worry. I'm pretty sure I can carry my own weight if it's required. I said and made everything disappear with a snap of a finger. And about getting past the barriers. I think I might be able to do something about it. So how about it? Want to give another go at it? This is easily the craziest thing I've ever done. I said while hiding in a quantum pocket and below me was the technological city of Marvel, Axia. Channeling a ginormous amount of energy from the Mind Stone. I started using my density manipulation to increase my weight to the limit I could and then increase my size with quantum shifting, further increasing my mass. Trying to plan a strategy around Kang was useless. So we went for the only thing we had a surprise attack. One Kang definitely didn't put in his calculations. Despite the energy buildup running through my body, I still deemed it not enough and used my electromagnetic manipulation to notch up my magnetic pull towards the ground. By now, it looked as if a sun was shining inside a very dark room, and without further ado, the sky split open, and a gigantic human ball was dropped right above the city of Axia. A magnetic field is being erected to negate the force you are currently exerting, which is enough to destroy the city. Would you look at that? Hacking attempts to break through city defenses are all unsuccessful well. That's Kang's empire's main control center. Makes sense that he'll have it heavily protected. Nearing the dome that was already laid and covered over two-thirds of the city, I smirked. Right before my body touched the dome, I disappeared once again and teleported past the barriers, now falling through a rapidly decreasing two kilometers, which continued for a few seconds, before everything became silent as I hit the ground. E -o 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 and less than. An atomic bomb went off as I released everything I was holding in, as I made contact with the ground. Kang the Conqueror POV he watched as the city he'd built from the ground up, one of many thousands, went up in the hot plumes of a mushroom cloud. For a few seconds, Kang stood stunned as the shockwaves crashed against his palace, and sent alarms blaring through this part of the city. At least the structures that still remain standing after the abrupt chaos. Identify the calls. He finally said to the nearby Quintumnauts, futuristic android sentinels, that were under his control. He watched the picture-by-picture -picture frame of the man that caused the explosion instead of the energy bomb he had thought was the cause. Energy readings, though slightly different, bears a 91% similarity to the bioorganic synthesoid known as Vision when ran across the database The Avengers. Kang snarled at the knowledge of the perpetrator and the likely reason they had for attacking. Scan the entirety of Axia for the presence of other members of The Avengers. No other member of the Avengers, aside from the identified Vision, is in the vicinity of Axia, so only that primitive machine and those rebelling ants. The irritation on his face faded away to make way for an unperturbed calm. I think it's high time I permanently curb these annoying insects. I think I can find one or two uses for an infinity stone. Purple armor pauldrons materialized over his shoulders, and the next moment he disappeared, his mind on only one goal. To show the terror of the Conqueror, 
The vision POV pulling myself out of the kilometer wide hole of my ground zero. It took me a few seconds to shake off the dizzy spell. That was currently doing a tangle inside my head. This was the first time I've ever generated such a level of destructive output since becoming vision, and I have to say that the feeling I got after regaining my bearings was as if I just took the most satisfying dump ever. It was just that damn satisfying. I have to say that I never expected to come across any of your ilk during my time here. I couldn't even bring myself to feel surprised when I turned around to find the all too iconic character known as Kang. The Conqueror standing behind me with arms held loosely behind him that and the fact that I wasn't getting anything from him. Not even when he appeared behind me. Well, what can I say? Arriving fashionably late is all part of the superhero gig and all that shit. I said with a shrug as multiple notifications fang out in preparation of the fight that was about to happen. You're different from the other visions I've met and killed. Every precaution and modes of attack are primed and ready fuck this monologue. And that was how Kang saw a giant fist covered in an electromagnetic barrier that smashed squarely against his face, further destroying the ground we stood on as he shot backwards like a punctured balloon. I didn't let any delusions go to my head in respect to Kang taking any substantial damage from that, so I teleported to the place he landed, knees raised for a stomp, but I completely missed as he disappeared, only for me to get blindsided by a bitch slap from an energy beam. What the hell was that? An unknown form of energy. Caution is advised as it appears to be immensely dangerous to be in contact with Yeah, You don't have to tell me about that twice. Whatever energy Kang was using was one hell of a buster as I could still feel the phantom pain even after the impact. Kang appeared before me, hands alight in whatever blue energy he was using, aiming to shower me in them. But a single metal command from me raised the molten metals under us to form a barrier between us. I also cracked up their magnetic field to deflect any sort of magnetic or electrical wave aimed at them. But Kang's beams to straight up, disintegrated them as if made up of bubbles, forcing me to teleport out of there. You attacked me unprovoked, don't resent me for aiming to erase your existence. I heard Kang speak, but I wasn't interested in hearing what he said. Shrinking further to a microscopic size, not that it made any difference to Kang's attention on me. I shrouded myself, and this time appeared under him. He immediately reacted to the punch that was coming, but tried to dodge it but he completely missed it as my enlarged hands appeared from a smoky portal at his side and punched him with a deafening boom. I was about to continue with a follow-up, but found myself stuck by some type of bounded field. Faster than I could react to what was happening, my vision became frazzled as some huge and painful crashed into my body. Warning, warning, warning. Damn, what's happening to me? Error notifications filled inside my head as I forced myself to stand up, despite the screeching feeling that felt as if my skin and bones were grinding against each other like metal. I hastily pulled myself to dodge another shot of that beam. I stacked multiple magnetic fields together in a pyramid sequence and punched at it without delay, causing a wave of superimposed magnetic frequency to shoot at Kang while obliterating everything in its path. I flew up into the air and shot a wide-range laser beam from my eyes as an overcompensation, but I could give two shits about things like that at times like these. A quick glance around the city showed me the chaos that was taking place in every sector of Kang's utopia as the rebels rushed in to face off against the unending wave of robots under Kang's control. Pushing those thoughts away, I channeled electricity through my whole body, causing it to cackle in yellow and blue lightning and dive towards Kang, who looked more pissed than hurt. That armor of his is such a cheat. He rushed at me, and the both of us collided midair with a sonic boom, pushing the other a good space backwards. But none of us relented as we both were upon each other again with punches, kicks and energy blasts to throw the other off. Even though my physical strength far eclipsed Kang's, and also my mobility, it meant nothing to him as he proved durable enough to shrug off almost anything, energy blasts and all. Trying to get into his armor was a laughable endeavor that didn't even result in any feedback. Overexposure has resulted in rapidly disintegrating molecular integrity the hell. Shouldn't my quantum shifting and molecular disintegration nullify such an effect? The properties of Kang the Conqueror's energy are unknown, and it is effectively bypassing all laid down defenses against such an event. Fucking hell I muttered as I dodged the barrage of beams that he was shooting at me without stopping. Telekinetically picking up one of the random body parts lying around. I increased its size to over 300 meters and sent it towards Kang. I used the chance created when Kang blasted through it to teleport to his back and drive a vicious backhand to his face and sent him crashing before he had ample chance to react. I need something concentrated. I had no time to properly deliberate between the wisest course of actions against an opponent like Kang, who needed but a single moment to turn everything around, so I opted for throwing everything I could come up with at him until something clicks. 
physical phenomena possess extremely low compatibility with quantumization. Hence, it is currently impossible to fuse electromagnetism with quantum siphoning recalculating. Low compatibility between quantumization and physical attributes. Fusion is impossible in the case of density manipulation, telekinesis, technopathy, molecular deconstruction, just get me something else. I shouted internally as I crashed deeper into the ground only to phase through it as a building fell into where I had crash landed. Rushing towards Kang, I wrapped myself in a repelling field, but covered my hands in an attracting field and threw a punch at Kang only for it to be efficiently blocked by a reflective barrier. That was the opposite of what my hands were covered with. Recalculating he tried grabbing my cape, but his hand went through it, so I quickly grabbed onto his. But that turned out to be a wrong move as the moment I made contact with it, I was crudely shoved backward in a burst of energy. Query resolved high compatibility found between form shift and quantumization. Fusion is possible I couldn't focus on the new notification as Kang layered it into me in a two-step left-right combo with an underkick that sent me skidding backwards. Whatever energy Kang was using was seriously hurting me in every way. My inner thoughts were resonating with the same frequency like that of a scrambled channel, severely reducing the seamless efficiency of my mental partitions. He tried gaining on me by warping to my position, but it was something I fully expected. So the moment he appeared in front of me with his energy-clad fist, I held him in a telekinetic hold and bombarded him with electricity and then joined my two hands together, transforming them to a gigantic blaster straight out from a Transformers movie, and hit him point blank, blanketing the entire area in a blindly white light. The entire landscape around us was reminiscent of one straight out of biblical Armageddon, with fire and molten lava across the vast patch of land. The armies fighting around us had long evacuated or spread out from our center area. I looked at Kang who looked worse for wear with something flickering around me, probably what protected him from being evaporated. Honestly this guy was more irritating than anything else. The amount of weapons he had for any type of situation was nothing short of terrifying. I have to say I'm pretty impressed and rightfully angry so, that a single member of the Avengers had pushed me this far b-brujum. I fired another energy blast at point blank after teleporting to a few meters away from him. Like, I could give two shits about your feelings. A wave of blue energy in the shape of a dome blasted everything away from Kang, and for the first time since meeting the enigmatic dictator, I could finally feel the eclipsing hate and contempt he held for me, but none of that made any difference in our current slugfest. Anything notable about the result of quantumizing my form shift ability? What even is a form shift? Based on the reaction it has with effect of quantumization, it can be safely said that it takes the attributes of whatever it is acting in tandem. With a stray thought came to me, as I looked at Kang, whose telekinetic powers were surging in such a haywire fashion. What if he wasn't exiled? What if he had access to all his tech? The resources that he could find in the quantum realm were very limited, and he also didn't have access to his time device, unless I would have been dead ten times over. Enable fusion, running sequences, recalibrating the mind stone's effect on quantum siphoning molecular deconstruction has been affected. Shape shifting has been affected. Fundamental force manipulation has been affected fusion, and assimilation is underway caution. Due to the current environment being the quantum realm, a level of restraint is required in order to prevent any unforeseen fusion with the realm. In the event that such a thing occurs, it is highly probable that connection with the mind stone will be lost fuck. My involuntary scream died out due to the loud screeching sound that echoed inside my head. It felt as if all my limbs were being mushed into paste and then pulled apart and then shoved into a shredder while my mind was still connected to it. Possibility of fusing with the quantum realm has been greatly reduced due to the now broad connection with the mind stone. Caution is still advice, idiot. Quantumization in the quantum realm is just inviting your demise. I ignored Kang in favor of running a scan on my body. And while I didn't look any different from before, the feeling I got was vastly different from seconds ago. No matter. This doesn't change the outcome in the slightest. He hurtled all the debris and metal parts at me. But I easily dodged them, and just as easily took control of them as they sailed safely past me, and sent them back to Kang. My movement this time was instant as if I had always been standing in front of him. I punched him hard in the gut while channeling the quantum energy through my body. Even surprising to me, my hands actually punched Kang's armor, and not the force field he's been using since the fight began. Damn. I whistled as my head started downloading new information concerning my state with every action that I took. It felt as if I was some sort of quantum god. Since I was currently taking the properties of the place and embodying it. Of course, there was still a fuckton of limitations. But at least this was something that I could work with. I guess I should count myself lucky for hiding the mind stone in a linked neutral subspace with the quantum space. Whatever energy Kang was harnessing was something similar to Wanda's chaos magic. 
in that it can negate the Mind Stone's effect. But his was more overwhelming. You destroyed my life's work, and you think you can just walk away like that? Kang said in an aggrieved voice as he tore off his cape. You will make a very nice addition to my collection, of that I can assure you. That it'd require me to be dead if I understand the context of your words, and that's something I'm not keen on experiencing. Ha <laughs> ha, I forget. He laughed in mock amusement. You heroes and your silly ego that makes you feel entitled, infallible. You're drawing quite the perfect picture of yourself there, man, I retorted. He didn't react to what I said, and just looked at the vibrances around his arms, and looked at me like an ignorant man who made a fool of himself for his lack of understanding. Who do you think will be left standing after all this? He pointed at the rubble of a city surrounding us. I shrugged. I don't know about you. But I have promised appointments with some people that I can't miss. How truly unfortunate and repulsive. He said under his breath and fired two blasts at me. But I had already erected some sort of quantum field around me. That was barely holding up against Kang's beams. It didn't matter however as I created an axe made out of lightning and hurled it at Kang. Forcing him to let up on the pressure. The moment he gave me a little respite. I pushed forward with both of my hands enlarged with quantum energy. He tried warping away. But I got to him first and punched him which he surprisingly blocked. But unfortunately for him, there was nothing he could do about the second punch. That snuck into the other side of his face for a healthy reassurance. I intercepted him whenever he tried moving away and pressed forward in my attack. There was an instance where he tried attacking me when I was too close into his reach. But while the attack made his way home, it hit nothing as I literally burst and dissipated into the air, only to reform a few meters back. Kang was running out of steam, and we could both tell. First of all, whatever tech he was building to escape the quantum realm was mostly destroyed by now, either by a fight, or Janet did something right. Meaning the only way for him to get out was by killing me and harvesting the method I used for his escape. Since I was currently exhibiting the attributes of this realm, it meant that I could also manipulate it to a very limited degree with extreme caution, if I don't want to be sucked into it. A whirlpool started forming above us with lightning strikes and increasing magnetic pull, as the whirlpool swallowed us. Before he could take a step to clear out his obstructions, he received a blast from me from under the ground. That sent him careening into the air. I appeared above him and drove a kick to his chin, sending him back down where he started from. But I wasn't about done with him, catching him by the leg before he landed on the ground. I smacked him against the ground with a loud boom and a lightning strike, before blasting him to the side, where I was already waiting for him with a gigantic bat, that I pelted against him from above, digging him straight into the ground. The entire place exploded in a blue blast from Kang, but I was already clear from the area around the blast only to be gone the next second as the blast subsided and joined my hands together and brought it into Kang's back that had him coughing out large amounts of blood. I grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and without waiting a second pumped my quantum energy into his body for a brief moment and then phased him out of his suit after ensuring he experienced a temporal imbalance before his suit helped him fix it. Away from his armor, Kang was just an elite fighter with future knowledge. Even after it couldn't be clearer that he's most, he didn't look that phased. Are you what do you think happens now? He asked me with defiant eyes. You die. I said, do you think you can shoulder the consequences of killing me? Are you even sure I will die? I raised an eyebrow at him, but then remembered that some Kangs could download their memories into other Kangs and control their bodies, essentially becoming immortal, will sort of. I guess I'll live with the consequences then. He tried to move, but I held him in place and directed a surge of energy inside his body. That slowly started disintegrating him. I was beyond tempted to dive inside his memories and harvest everything I can. But something held me back. I am not strong enough. I have no idea about the capabilities of the Council of Kangs. And the fact that they play around with the reality stream of the multiverse was a big deterrent. If they were to know in any kind of way. Since they'll definitely know that this one is dead. That I took his memories, trust me. I'll be dead before I shrink back to Earth. There are even Kangs that could see through the eyes of other Kangs. So yeah, I'm not taking that chance. And besides, it's not as if Kang memories are the only way to get stronger. But I'm pocketing his armor. With Kang dead, I teleported to where I could feel the only human aura, and appeared just in front of Janet, making the old woman jump up with a scared yelp. Vision, are you okay? Yeah, just a little stuffy. I think, I said as my eyes surveyed the rest of people around her, with alien life forms. What about he's dead? A why dash, he's gone, Janet. Disintegrated to dust. I said cutting her off. If that's all, we should get moving out of here. I believe I've had enough quantum adventures for the time being. I didn't want to waste any time here, since I'm also worried how much must have passed during my time here, before she or anyone could say anything else. 
I wrapped her in a magnetic field, and immediately activated my quantum shifting, and we were gone in the next instant. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.